Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson. Audiobook presented by the Learner's Library. Contents. Chapter 6. Drifting Apart. How Institutions Evolve Over Time, Often Slowly Drifting Apart. Chapter 7. The Turning Point. How a Political Revolution in 1688 Changed Institutions in England and Led to the Industrial Revolution. Chapter 8. Not on Our Turf, Barriers to Development. Why the Politically Powerful in Many Nations Opposed the Industrial Revolution. Chapter 9. Reversing Development. How European Colonialism Impoverished Large Parts of the World. Chapter 10. The Diffusion of Prosperity. How Some Parts of the World Took Different Paths to Prosperity from That of Britain. Why Nations Fail. The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. By Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson. 6. Drifting Apart. How Institutions Evolve Over Time often slowly drifting apart. 6. Drifting Apart. How Venice Became a Museum. The group of islands that form Venice lie at the far north of the Adriatic Sea. In the Middle Ages, Venice was possibly the richest place in the world, with the most advanced set of inclusive economic institutions underpinned by nascent political inclusiveness. It gained its independence in AD 810, at what turned out to be a fortuitous time. The economy of Europe was recovering from the decline it had suffered as the Roman Empire collapsed, and kings such as Charlemagne were reconstituting strong central political power. This led to stability, greater security, and an expansion of trade, which Venice was in a unique position to take advantage of. It was a nation of seafarers, placed right in the middle of the Mediterranean. From the east came spices, Byzantine manufactured goods, and slaves. Venice became rich. By 1050, when Venice had already been expanding economically for at least a century, it had a population of 45,000 people. This increased by more than 50%, to 70,000 by 1200. By 1330 the population had again increased by another 50 percent, to 110,000. Venice was then as big as Paris, and probably three times the size of London. One of the key bases for the economic expansion of Venice was a series of contractual innovations making economic institutions much more inclusive. The most famous was the Commenda, a rudimentary type of joint stock company, which formed only for the duration of a single trading mission. A commenda involved two partners, a sedentary one who stayed in Venice and one who traveled. The sedentary partner put capital into the venture, while the traveling partner accompanied the cargo. Typically, the sedentary partner put in the lion's share of the capital. Young Entrepreneurs who did not have wealth themselves could then get into the trading business by traveling with the merchandise. It was a key channel of upward social mobility. Any losses in the voyage were shared according to the amount of capital the partners had put in. If the voyage made money, profits were based on two types of commenda contracts. If the commenda was unilateral, then the sedentary merchant provided 100% of the capital and received 75% of the profits. If it was bilateral, the sedentary merchant provided 67% of the capital and received 50% of the profits. Studying official documents, one sees how powerful a force the commenda was in fostering upward social mobility. These documents are full of new names, people who had previously not been among the Venetian elite. In government documents of AD 960, 971, 
and 982. The number of new names comprise 69%, 81%, and 65%, respectively, of those recorded. This economic inclusiveness and the rise of new families through trade forced the political system to become even more open. The Doge, who governed Venice, was selected for life by the General Assembly. Though a general gathering of all citizens, in practice the General Assembly was dominated by a core group of powerful families. Though the Doge was very powerful, his power was gradually reduced over time by changes in political institutions. After 1032 the Doge was elected along with a newly created Ducal Council, whose job was also to ensure that the Doge did not acquire absolute power. The first Doge hemmed in by this council, Domenico Flabianico, was a wealthy silk merchant from a family that had not previously held high office. This institutional change was followed by a huge expansion of Venetian mercantile and naval power. In 1082 Venice was granted extensive trade privileges in Constantinople, and a Venetian quarter was created in that city. It soon housed 10,000 Venetians. Here we see inclusive economic and political institutions beginning to work in tandem. The economic expansion of Venice, which created more pressure for political change, exploded after the changes in political and economic institutions that followed the murder of the Doge in 1171. The first important innovation was the creation of a great council, which was to be the ultimate source of political power in Venice from this point on. The council was made up of officeholders of the Venetian state, such as judges, and was dominated by aristocrats. In addition to these officeholders, each year a hundred new members were nominated to the council by a nominating committee whose four members were chosen by lot from the existing council. The council also subsequently chose the members for two sub-councils, the Senate and the Council of Forty, which had various legislative and executive tasks. The Great Council also chose the Ducal Council, which was expanded from two to six members. The second innovation was the creation of yet another council, chosen by the Great Council by lot, to nominate the Doge. Though the choice had to be ratified by the General Assembly, since they nominated only one person, this effectively gave the choice of Doge to the Council. The third innovation was that a new doge had to swear an oath of office that circumscribed ducal power. Over time these constraints were continually expanded so that subsequent doges had to obey magistrates, then have all their decisions approved by the ducal council. The ducal council also took on the role of ensuring that the doge obeyed all decisions of the great council. These political reforms led to a further series of institutional innovations, in law, the creation of independent magistrates, courts, a court of appeals, and new private contract and bankruptcy laws. These new Venetian economic institutions allowed the creation of new legal business forms and new types of contracts. There was rapid financial innovation, and we see the beginnings of modern banking around this time in Venice. The dynamic moving Venice toward fully inclusive institutions looked unstoppable. But there was a tension in all this. Economic growth supported by the inclusive Venetian institutions was accompanied by creative destruction. Each new wave of enterprising young men who became rich via the commenda or other similar economic institutions tended to reduce the profits and economic success of established elites. And they did not just reduce their profits, they also challenged their political power. Thus there was always a temptation, if they could get away with it, for the existing elites sitting in the Great Council to close down the system to these new people. At the Great Council's inception, membership was determined each year. As we saw, at the end of the year, 
for electors were randomly chosen to nominate a hundred members for the next year, who were automatically selected. On October 3, 1286, a proposal was made to the Great Council, that the rules be amended so that nominations had to be confirmed by a majority in the Council of Forty, which was tightly controlled by elite families. This would have given this elite veto power over new nominations to the Council, something they previously had not had. The proposal was defeated. On October 5, 1286, another proposal was put forth, this time it passed. From then on there was to be automatic confirmation of a person if his fathers and grandfathers had served on the council. Otherwise, confirmation was required by the ducal council. On October 17 another change in the rules was passed stipulating that an appointment to the Great Council must be approved by the Council of Forty, the Doge, and the Ducal Council. The debates and constitutional amendments of 1286 presaged La Sereda, the closure, of Venice. In February 1297, it was decided that if you had been a member of the Great Council in the previous four years, you received automatic nomination and approval. New nominations now had to be approved by the Council of Forty, but with only 12 votes. After September 11, 1298, current members and their families no longer needed confirmation. The Great Council was now effectively sealed to outsiders, and the initial incumbents had become a hereditary aristocracy. The seal on this came in 1315, with the Libro d'Oro, or a gold book which was an official registry of the Venetian nobility. Those outside this nascent nobility did not let their powers erode without a struggle. Political tensions mounted steadily in Venice between 1297 and 1315. The Great Council partially responded by making itself bigger. In an attempt to co-opt its most vocal opponents, it grew from 450 to 1,500. This expansion was complemented by repression. A police force was introduced for the first time in 1310, and there was a steady growth in domestic coercion, undoubtedly as a way of solidifying the new political order. Having implemented a political serrata, the Great Council then moved to adopt an economic serrata. The switch toward extractive political institutions was now being followed by a move toward extractive economic institutions. Most important, they banned the use of commenda contracts, one of the great institutional innovations that had made Venice rich. This shouldn't be a surprise, the commenda benefited new merchants, and now the established elite was trying to exclude them. This was just one step toward more extractive economic institutions. Another step came when, starting in 1314, the Venetian state began to take over and nationalize trade. It organized state galleys to engage in trade and, from 1324 on, began to charge individuals high levels of taxes if they wanted to engage in trade. Long-distance trade became the preserve of the nobility. This was the beginning of the end of Venetian prosperity. With the main lines of business monopolized by the increasingly narrow elite, the decline was underway. Venice appeared to have been on the brink of becoming the world's first inclusive society, but it fell to a coup. Political and economic institutions became more extractive, and Venice began to experience economic decline. By 1500 the population had shrunk to 100,000. Between 1650 and 1800, when the population of Europe rapidly expanded, that of Venice contracted. Today the only economy Venice has, apart from a bit of fishing, is tourism. Instead of pioneering trade routes and economic institutions, Venetians make pizza and ice cream and blow colored glass for hordes of foreigners. The tourists come to see the pre-Serrata wonders of Venice, 
such as the Doge's Palace and the Lions of St. Mark's Cathedral, which were looted from Byzantium when Venice ruled the Mediterranean. Venice went from economic powerhouse to museum. In this chapter we focus on the historical development of institutions in different parts of the world, and explain why they evolved in different ways. We saw in Chapter 4 how the institutions of Western Europe diverged from those in Eastern Europe and then how those of England diverged from those in the rest of Western Europe. This was a consequence of small institutional differences mostly resulting from institutional drift interacting with critical junctures. It might then be tempting to think that these institutional differences are the tip of a deep historical iceberg where under the waterline, we find English and European institutions inexorably drifting away from those elsewhere, based on historical events dating back millennia. The rest, as they say, is history. Except that it isn't, for two reasons. First, moves toward inclusive institutions, as our account of Venice shows, can be reversed. Venice became prosperous. But its political and economic institutions were overthrown, and that prosperity went into reverse. Today Venice is rich only because people who make their income elsewhere choose to spend it there admiring the glory of its past. The fact that inclusive institutions can go into reverse shows that there is no simple cumulative process of institutional improvement. Second, small institutional differences that play a crucial role during critical junctures are by their nature ephemeral. Because they are small, they can be reversed, then can re-emerge and be reversed again. We will see in this chapter that, in contrast with what one would expect from the geography or culture theories, England, where the decisive step toward inclusive institutions would take place in the 17th century, was a backwater, not only in the millennia following the Neolithic Revolution in the Middle East but also at the beginning of the Middle Ages, following the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The British Isles were marginal to the Roman Empire, certainly of less importance than continental Western Europe, North Africa, the Balkans, Constantinople, or the Middle East. When the Western Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century AD, Britain suffered the most complete decline. But the political revolutions that would ultimately bring the Industrial Revolution would take place not in Italy, Turkey, or even Western continental Europe, but in the British Isles. In understanding the path to England's Industrial Revolution and the countries that followed it, Rome's legacy is nonetheless important for several reasons. First, Rome, like Venice, underwent major early institutional innovations. As in Venice, Rome's initial economic success was based on inclusive institutions, at least by the standards of their time. As in Venice, these institutions became decidedly more extractive over time. With Rome, this was a consequence of the change from the Republic, 510 BC, 49 BC, to the Empire, 49 BC, AD 476. Even though during the Republican period Rome built an impressive empire, and long-distance trade and transport flourished, much of the Roman economy was based on extraction. The transition from republic to empire increased extraction and ultimately led to the kind of infighting, instability, and collapse that we saw with the Maya city-states. Second and more important, we will see that Western Europe's subsequent institutional development, though it was not a direct inheritance of Rome, was a consequence of critical junctures that were common across the region in the wake of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. These critical junctures had little parallel in other parts of the world, such as Africa, Asia, or the Americas, though we will also show via the history of Ethiopia that when other places did experience similar critical junctures, they sometimes reacted in ways that were remarkably similar. Roman decline led to feudalism, which, as a byproduct, caused slavery to wither away, 
brought into existence cities that were outside the sphere of influence of monarchs and aristocrats, and in the process created a set of institutions where the political powers of rulers were weakened. It was upon this feudal foundation that the Black Death would create havoc and further strengthen independent cities and peasants, at the expense of monarchs, aristocrats, and large landowners. And it was on this canvas that the opportunities created by the Atlantic trade would play out. Many parts of the world did not undergo these changes, and in consequence drifted apart. Roman Virtues Roman plebeian tribune Tiberius Gracchus was clubbed to death in 133 BC by Roman senators and his body was thrown unceremoniously into the Tiber. His murderers were aristocrats like Tiberius himself, and the assassination was masterminded by his cousin Publius Cornelius Scipio Nasica. Tiberius Gracchus had an impeccable aristocratic pedigree as a descendant of some of the more illustrious leaders of the Roman Republic, including Lucius Aemilius Paulus, hero of the Illyrian and Second Punic Wars, and Scipio Africanus, the general who defeated Hannibal in the Second Punic War. Why had the powerful senators of his day, even his cousin, turned against him? The answer tells us much about the tensions in the Roman Republic and the causes of its subsequent decline. What pitted Tiberius against these powerful senators was his willingness to stand against them in a crucial question of the day, the allocation of land and the rights of plebeians, common Roman citizens. By the time of Tiberius Gracchus, Rome was a well-established republic. Its political institutions and the virtues of Roman citizen soldiers, as captured by Jacques Louis David's famous painting Oath of the Horatii, which shows the sons swearing to their fathers that they will defend the Roman Republic to their death, are still seen by many historians as the foundation of the Republic's success. Roman citizens created the Republic by overthrowing their king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, known as Tarquin the Proud around 510 BC. The Republic cleverly designed political institutions with many inclusive elements. It was governed by magistrates elected for a year. That the office of magistrate was elected, annually, and held by multiple people at the same time reduced the ability of any one person to consolidate or exploit his power. The Republic's institutions contained a system of checks and balances that distributed power fairly widely. This was so even if not all citizens had equal representation, as voting was indirect. There was also a large number of slaves crucial for production in much of Italy, making up perhaps one-third of the population. Slaves of course had no rights, let alone political representation. All the same, as in Venice, Roman political institutions had pluralistic elements. The plebeians had their own assembly, which could elect the plebeian tribune, who had the power to veto actions by the magistrates, call the plebeian assembly, and propose legislation. It was the plebeians who put Tiberius Gracchus in power in 133 BC. Their power had been forged by a secession, a form of strike by plebeians, particularly soldiers, who would withdraw to a hill outside the city and refuse to cooperate with the magistrates until their complaints were dealt with. This threat was of course particularly important during a time of war. It was supposedly during such a secession in the 5th century BC that citizens gained the right to elect their tribune and enact laws that would govern their community. Their political and legal protection, even if limited by our current standards, created economic opportunities for citizens and some degree of inclusivity in economic institutions. As a result, trade throughout the Mediterranean flourished under the Roman Republic. Archaeological evidence suggests that while the majority of both citizens and slaves lived not much above subsistence level, many Romans, including some common citizens, 
achieved high incomes, with access to public services such as a city sewage system and street lighting. Moreover, there is evidence that there was also some economic growth under the Roman Republic. We can track the economic fortunes of the Romans from shipwrecks. The empire the Romans built was in a sense a web of port cities, from Athens, Antioch, and Alexandria in the east, via Rome, Carthage, and Cadiz, all the way to London in the far west. As Roman territories expanded, so did trade and shipping, which can be traced from shipwrecks found by archaeologists on the floor of the Mediterranean. These wrecks can be dated in many ways. Often the ships carried amphorae full of wine or olive oil, being transported from Italy to Gaul, or Spanish olive oil to be sold or distributed for free in Rome. Amphorae, sealed vessels made of clay, often contained information on who had made them and when. Just near the river Tiber in Rome is a small hill, Monte Testaccio, also known as Monte dei Coxi, Pottery Mountain made up of approximately 53 million amphorae. When the amphorae were unloaded from ships, they were discarded, over the centuries creating a huge hill. Other goods on the ships and the ship itself can sometimes be dated using radiocarbon dating, a powerful technique used by archaeologists to date the age of organic remains. Plants create energy by photosynthesis, which uses the energy from the sun to convert carbon dioxide into sugars. As they do this, plants incorporate a quantity of a naturally occurring radioisotope, carbon-14. After plants die, the carbon-14 deteriorates due to radioactive decay. When archaeologists find a shipwreck, they can date the ship's wood by comparing the remaining carbon. 14 fraction in it to that expected from atmospheric carbon-14. This gives an estimate of when the tree was cut down. Only about 20 shipwrecks have been dated to as long ago as 500 BC. These were probably not Roman ships, and could well have been Carthaginian, for example. But then the number of Roman shipwrecks increases rapidly. Around the time of the birth of Christ, they reached a peak of 180. Shipwrecks are a powerful way of tracing the economic contours of the Roman Republic, and they do show evidence of some economic growth, but they have to be kept in perspective. Probably two-thirds of the contents of the ships were the property of the Roman state, taxes and tribute being brought back from the provinces to Rome, or grain and olive oil from north. Africa to be handed out free to the citizens of the city. It is these fruits of extraction that mostly constructed Monte Testaccio. Another fascinating way to find evidence of economic growth is from the Greenland Ice Core project. As snowflakes fall, they pick up small quantities of pollution in the atmosphere, particularly the metals lead, silver, and copper. The snow freezes and piles up on top of the snow that fell in previous years. This process has been going on for millennia, and provides an unrivaled opportunity for scientists to understand the extent of atmospheric pollution thousands of years ago. In 1990-1992 the Greenland Ice Core Project drilled down through 3,030 meters of ice covering about 250,000 years of human history. One of the major findings of this project, and others preceding it, was that there was a distinct increase in atmospheric pollutants starting around 500 BC. Atmospheric quantities of lead, silver, and copper then increased steadily, reaching a peak in the 1st century AD. Remarkably, this atmospheric quantity of lead is reached again only in the 13th century. These findings show how intense, compared with what came before and after, Roman mining was. This upsurge in mining clearly indicates economic expansion. But Roman growth was unsustainable, occurring under institutions that were partially inclusive and partially extractive. 
Though Roman citizens had political and economic rights, slavery was widespread and very extractive, and the elite, the senatorial class, dominated both the economy and politics. Despite the presence of the plebeian assembly and plebeian tribute, for example, real power rested with the Senate, whose members came from the large landowners constituting the senatorial class. According to the Roman historian Livy, the Senate was created by Rome's first king, Romulus, and consisted of 100 men. Their descendants made up the senatorial class, though new blood was also added. The distribution of land was very unequal and most likely became more so by the second century BC. This was at the root of the problems that Tiberius Gracchus brought to the fore as tribune. As its expansion throughout the Mediterranean continued, Rome experienced an influx of great riches. But this bounty was captured mostly by a few wealthy families of senatorial rank, and inequality between rich and poor increased. Senators owed their wealth not only to their control of the lucrative provinces but also to their very large estates throughout Italy. These estates were manned by gangs of slaves, often captured in the wars that Rome fought. But where the land for these estates came from was equally significant. Rome's armies during the Republic consisted of citizen soldiers who were small landowners, first in Rome and later in other parts of Italy. Traditionally they fought in the army when necessary and then returned to their plots. As Rome expanded and the campaigns got longer, this model ceased to work. Soldiers were away from their plots for years at a time, and many landholdings fell into disuse. The soldiers' families sometimes found themselves under mountains of debt and on the brink of starvation. Many of the plots were therefore gradually abandoned and absorbed by the estates of the senators. As the senatorial class got richer and richer, the large mass of landless citizens gathered in Rome, often after being decommissioned from the army. With no land to return to, they sought work in Rome. By the late 2nd century BC, the situation had reached a dangerous boiling point both because the gap between rich and poor had widened to unprecedented levels and because there were hordes of discontented citizens, in Rome ready to rebel in response to these injustices and turn against the Roman aristocracy. But political power rested with the rich landowners of the senatorial class, who were the beneficiaries of the changes that had gone on over the last two centuries. Most had no intention of changing the system that had served them so well. According to the Roman historian Plutarch, Tiberius Gracchus, when traveling through Etruria, a region in what is now central Italy, became aware of the hardship that families of citizen soldiers were suffering. Whether because of this experience or because of other frictions with the powerful senators of his time, he would soon embark upon a daring plan to change land allocation in Italy. He stood for plebeian tribune in 133 BC, then used his office to propose land reform. A commission would investigate whether public lands were being illegally occupied, and would redistribute land in excess of the legal limit of 300 acres to landless Roman citizens. The 300-acre limit was in fact part of an old law, though ignored and not implemented for centuries. Tiberius Gracchus's proposal sent shockwaves through the senatorial class, who were able to block implementation of his reforms for a while. When Tiberius managed to use the power of the mob supporting him to remove another tribune who threatened to veto his land reform, his proposed commission was finally founded. The Senate, though, prevented implementation by starving the commission of funds. Things came to a head when Tiberius Gracchus claimed for his land reform commission the funds left by the king of the Greek city Pergamum, to the Roman people. He also attempted to stand for tribune a second time, partly because he was afraid of persecution by the Senate after he stepped down. 
This gave the senators the pretext to charge that Tiberius was trying to declare himself king. He and his supporters were attacked, and many were killed. Tiberius Gracchus himself was one of the first to fall, though his death would not solve the problem, and others would attempt to reform the distribution of land and other aspects of Roman economy and society. Many would meet a similar fate. Tiberius Gracchus's brother Gaius, for example, was also murdered by landowners, after he took the mantle from his brother. These tensions would surface again periodically during the next century. For example, leading to the social war, between 91 BC and 87 BC. The aggressive defender of the senatorial interests, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, not only viciously suppressed the demands for change but also severely curtailed the powers of the plebeian tribune. The same issues would also be a central factor in the support that Julius Caesar received from the people of Rome, in his fight against the Senate. The political institutions forming the core of the Roman Republic were overthrown by Julius Caesar in 49 BC, when he moved his legion across the Rubicon, the river separating the Roman provinces of Cisalpine Gaul from Italy. Rome fell to Caesar, and another civil war broke out. Though Caesar was victorious, he was murdered by disgruntled senators, led by Brutus and Cassius, in 44 BC. The Roman Republic would never be recreated. A new civil war broke out between Caesar's supporters, particularly Mark Anthony and Octavian, and his foes. After Anthony and Octavian won, they fought each other, until Octavian emerged triumphant in the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. By the following year, and for the next 45 years, Octavian, known after 28 BC as Augustus Caesar, ruled Rome alone. Augustus created the Roman Empire, though he preferred the title princep, a sort of first among equals and called the regime the Principate. Map 11 shows the Roman Empire at its greatest extent in 117 AD. It also includes the river Rubicon, which Caesar so fatefully crossed. It was this transition from Republic to Principate, and later Naked Empire, that laid the seeds of the decline of Rome. The partially inclusive political institutions, which had formed the basis for the economic success, were gradually undermined. Even if the Roman Republic created a tilted playing field in favor of the senatorial class and other wealthy Romans, it was not an absolutist regime and had never before concentrated so much power in one position. The changes unleashed by Augustus, as with the Venetian Serrata, were at first political but then would have significant economic consequences. As a result of these changes, by the 5th century AD the Western Roman Empire, as the West was called after it split from the East, had declined economically and militarily, and was on the brink of collapse. Roman Vices Flavius Aetius was one of the larger-than-life characters of the late Roman Empire, hailed as the last of the Romans, by Edward Gibbon, author of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Between A.D. 433 and 454, until he was murdered by the Emperor Valentinian III, Aetius, a general, was probably the most powerful person in the Roman Empire. He shaped both domestic and foreign policy and fought a series of crucial battles against the barbarians, and also other Romans in civil wars. He was unique among powerful generals fighting in civil wars in not seeking the emperorship himself. Since the end of the second century, civil war had become a fact of life in the Roman Empire. Between the death of Marcus Aurelius in AD 180 until the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in AD 476, there was hardly a decade that did not see a civil war or a palace coup against an emperor. Few emperors died of natural causes or in battle. 
most were murdered by usurpers or their own troops. Aetius's career illustrates the changes from Roman Republic and early Empire to the late Roman Empire. Not only did his involvement in incessant civil wars and his power in every aspect of the empire's business contrast with the much more limited power of generals and senators during earlier periods, but it also highlights how the fortunes of Romans changed radically in the intervening centuries in other ways. By the late Roman Empire, the so-called barbarians who were initially dominated and incorporated into Roman armies or used as slaves, now dominated many parts of the empire. As a young man, Aetius had been held hostage by barbarians, first by the Goths under Alaric and then by the Huns. Roman relations with these barbarians are indicative of how things had changed since the Republic. Alaric was both a ferocious enemy and an ally, so much so that in 405 he was appointed one of the senior most generals of the Roman army. The arrangement was temporary, however. By 408, Alaric was fighting against the Romans, invading Italy and sacking Rome. The Huns were also both powerful foes and frequent allies of the Romans. Though they, too, held Aetius hostage, they later fought alongside him in a civil war. But the Huns did not stay long on one side, and under Attila they fought a major battle against the Romans in 451, just across the Rhine. This time defending the Romans were the Goths, under Theodoric. All of this did not stop Roman elites from trying to appease barbarian commanders often not to protect Roman territories but to gain the upper hand in internal power struggles. For example, the Vandals, under their king, Geyseric, ravaged large parts of the Iberian Peninsula and then conquered the Roman bread baskets in North Africa, from 429 onward. The Roman response to this was to offer Geyseric the Emperor Valentinian III's child daughter as a bride. Geyseric was at the time married to the daughter of one of the leaders of the Goths, but this does not seem to have stopped him. He annulled his marriage under the pretext that his wife was trying to murder him and sent her back to her family, after mutilating her by cutting off both her ears and her nose. Fortunately for the bride-to-be, because of her young age she was kept in Italy and never consummated her marriage to Geyseric. Later she would marry another powerful general, Petronius Maximus, the mastermind of the murder of Aetius by the Emperor Valentinian III, who would himself shortly be murdered in a plot hatched by Maximus. Maximus later declared himself emperor, but his reign would be very short, ended by his death during the major offensive by the Vandals under Geyseric against Italy, which saw Rome fall and savagely plundered. By the early 5th century, the barbarians were literally at the gate. Some historians argue that it was a consequence of the more formidable opponents the Romans faced during the late empire. But the success of the Goths, Huns, and Vandals against Rome was a symptom, not the cause, of Rome's decline. During the Republic, Rome had dealt with much more organized and threatening opponents, such as the Carthaginians. The decline of Rome had causes very similar to those of the Maya city-states. Rome's increasingly extractive political and economic institutions generated its demise because they caused infighting and civil war. The origins of the decline go back at least to Augustus's seizure of power, which set in motion changes that made political institutions much more extractive. These included changes in the structure of the army, which made secession impossible, thus removing a crucial element that ensured political representation for common Romans. The emperor Tiberius, who followed Augustus in AD 14, abolished the plebeian assembly and transferred its powers to the Senate. Instead of a political voice, Roman citizens now had free handouts of wheat and, subsequently, olive oil, wine, and pork, 
and were kept entertained by circuses and gladiatorial contests. With Augustus's reforms, emperors began to rely not so much on the army made up of citizen soldiers, but on the Praetorian Guard, the elite group of professional soldiers created by Augustus. The guard itself would soon become an important independent broker of who would become emperor, often through not peaceful means but civil wars and intrigue. Augustus also strengthened the aristocracy against common Roman citizens, and the growing inequality that had underpinned the conflict between Tiberius Gracchus and the aristocrats continued, perhaps even strengthened. The accumulation of power at the center made the property rights of common Romans less secure. State lands also expanded with the empire as a consequence of confiscation, and grew to as much as half of the land in many parts of the empire. Property rights became particularly unstable because of the concentration of power in the hands of the emperor and his entourage, in a pattern not too different from what happened in the Maya city-states infighting to take control of this powerful position increased. Civil wars became a regular occurrence, even before the chaotic 5th century, when the barbarians ruled supreme. For example, Septimius Severus seized power from Didius Julianus, who had made himself emperor after the murder of Pertinax in AD 193. Severus, the third emperor in the so-called Year of the Five Emperors, then waged war against his rival claimants, the generals Pisenius Niger and Clodius Albinus, who were finally defeated in AD 194 and 197, respectively. Severus confiscated all the property of his losing opponents in the ensuing civil war. Though able rulers, such as Trajan, AD 98-117, to Hadrian, and Marcus Aurelius in the next century, could stanch decline, they could not, or did not want to, address the fundamental institutional problems. None of these men proposed abandoning the empire or recreating effective political institutions along the lines of the Roman Republic. Marcus Aurelius, for all his successes, was followed by his son Commodus, who was more like Caligula or Nero than his father. The rising instability was evident from the layout and location of towns and cities in the empire. By the 3rd century AD every sizable city in the empire had a defensive wall. In many cases monuments were plundered for stone, which was used in fortifications. In Gaul before the Romans had arrived in 125 BC, it was usual to build settlements on hilltops since these were more easily defended. With the initial arrival of Rome, settlements moved down to the plains. In the 3rd century, this trend was reversed. Along with mounting political instability came changes in society that moved economic institutions toward greater extraction, though citizenship was expanded to the extent that by AD 212 nearly all the inhabitants of the empire were citizens. This change went along with changes in status between citizens. Any sense that there might have been of equality before the law deteriorated. For example, by the reign of Hadrian, AD 117 to 138, there were clear differences in the types of laws applied to different categories of Roman citizen. Just as important, the role of citizens was completely different from how it had been in the days of the Roman Republic, when they were able to exercise some power over political and economic decisions through the assemblies in Rome. Slavery remained a constant throughout Rome, though there is some controversy over whether the fraction of slaves in the population actually declined over the centuries. Equally important, as the empire developed, more and more agricultural workers were reduced to semi-servile status and tied to the land. The status of these servile coloni is extensively discussed in legal documents such as the Codex Theodosianus and Codex Justinianus, and probably originated during the reign of Diocletian, 
AD 284-305. The rights of landlords over the colony were progressively increased. The Emperor Constantine in 332 allowed landlords to chain a colonist whom they suspected was trying to escape, and from AD 365, Colony were not allowed to sell their own property without their landlord's permission. Just as we can use shipwrecks and the Greenland ice cores to track the economic expansion of Rome during earlier periods, we can use them also to trace its decline. By AD 500 the peak of 180 ships was reduced to 20. As Rome declined, Mediterranean trade collapsed and some scholars have even argued that it did not return to its Roman height until the 19th century. The Greenland ice tells a similar story. The Romans used silver for coins, and lead had many uses, including for pipes and tableware. After peaking in the 1st century AD, the deposits of lead, silver, and copper in the ice cores declined. The experience of economic growth during the Roman Republic was impressive, as were other examples of growth under extractive institutions, such as the Soviet Union. But that growth was limited and was not sustained, even when it is taken into account that it occurred under partially inclusive institutions. Growth was based on relatively high agricultural productivity, significant tribute from the provinces and long-distance trade, but it was not underpinned by technological progress or creative destruction. The Romans inherited some basic technologies, iron tools and weapons, literacy, plow agriculture, and building techniques. Early on in the Republic, they created others, cement masonry, pumps, and the water wheel. But thereafter, technology was stagnant throughout the period of the Roman Empire. In shipping, for instance, there was little change in ship design or rigging, and the Romans never developed the stern rudder, instead steering ships with oars. Water wheels spread very slowly, so that water power never revolutionized the Roman economy. Even such great achievements as aqueducts and city sewers used existing technology, though the Romans perfected it. There could be some economic growth without innovation, relying on existing technology, but it was growth without creative destruction. And it did not last. As property rights became more insecure and the economic rights of citizens followed the decline of their political rights, economic growth likewise declined. A remarkable thing about new technologies in the Roman period is that their creation and spread seem to have been driven by the state. This is good news, until the government decides that it is not interested in technological development, an all-too-common occurrence due to the fear of creative destruction. The great Roman writer Pliny the Elder relates the following story. During the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, a man invented unbreakable glass and went to the emperor anticipating that he would get a great reward. He demonstrated his invention, and Tiberius asked him if he had told anyone else about it. When the man replied no, Tiberius had the man dragged away and killed, lest gold be reduced to the value of mud. There are two interesting things about this story. First, the man went to Tiberius in the first place for a reward, rather than setting himself up in business and making a profit by selling the glass. This shows the role of the Roman government in controlling technology. Second, Tiberius was happy to destroy the innovation because of the adverse economic effects it would have had. This is the fear of the economic effects of creative destruction. There is also direct evidence from the period of the empire of the fear of the political consequences of creative destruction. Suetonius tells how the emperor Vespasian, who ruled between AD 69 and 79, was approached by a man who had invented a device for transporting columns to the capital, the citadel of Rome, at a relatively small cost. Columns were large, 
heavy, and very difficult to transport. Moving them to Rome from the mines where they were made involved the labor of thousands of people, at great expense to the government. Vespasian did not kill the man, but he also refused to use the innovation, declaring, How will it be possible for me to feed the populace? Again an inventor came to the government. Perhaps this was more natural than with the unbreakable glass, as the Roman government was most heavily involved with column mining and transportation. Again the innovation was turned down because of the threat of creative destruction, not so much because of its economic impact, but because of fear of political creative destruction. Vespasian was concerned that unless he kept the people happy and under control it would be politically destabilizing. The Roman plebeians had to be kept busy and pliant, so it was good to have jobs to give them, such as moving columns about. This complemented the bread and circuses, which were also dispensed for free to keep the population content. It is perhaps telling that both of these examples came soon after the collapse of the Republic. The Roman emperors had far more power to block change than the Roman rulers during the Republic. Another important reason for the lack of technological innovation was the prevalence of slavery. As the territories Romans controlled expanded, vast numbers were enslaved, often being brought back to Italy to work on large estates. Many citizens in Rome did not need to work, they lived off the handouts from the government. Where was innovation to come from? We have argued that innovation comes from new people with new ideas, developing new solutions to old problems. In Rome the people doing the producing were slaves and, later, semi-servile colony with few incentives to innovate, since it was their masters, not they who stood to benefit from any innovation. As we will see many times in this book, economies based on the repression of labor and systems such as slavery and serfdom are notoriously non-innovative. This is true from the ancient world to the modern era. In the United States, for example, the northern states took part in the Industrial Revolution, not the South. Of course slavery and serfdom created huge wealth for those who owned the slaves and controlled the serfs, but it did not create technological innovation or prosperity for society. No one writes from Vindolanda. By AD 43 the Roman Emperor Claudius had conquered England, but not Scotland. A last, futile attempt was made by the Roman governor Agricola, who gave up and, in AD 85, built a series of forts to protect England's northern border. One of the biggest of these was at Vindolanda, 35 miles west of Newcastle and depicted on map 11, page 165, at the far northwest of the Roman Empire. Later, Vindolanda was incorporated into the 85-mile defensive wall that the Emperor Hadrian constructed, but in AD 103, when a Roman centurion, Candidus, was stationed there, it was an isolated fort. Candidus was engaged with his friend Octavius in supplying the Roman garrison and received a reply from Octavius, to a letter he had sent. Octavius to his brother Candidus, Greetings. I have several times written to you that I have bought about five thousand modii of ears of grain, on account of which I need cash. Unless you send me some cash, at least five hundred denarii, the result will be that I shall lose what I have laid out as a deposit, about three hundred denarii, and I shall be embarrassed. So, I ask you, send me some cash as soon as possible. The hides which you write are at Cataractonium, write that they be given to me and the wagon about which you write. I would have already been to collect them except that I did not care to injure the animals while the roads are bad. See with Tertius about the eight and a half denarii which he received from Fatales. He has not credited them to my account. Make sure that you send me cash so that I may have ears of grain on the threshing floor. Greet Spectatus and Firmus. 
farewell. The correspondence between Candidus and Octavius illustrates some significant facets of the economic prosperity of Roman England, it reveals an advanced monetary economy with financial services. It reveals the presence of constructed roads, even if sometimes in bad condition. It reveals the presence of a fiscal system that raised taxes to pay Candidus's wages. Most obviously it reveals that both men were literate and were able to take advantage of a postal service of sorts. Roman England also benefited from the mass manufacture of high-quality pottery, particularly in Oxfordshire, urban centers with baths and public buildings, and house construction techniques using mortar and tiles for roofs. By the 4th century, all were in decline, and after AD 411 the Roman Empire gave up on England. Troops were withdrawn, those left were not. Paid and as the Roman state crumbled, administrators were expelled by the local population. By AD 450 all these trappings of economic prosperity were gone. Money vanished from circulation. Urban areas were abandoned, and buildings stripped of stone. The roads were overgrown with weeds. The only type of pottery fabricated was crude and handmade, not manufactured. People forgot how to use mortar, and literacy declined substantially. Roofs were made of branches, not tiles. Nobody wrote from Vindolanda anymore. After AD 411, England experienced an economic collapse and became a poor backwater, and not for the first time. In the previous chapter we saw how the Neolithic Revolution started in the Middle East around 9500 BC. While the inhabitants of Jericho and Abu Huraira were living in small towns and farming, the inhabitants of England were still hunting and gathering, and would do so for at least another 5,500 years. Even then the English didn't invent farming or herding. These were brought from the outside by migrants who had been spreading across Europe from the Middle East for thousands of years. As the inhabitants of England caught up with these major innovations, those in the Middle East were inventing cities, writing, and pottery. By 3500 BC, large cities such as Uruk and Ur emerged in Mesopotamia, modern Iraq. Uruk may have had a population of 14,000 in 3500 BC, and 40,000 soon afterward. The potter's wheel was invented in Mesopotamia at about the same time as was wheeled transportation. The Egyptian capital of Memphis emerged as a large city soon thereafter. Writing appeared independently in both regions. While the Egyptians were building the Great Pyramids of Giza around 2500 BC, the English constructed their most famous ancient monument, the Stone Circle at Stonehenge. Not bad by English standards, but not even large enough to have housed one of the ceremonial boats buried at the foot of King Khufu's pyramid. England continued to lag behind and to borrow from the Middle East and the rest of Europe up to and including the Roman period. Despite such an inauspicious history, it was in England that the first truly inclusive society emerged and where the Industrial Revolution got underway. We argued earlier, pages 102 to 113, that this was the result of a series of interactions between small institutional differences and critical junctures. For example, the Black Death and the discovery of the Americas. English divergence had historical roots, but the view from Vindolanda suggests that these roots were not that deep and certainly not historically predetermined. They were not planted in the Neolithic Revolution, or even during the centuries of Roman hegemony. By AD 450, at the start of what historians used to call the Dark Ages, England had slipped back into poverty and political chaos. There would be no effective centralized state in England for hundreds of years. Diverging Paths 
the rise of inclusive institutions and the subsequent industrial growth in England did not follow as a direct legacy of Roman, or earlier, institutions. This does not mean that nothing significant happened with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, a major event affecting most of Europe. Since different parts of Europe shared the same critical junctures, their institutions would drift in a similar fashion, perhaps in a distinctively European way. The fall of the Roman Empire was a crucial part of these common critical junctures. This European path contrasts with paths in other parts of the world, including Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and the Americas, which developed differently partly because they did not face the same critical junctures. Roman England collapsed with a bang. This was less true in Italy, or Roman Gaul, modern France, or even North Africa, where many of the old institutions lived on in some form. Yet there is no doubt that the change from the dominance of a single Roman state to a plethora of states run by Franks, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Vandals, and Burgundians was significant. The power of these states was far weaker, and they were buffeted by a long series of incursions from their peripheries. From the north came the Vikings and Danes in their longboats. From the east came the Hunnic horsemen. Finally, the emergence of Islam as a religion and political force in the century after the death of Muhammad in AD 632 led to the creation of new Islamic states in most of the Byzantine Empire, North Africa, and Spain. These common processes rocked Europe, and in their wake a particular type of society, commonly referred to as feudal, emerged. Feudal society was decentralized because strong central states had atrophied, even if some rulers such as Charlemagne attempted to reconstruct them. Feudal institutions, which relied on unfree, coerced labor, the serfs, were obviously extractive, and they formed the basis for a long period of extractive and slow growth in Europe during the Middle Ages. But they also were consequential for later developments. For instance, during the reduction of the rural population to the status of serfs, slavery disappeared from Europe. At a time when it was possible for elites to reduce the entire rural population to serfdom, it did not seem necessary to have a separate class of slaves as every previous society had had. Feudalism also created a power vacuum in which independent cities specializing in production and trade could flourish. But when the balance of power changed after the Black Death, and serfdom began to crumble in Western Europe, the stage was set for a much more pluralistic society without the presence of any slaves. The critical junctures that gave rise to feudal society were distinct, but they were not completely restricted to Europe. A relevant comparison is with the modern African country of Ethiopia, which developed from the Kingdom of Aksum founded in the north of the country around 400 BC. Aksum was a relatively developed kingdom for its time and engaged in international trade with India, Arabia, Greece, and the Roman Empire. It was in many ways comparable to the Eastern Roman Empire in this period. It used money, built monumental public buildings and roads, and had very similar technology, for example in agriculture and shipping. There are also interesting ideological parallels between Oxum and Rome. In AD 312, the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, as did King Azana of Oxum about the same time. Map 12, opposite, shows the location of the historical state of Oxum in modern-day Ethiopia and Eritrea with outposts across the Red Sea in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Just as Rome declined, so did Aksum, and its historical decline followed a pattern close to that of the Western Roman Empire. The role played by the Huns and Vandals in the decline of Rome was taken by the Arabs, who, in the 7th century, expanded into the Red Sea and down the Arabian Peninsula. 
Aksum lost its colonies in Arabia and its trade routes. This precipitated economic decline, money stopped being coined, the urban population fell, and there was a refocusing of the state into the interior of the country and up into the highlands of modern Ethiopia. In Europe, feudal institutions emerged following the collapse of central state authority. The same thing happened in Ethiopia, based on a system called Gult, which involved a grant of land by the emperor. The institution is mentioned in 13th century manuscripts, though it may have originated much earlier. The term Gult is derived from an Amharic word meaning, he assigned a fief. It signified that in exchange for the land, the Gult holder had to provide services to the emperor, particularly military ones. In turn, the Gult holder had the right to extract tribute from those who farmed the land. A variety of historical sources suggest that gold holders extracted between one-half and three-quarters of the agricultural output of peasants. This system was an independent development with notable similarities to European feudalism, but probably even more extractive. At the height of feudalism in England, serfs faced less onerous extraction and lost about half of their output to their lords in one form or another. But Ethiopia was not representative of Africa. Elsewhere, slavery was not replaced by serfdom. African slavery and the institutions that supported it were to continue for many more centuries. Even Ethiopia's ultimate path would be very different. After the 7th century, Ethiopia remained isolated in the mountains of East Africa from the processes that subsequently influenced the institutional path of Europe, such as the emergence of independent cities, the nascent constraints on monarchs and the expansion of Atlantic trade after the discovery of the Americas. In consequence, its version of absolutist institutions remained largely unchallenged. The African continent would later interact in a very different capacity with Europe and Asia. East Africa became a major supplier of slaves to the Arab world, and West and Central Africa would be drawn into the world economy during the European expansion, associated with the Atlantic trade as suppliers of slaves. How the Atlantic trade led to sharply divergent paths between Western Europe and Africa is yet another example of institutional divergence resulting from the interaction between critical junctures and existing institutional differences. While in England the profits of the slave trade helped to enrich those who opposed absolutism, in Africa they helped to create and strengthen absolutism. Farther away from Europe, the processes of institutional drift were obviously even freer to go their own way. In the Americas, for example, which had been cut off from Europe around 15,000 BC by the melting of the ice that linked Alaska to Russia, there were similar institutional innovations as those of the Natufians, leading to sedentary life, hierarchy, and inequality, in short, extractive institutions. These took place first in Mexico and in Andean Peru and Bolivia and led to the American Neolithic Revolution, with the domestication of maize. It was in these places that early forms of extractive growth took place, as we have seen in the Maya city-states. But in the same way that big breakthroughs toward inclusive institutions and industrial growth in Europe did not come in places where the Roman world had the strongest hold, Inclusive institutions in the Americas did not develop in the lands of these early civilizations. In fact, as we saw in Chapter 1, these densely settled civilizations interacted in a perverse way with European colonialism to create a reversal of fortune, making the places that were previously relatively wealthy in the Americas relatively poor. Today it is the United States and Canada which were then far behind the complex civilizations in Mexico, Peru, and Bolivia, that are much richer than the rest of the Americas. Consequences of Early Growth 
The long period between the Neolithic Revolution, which started in 9500 BC, and the British Industrial Revolution of the late 18th century is littered with spurts of economic growth. These spurts were triggered by institutional innovations that ultimately faltered. In ancient Rome the institutions of the Republic, which created some degree of economic vitality and allowed for the construction of a massive empire, unraveled after the coup of Julius Caesar and the construction of the empire under Augustus. It took centuries for the Roman Empire finally to vanish, and the decline was drawn out. But once the relatively inclusive republican institutions gave way to the more extractive institutions of the empire, economic regress became all but inevitable. The Venetian dynamics were similar. The economic prosperity of Venice was forged by institutions that had important inclusive elements, but these were undermined when the existing elite closed the system to new entrants and even banned the economic institutions that had created the prosperity of the Republic. However notable the experience of Rome, it was not Rome's inheritance that led directly to the rise of inclusive institutions in England and to the British Industrial Revolution. Historical factors shape how institutions develop, but this is not a simple, predetermined, cumulative process. Rome and Venice illustrate how early steps toward inclusivity were reversed. The economic and institutional landscape that Rome created throughout Europe and the Middle East did not inexorably lead to the more firmly rooted inclusive institutions of later centuries. In fact, these would emerge first and most strongly in England, where the Roman hold was weakest and where it disappeared most decisively, almost without a trace, during the 5th century AD. Instead, as we discussed in Chapter 4, history plays a major role through institutional drift that creates institutional differences, albeit sometimes small, which then get amplified when they interact with critical junctures. It is because these differences are often small that they can be reversed easily and are not necessarily the consequence of a simple cumulative process. Of course, Rome had long-lasting effects on Europe. Roman law and institutions influenced the laws and institutions that the kingdoms of the barbarians set up after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. It was also Rome's fall that created the decentralized political landscape that developed into the feudal order. The disappearance of slavery and the emergence of independent cities were long, drawn out, and, of course, historically contingent, byproducts of this process. These would become particularly consequential when the Black Death shook feudal society deeply. Out of the ashes of the Black Death emerged stronger towns and cities, and a peasantry no longer tied to the land and newly free of feudal obligations. It was precisely these critical junctures unleashed by the fall of the Roman Empire that led to a strong institutional drift, affecting all of Europe in a way that has no parallel in sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, or the Americas. By the 16th century, Europe was institutionally very distinct from Sub-Saharan Africa and the Americas. Though not much richer than the most spectacular Asian civilizations in India or China, Europe differed from these polities in some key ways. For example, it had developed representative institutions of a sort unseen there. These were to play a critical role in the development of inclusive institutions. As we will see in the next two chapters, small institutional differences would be the ones that would really matter within Europe, and these favored England, because it was there that the feudal order had made way most comprehensively for commercially minded farmers, and independent urban centers where merchants and industrialists could flourish. These groups were already demanding more secure property rights, different economic institutions and political voice from their monarchs. This whole process would come to a head in the 17th century. 
Why Nations Fail The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson 7. The Turning Point How a Political Revolution in 1688 Changed Institutions in England and Led to the Industrial Revolution 7. The Turning Point Trouble with Stockings in 1583 William Lee returned from his studies at the University of Cambridge to become the local priest in Calverton, England. Elizabeth I, 1558-1603, had recently issued a ruling that her people should always wear a knitted cap. Lee recorded that, knitters were the only means of producing such garments, but it took so long to finish the article. I began to think. I watched my mother and my sisters sitting in the evening twilight plying their needles. If garments were made by two needles and one line of thread, why not several needles to take up the thread? This momentous thought was the beginning of the mechanization of textile production. Lee became obsessed with making a machine that would free people from endless hand knitting. He recalled, my duties to church and family I began to neglect. The idea of my machine and the creating of it ate into my heart and brain. Finally, in 1589, his stocking frame knitting machine was ready. He traveled to London with excitement to seek an interview with Elizabeth I to show her how useful the machine would be, and to ask her for a patent that would stop other people from copying the design. He rented a building to set the machine up and, with the help of his local member of Parliament Richard Parkins, met Henry Carey, Lord Hunson, a member of the Queen's Privy Council. Carey arranged for Queen Elizabeth to come see the machine, but her reaction was devastating. She refused to grant Lee a patent, instead observing, Thou aimest high, Master Lee. Consider thou what the invention could do to my poor subjects. It would assuredly bring to them ruin by depriving them of employment, thus making them beggars. Crushed, Lee moved to France to try his luck there, when he failed there. 2. He returned to England, where he asked James I, 1603-1625, Elizabeth's successor, for a patent. James I also refused, on the same grounds as Elizabeth. Both feared that the mechanization of stocking production would be politically destabilizing. It would throw people out of work, create unemployment and political instability, and threaten royal power. The stocking frame was an innovation that promised huge productivity increases, but it also promised creative destruction. The reaction to Lee's brilliant invention illustrates a key idea of this book. The fear of creative destruction is the main reason why there was no sustained increase in living standards between the Neolithic and Industrial Revolutions. Technological innovation makes human societies prosperous, but also involves the replacement of the old with the new, and the destruction of the economic privileges and political power of certain people. For sustained economic growth we need new technologies, new ways of doing things, and more often than not they will come from newcomers such as Lee. It may make society prosperous, but the process of creative destruction that it initiates threatens the livelihood of those who work with old technologies, such as the hand knitters who would have found themselves unemployed by Lee's technology. More important, Major innovations such as Lee's stocking frame machine also threatened to reshape political power. Ultimately it was not concern about the fate of those who might become unemployed as a result of Lee's machine. That led Elizabeth I and James I to oppose his patent. It was their fear that they would become political losers. Their concern that those displaced by the invention would create political instability and threaten their own power. As we saw with the Luddites, pages 85 to 86, it is often possible to bypass the resistance of workers such as hand knitters. 
but the elite, especially when their political power is threatened, form a more formidable barrier to innovation. The fact that they have much to lose from creative destruction means not only that. They will not be the ones introducing new innovations but also that they will often resist and try to stop such innovations. Thus society needs newcomers to introduce the most radical innovations, and these newcomers and the creative destruction they wreak must often overcome several sources of resistance, including that from powerful rulers and elites. Prior to 17th century England, extractive institutions were the norm throughout history. They have at times been able to generate economic growth, as shown in the last two chapters, especially when they've contained inclusive elements, as in Venice and Rome. But they did not permit creative destruction. The growth they generated was not sustained, and came to an end because of the absence of new innovations because of political infighting generated by the desire to benefit from extraction, or because the nascent inclusive elements were conclusively reversed, as in Venice. The life expectancy of a resident of the Natufian village of Abu Huraira was probably not that much different from that of a citizen of ancient Rome. The life expectancy of a typical Roman was fairly similar to that of an average inhabitant of England in the 17th century. In terms of incomes, in 301 AD the Roman Emperor Diocletian issued the Edict on Maximum Prices, which set out a schedule of wages that various types of workers would be paid. We don't know exactly how well Diocletian's wages and prices were enforced. But when the economic historian Robert Allen used his edict to calculate the living standards of a typical unskilled worker, he found them to be almost exactly the same as those of an unskilled worker in 17th century Italy. Farther north, in England, wages were higher and increasing, and things were changing. How this came to be is the topic of this chapter. Ever-present Political Conflict Conflict over institutions and the distribution of resources has been pervasive throughout history. We saw, for example, how political conflict shaped the evolution of ancient Rome and Venice, where it was ultimately resolved in favor of the elites, who were able to increase their hold on power. English history is also full of conflict between the monarchy and its subjects, between different factions fighting for power and between elites and citizens. The outcome, though, has not always been to strengthen the power of those who held it. In 1215 the barons, the layer of the elite beneath the king, stood up to King John and made him sign the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, at Runnymede, see Map 9, page 112. This document enacted some basic principles that were significant challenges to the authority of the king. Most important, it established that the king had to consult with the barons in order to raise taxes. The most contentious clause was number 61, which stated that, the barons shall choose any twenty-five barons of the realm they wish, who with all their might are to observe maintain and cause to be observed the peace and liberties which we have granted and confirmed to them by this our present charter. In essence, the barons created a council to make sure that the king implemented the charter, and if he didn't, these twenty-five barons had the right to seize castles, lands, and possessions, until, in their judgment, amends have been made. King John didn't like the Magna Carta, and as soon as the barons dispersed, he got the Pope to annul it. But both the political power of the barons and the influence of the Magna Carta remained. England had taken its first hesitant step toward pluralism. Conflict over political institutions continued, and the power of the monarchy was further constrained by the first elected parliament in 1265. Unlike the plebeian assembly in Rome or the elected legislatures of today, its members had originally been feudal nobles, and subsequently were knights and the wealthiest aristocrats of the nation. Despite consisting of elites, 
the English Parliament developed two distinguishing characteristics. First, it represented not only elites closely allied to the king but also a broad set of interests, including minor aristocrats involved in different walks of life, such as commerce and industry, and later the gentry, a new class of commercial and upwardly mobile farmers. Thus the parliament empowered a quite broad section of society, especially by the standards of the time. Second, and largely as a result of the first characteristic, many members of parliament were consistently opposed to the monarchy's attempts to increase its power, and would become the mainstay of those fighting against the monarchy in the English Civil War and then in the Glorious Revolution. The Magna Carta and the first elected parliament notwithstanding, political conflict continued over the powers of the monarchy and who was to be king. This inter-elite conflict ended with the War of the Roses, a long duel between the houses of Lancaster and York, two families with contenders to be king. The winners were the Lancastrians, whose candidate for king, Henry Tudor, became Henry VII in 1485. Two other interrelated processes took place. The first was increasing political centralization, put into motion by the Tudors. After 1485 Henry VII disarmed the aristocracy, in effect demilitarizing them and thereby massively expanding the power of the central state. His son, Henry VIII, then implemented through his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, a revolution in government. In the 1530s, Cromwell introduced a nascent bureaucratic state. Instead of the government being just the private household of the king, it could become a separate set of enduring institutions. This was complemented by Henry VIII's break with the Roman Catholic Church and the dissolution of the monasteries, in which Henry expropriated all the church lands. The removal of the power of the church was part of making the state more centralized. This centralization of state institutions meant that for the first time, inclusive political institutions became possible. This process initiated by Henry VII and Henry VIII not only centralized state institutions, but also increased the demand for broader, based political representation. The process of political centralization can actually lead to a form of absolutism as the king and his associates can crush other powerful groups in society. This is indeed one of the reasons why there will be opposition against state centralization, as we saw in Chapter 3. However, in opposition to this force, the centralization of state institutions can also mobilize demand for a nascent form of pluralism, as it did in Tudor England. When the barons and local elites recognize that political power will be increasingly more centralized, and that this process is hard to stop, they will make demands to have a say in how this centralized power is used. In England during the late 15th and 16th centuries, this meant greater efforts by these groups to have parliament as a counterweight against the crown and to partially control the way the state functioned. Thus the Tudor project not only initiated political centralization, one pillar of inclusive institutions, but also indirectly contributed to pluralism, the other pillar of inclusive institutions. These developments in political institutions took place in the context of other major changes in the nature of society. Particularly significant was the widening of political conflict which was broadening the set of groups, with the ability to make demands on the monarchy and the political elites. The Peasants' Revolt of 1381, page 99, was pivotal, after which the English elite were rocked by a long sequence of popular insurrections. Political power was being redistributed not simply from the king to the lords, but also from the elite to the people. These changes, together with the increasing constraints on the king's power, made the emergence of a broad coalition opposed to absolutism possible and thus laid the foundations 
for pluralistic political institutions. Though contested, the political and economic institutions the Tudors inherited and sustained were clearly extractive. In 1603 Elizabeth I, Henry VIII's daughter who had acceded to the throne of England in 1553, died without children, and the Tudors were replaced by the Stuart dynasty. The first Stuart king, James I, inherited not only the institutions but the conflicts over them. He desired to be an absolutist ruler. Though the state had become more centralized and social change was redistributing power in society, political institutions were not yet pluralistic. In the economy, extractive institutions manifested themselves not just in the opposition to Lee's invention, but in the form of monopolies, monopolies, and more monopolies. In 1601 a list of these was read out in Parliament, with one member ironically asking, Is not bread there? By 1621 there were 700 of them. As the English historian Christopher Hill put it, a man lived. In a house built with monopoly bricks, with windows, of monopoly glass, heated by monopoly coal, in Ireland monopoly timber, burning in a grate made of monopoly iron. He washed himself in Monopoly soap, his clothes in Monopoly starch. He dressed in Monopoly lace, Monopoly linen, Monopoly leather, Monopoly gold thread. His clothes were held up by Monopoly belts, Monopoly buttons, Monopoly pins. They were dyed with Monopoly dyes. He ate Monopoly butter, Monopoly currants, Monopoly red herrings, Monopoly salmon, and Monopoly lobsters. His food was seasoned with Monopoly salt, Monopoly pepper, Monopoly vinegar. He wrote with Monopoly pens, on Monopoly writing paper, read, through Monopoly spectacles, by the light of Monopoly candles, Monopoly printed books. These Monopolies, and many more, gave individuals or groups the sole right to control the production of many goods. They impeded the type of allocation of talent, which is so crucial to economic prosperity. Both James I and his son and successor Charles I aspired to strengthen the monarchy, reduce the influence of Parliament, and establish absolutist institutions similar to those being constructed in Spain and France to further their, and the elite's control of the economy, making institutions more extractive. The conflict between James I and Parliament came to a head in the 1620s. Central in this conflict was the control of trade both overseas and within the British Isles. The Crown's ability to grant monopolies was a key source of revenue for the state, and was used frequently as a way of granting exclusive rights to supporters of the king. Not surprisingly, this extractive institution blocking entry and inhibiting the functioning of the market was also highly damaging to economic activity, and to the interests of many members of Parliament. In 1623 Parliament scored a notable victory by managing to pass the Statute of Monopolies, which prohibited James I from creating new domestic monopolies. He would still be able to grant monopolies on international trade, however, since the authority of Parliament did not extend to international affairs. Existing monopolies, international or otherwise, stood untouched. Parliament did not sit regularly and had to be called into session by the King. The convention that emerged after the Magna Carta was that the King was required to convene Parliament to get assent for new taxes. Charles I came to the throne in 1625, declined to call Parliament after 1629, and intensified James I's efforts to build a more solidly absolutist regime. He induced forced loans, meaning that people had to lend to him money, and he unilaterally changed the terms of loans and refused to repay his debts. He created and sold monopolies in the one dimension that the statute of monopolies had left to him, overseas trading ventures. 
he also undermined the independence of the judiciary and attempted to intervene to influence the outcome of legal cases. He levied many fines and charges, the most contentious of which was ship money, in 1634 taxing the coastal counties to pay for the support of the Royal Navy and, in 1635, extending the levy to the inland counties. Ship money was levied each year until 1640. Charles's increasingly absolutist behavior and extractive policies created resentment and resistance throughout the country. In 1640 he faced conflict with Scotland and, without enough money to put a proper army into the field, was forced to call Parliament to ask for more taxes. The so-called short Parliament sat for only three weeks. The parliamentarians who came to London refused to talk about taxes, but aired many grievances, until Charles dismissed them. The Scots realized that Charles did not have the support of the nation and invaded England, occupying the city of Newcastle. Charles opened negotiations, and the Scots demanded that Parliament be involved. This induced Charles to call what then became known as the Long Parliament because it continued to sit until 1648, refusing to dissolve even when Charles demanded it do so. In 1642 the civil war broke out between Charles and Parliament, even though there were many in Parliament who sided with the crown. The pattern of conflicts reflected the struggle over economic and political institutions. Parliament wanted an end to absolutist political institutions, the king wanted them strengthened. These conflicts were rooted in economics. Many supported the crown because they had been granted lucrative monopolies. For example, the local monopolies controlled by the rich and powerful merchants of Shrewsbury and Oswestry were protected by the crown from competition by London merchants. These merchants sided with Charles I. On the other side, the metallurgical industry had flourished around Birmingham because monopolies were weak there and newcomers to the industry did not have to serve a seven-year apprenticeship, as they did in other parts of the country. During the Civil War, they made swords and produced volunteers for the parliamentary side. Similarly, the lack of guild regulation in the county of Lancashire allowed for the development before 1640 of the new draperies, a new style of lighter cloth. The area where the production of these cloths was concentrated was the only part of Lancashire to support Parliament. Under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell, the parliamentarians, known as the Roundheads after the style in which their hair was cropped, defeated the Royalists known as Cavaliers. Charles was tried and executed in 1649. His defeat and the abolition of the monarchy did not, however, result in inclusive institutions. Instead, monarchy was replaced by the dictatorship of Oliver Cromwell. Following Cromwell's death, the monarchy was restored in 1660 and clawed back many of the privileges that had been stripped from it in 1649. Charles's son, Charles II, then set about the same program of creating absolutism in England. These attempts were only intensified by his brother James II, who ascended to the throne after Charles's death in 1685. In 1688 James's attempt to re-establish absolutism created another crisis and another civil war. Parliament this time was more united and organized. They invited the Dutch stadtholder, William of Orange, and his wife, Mary, James's Protestant daughter, to replace James. William would bring an army and claim the throne to rule not as an absolutist monarch but under a constitutional monarchy forged by Parliament. Two months after William's landing in the British Isles at Brixham in Devon, see Map 9, page 112, James's army disintegrated and he fled to France. The Glorious Revolution After victory in the Glorious Revolution, 
Parliament and William negotiated a new constitution. The changes were foreshadowed by William's declaration, made shortly prior to his invasion. They were further enshrined in the Declaration of Rights, produced by Parliament in February 1689. The declaration was read out to William at the same session where he was offered the crown. In many ways the declaration, which would be called the Bill of Rights after its signing into law, was vague. Crucially, however, it did establish some central constitutional principles. It determined the succession to the throne, and did so in a way that departed significantly from the then-received hereditary principles. If Parliament could remove a monarch and replace him with one more to their liking once, then why not again? The Declaration of Rights also asserted that the monarch could not suspend or dispense with laws, and it reiterated the illegality of taxation without parliamentary consent. In addition, it stated that there could be no standing army in England without parliamentary consent. Vagueness entered into such clauses as Number 8, which stated, the election of members of Parliament ought to be free, but did not specify how free was to be determined. Even vaguer was Clause 13, whose main point was that Parliaments ought to be held frequently. Since when and whether Parliament would be held had been such a contentious issue for the entire century, one might have expected much more specificity in this clause. Nevertheless, the reason for this vague wording is clear. Clauses have to be enforced. During the reign of Charles II, a triennial act had been in place that asserted that parliaments had to be called at least once every three years. But Charles ignored it, and nothing happened, because there was no method of enforcing it. After 1688, Parliament could have tried to introduce a method for enforcing this clause, as the barons had done with their council after King John signed the Magna Carta. They did not do so because they did not need to. This was because authority and decision-making power switched to Parliament after 1688. Even without specific constitutional rules or laws, William simply gave up on many of the practices of previous kings. He stopped interfering in legal decisions and gave up previous rights, such as getting the customs revenues for life. Taken together, these changes in political institutions represented the triumph of Parliament over the King, and thus the end of absolutism in England and subsequently Great Britain. As England and Scotland were united by the Act of Union in 1707. From then on, Parliament was firmly in control of state policy. This made a huge difference, because the interests of Parliament were very different from those of the Stuart kings. Since many of those in Parliament had important investments in trade and industry, they had a strong stake in enforcing property rights. The Stuarts had frequently infringed on property rights, now they would be upheld. Moreover, when the Stuarts controlled how the government spent money, Parliament opposed greater taxes and balked at strengthening the power of the state. Now that Parliament itself controlled spending, it was happy to raise taxes and spend the money on activities that it deemed valuable. Chief among them was the strengthening of the navy which would protect the overseas mercantile interests of many of the members of Parliament. Even more important than the interest of parliamentarians was the emerging pluralistic nature of political institutions. The English people now had access to Parliament, and the policy and economic institutions made in Parliament, in a way they never had when policy was driven by the King. This was partially, of course, because members of Parliament were elected. But since England was far from being a democracy in this period, this access provided only a modest amount of responsiveness. Among its many inequities was that less than 2% of the population could vote in the 18th century, and these had to be men. 
the cities where the Industrial Revolution took place, Birmingham, Leeds, Manchester, and Sheffield, had no independent representation in Parliament. Instead, rural areas were overrepresented. Just as bad, the right to vote in the rural areas, the counties, was based on ownership of land, and many urban areas, the boroughs, were controlled by a small elite who did not allow the new industrialists to vote or run for office. In the borough of Buckingham, for instance, 13 burgesses had the exclusive right to vote. On top of this there were the rotten boroughs, which had historically had the right to vote but had rotted away, either because their population had moved over time or, in the case on Dunwich on the east coast of England, had actually fallen into the ocean as a result of coastal erosion. In each of these rotten boroughs, a small number of voters elected two members of parliament. Old Sarum had seven voters, Dunwich 32, and each elected two members of parliament. But there were other ways to influence parliament and thus economic institutions. The most important was via petitioning and this was much more significant than the limited extent of democracy for the emergence of pluralism, after the Glorious Revolution. Anybody could petition Parliament, and petition they did. Significantly, when people petitioned, Parliament listened. It is this more than anything that reflects the defeat of absolutism, the empowerment of a fairly broad segment of society and the rise of pluralism in England after 1688. The frantic petitioning activity shows that it was indeed such a broad group in society, far beyond those sitting or even being represented in Parliament, that had the power to influence the way the state worked. And they used it. The case of monopolies best illustrates this. We saw above how monopolies were at the heart of extractive economic institutions in the 17th century. They came under attack in 1623 with the statute of monopolies, and were a serious bone of contention during the English Civil War. The Long Parliament abolished all the domestic monopolies that so impinged on people's lives. Though Charles II and James II could not bring these back, they managed to maintain the ability to grant overseas monopolies. One was the Royal African Company, whose monopoly charter was issued by Charles II in 1660. This company held a monopoly on the lucrative African slave trade, and its governor and major shareholder was Charles's brother James, soon to become James II. After 1688 the company lost not just its governor, but its main supporter. James had assiduously protected the monopoly of the company against interlopers, the independent traders who tried to buy slaves in West Africa and sell them in the Americas. This was a very profitable trade, and the Royal African Company faced a lot of challenges, since all other English trade in the Atlantic was free. In 1689 the company seized the cargo of an interloper, one Nightingale. Nightingale sued the company for illegal seizure of goods, and Chief Justice Holt ruled that the company's seizure was unlawful because it was exercising a monopoly right created by royal prerogative. Holt reasoned that monopoly privileges could be created only by statute, and this had to be done by Parliament. So Holt pushed all future monopolies, not just of the Royal Africa Company into the hands of Parliament. Before 1688 James II would quickly have removed any judge who made such a ruling. After 1688 things were different. Parliament now had to decide what to do with the monopoly, and the petitions began to fly. 135 came from interlopers demanding free access to trade in the Atlantic. Though the Royal African Company responded in kind, it could not hope to match the number or scope of the petitions demanding its demise. The interlopers succeeded in framing their opposition in terms not just of narrow self-interest, 
but of national interest, which indeed it was. As a result, only five of the 135 petitions were signed by the interlopers themselves, and 73 of the interlopers' petitions came from the provinces outside London, as against eight for the company. From the colonies, where petitioning was also allowed, the interlopers gathered 27 petitions, the company 11. The interlopers also gathered far more signatures for their petitions, in total 8,000, as opposed to 2,500 for the company. The struggle continued until 1698, when the Royal African Company monopoly was abolished. Along with this new locus for the determination of economic institutions and the new responsiveness after 1688, parliamentarians started making a series of key changes in economic institutions and government policy that would ultimately pave the way for the Industrial Revolution. Property rights eroded under the Stuarts were strengthened. Parliament began a process of reform in economic institutions to promote manufacturing, rather than taxing and impeding it. The hearth tax, an annual tax for each fireplace or stove, which fell most heavily on manufacturers, who were bitterly opposed to it, was abolished in 1689, soon after William and Mary ascended the throne. Instead of taxing hearths, Parliament moved to start taxing land. Redistributing the tax burden was not the only pro-manufacturing policy that Parliament supported. A whole series of acts and legislations that would expand the market and the profitability of woolen textiles was passed. This all made political sense since many of the parliamentarians who opposed James were heavily invested in these nascent manufacturing enterprises. Parliament also passed legislation that allowed for a complete reorganization of property rights in land, permitting the consolidation and elimination of many archaic forms of property and user rights. Another priority of Parliament was reforming finance. Though there had been an expansion of banking and finance in the period leading up to the Glorious Revolution, this process was further cemented by the creation of the Bank of England in 1694, as a source of funds for industry. It was another direct consequence of the Glorious Revolution. The foundation of the Bank of England paved the way for a much more extensive, financial revolution which led to a great expansion of financial markets and banking. By the early 18th century, loans would be available to everyone who could put up the necessary collateral. The records of a relatively small bank, C. Hors and Company in London, which have survived intact from the period 1702 to 1724, illustrate this point. Though the bank did lend money to aristocrats and lords, Fully two-thirds of the biggest borrowers from whores over this period were not from the privileged social classes. Instead they were merchants and businessmen, including one John Smith, a man with the name of the eponymous average Englishman, who was loaned £2,600 by the bank during the period 1715 to 1719. So far we have emphasized how the Glorious Revolution transformed English political institutions, making them more pluralistic, and also started laying the foundations for inclusive economic institutions. There is one more significant change in institutions that emerged from the Glorious Revolution. Parliament continued the process of political centralization that was initiated by the Tudors. It was not just that constraints increased, or that the state regulated the economy in a different way, or that the English state spent money on different things, but also the capability and capacity of the state increased in all directions. This again illustrates the linkages between political centralization and pluralism. Parliament had opposed making the state more effective and better resourced prior to 1688 because it could not control it. After 1688 it was a different story. 
the state started expanding, with expenditures soon reaching around 10% of national income. This was underpinned by an expansion of the tax base, particularly with respect to the excise tax, which was levied on the production of a long list of domestically produced commodities. This was a very large state budget for the period, and is in fact larger than what we see today in many parts of the world. The state budgets in Colombia, for example, reached this relative size only in the 1980s. In many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, for example, in Sierra Leone, the state budget even today would be far smaller relative to the size of the economy without the large inflows of foreign aid. But the expansion of the size of the state is only part of the process of political centralization. More important than this was the qualitative way the state functioned and the way those who controlled it and those who worked in it behaved. The construction of state institutions in England reached back into the Middle Ages, but as we've seen, page 186, steps toward political centralization and the development of modern administration were decisively taken by Henry VII and Henry VIII. Yet the state was still far from the modern form that would emerge after 1688. For example, many appointees were made on political grounds, not because of merit or talent, and the state still had a very limited capacity to raise taxes. After 1688 Parliament began to improve the ability to raise revenue through taxation, a development well illustrated by the excise tax bureaucracy which expanded rapidly from 1,211 people in 1690 to 4,800, by 1780. Excise tax inspectors were stationed throughout the country, supervised by collectors who engaged in tours of inspection to measure and check the amount of bread, beer, and other goods subject to the excise tax. The extent of this operation is illustrated by the reconstruction of the excise rounds of supervisor George Cowperthwaite, by the historian John Brewer. Between June 12 and July 5, 1710, supervisor Cowperthwaite traveled 290 miles in the Richmond district of Yorkshire. During this period he visited 263 victuallers, 71 maltsters, 20 chandlers, and one common brewer. In all, he took 81 different measurements of production and checked the work of nine different excise men who worked for him. Eight years later we find him working just as hard, but now in the Wakefield district, in a different part of Yorkshire. In Wakefield, he traveled more than 19 miles a day on average and worked six days a week, normally inspecting four or five premises. On his day off, Sunday, he made up his books, so we have a complete record of his activities. Indeed, the excise tax system had very elaborate record-keeping. Officers kept three different types of records, all of which were supposed to match one another, and any tampering with these records was a serious offense. This remarkable level of state supervision of society exceeds what the governments of most poor countries can achieve today, and this in 1710. Also significantly, after 1688 the state began to rely more on talent and less on political appointees, and developed a powerful infrastructure to run the country. The Industrial Revolution the Industrial Revolution was manifested in every aspect of the English economy. There were major improvements in transportation, metallurgy, and steam power. But the most significant area of innovation was the mechanization of textile production and the development of factories to produce these manufactured textiles. This dynamic process was unleashed by the institutional changes that flowed from the Glorious Revolution. This was not just about the abolition of domestic monopolies, which had been achieved by 1640, or about different taxes or access to finance. It was about 
a fundamental reorganization of economic institutions in favor of innovators and entrepreneurs, based on the emergence of more secure and efficient property rights. Improvements in the security and efficiency of property rights, for example, played a central role in the transportation revolution, paving the way for the industrial revolution. Investment in canals and roads, the so-called turnpikes, massively increased after 1688. These investments, by reducing the costs of transportation, helped to create an important prerequisite for the Industrial Revolution. Prior to 1688, investment in such infrastructure had been impeded by arbitrary acts by the Stuart kings. The change in the situation after 1688 is vividly illustrated by the case of the River Salwerp, in Worcestershire, England. In 1662 Parliament passed an act to encourage investment to make the Salwerp navigable, and the Baldwin family invested £6,000 to this end. In return they got the right to charge people for navigation on the river. In 1693 a bill was introduced to Parliament to transfer the rights to charge for navigation to the Earl of Shrewsbury and Lord Coventry. This act was challenged by Sir Timothy Baldwin, who immediately submitted a petition to Parliament claiming that the proposed bill was essentially expropriating his father, who had already heavily invested in the river in anticipation of the charges he could then levy. Baldwin argued that the new act tends to make void the said act, and to take away all the works and materials done in pursuance thereof. Reallocation of rights such as this was exactly the sort of thing done by Stuart monarchs. Baldwin noted, I, T is of dangerous consequence to take away any person's right, purchased under an act of parliament, without their consent. In the event, the new act failed, and Baldwin's rights were upheld. Property rights were much more secure after 1688, partly because securing them was consistent with the interests of Parliament and partly because pluralistic institutions could be influenced by petitioning. We see here that after 1688 the political system became significantly more pluralistic and created a relatively level playing field within England. Underlying the transportation revolution and, more generally, the reorganization of land that took place in the 18th century were parliamentary acts that changed the nature of property ownership. Until 1688 there was even the legal fiction that all the land in England was ultimately owned by the Crown, a direct legacy from the feudal organization of society. Many pieces of land were encumbered by numerous archaic forms of property rights and many cross-cutting claims. Much land was held in so-called equitable estates, which meant that the landowner could not mortgage, lease, or sell the land. Common land could often be used only for traditional uses. There were enormous impediments to using land in ways that would be economically desirable. Parliament began to change this, allowing groups of people to petition Parliament to simplify and reorganize property rights, alterations that were subsequently embodied into hundreds of Acts of Parliament. This reorganization of economic institutions also manifested itself in the emergence of an agenda to protect domestic textile production against foreign imports. Not surprisingly, parliamentarians and their constituents were not opposed to all entry barriers and monopolies. Those that would increase their own market and profits would be welcome. However, crucially, the pluralistic political institutions, the fact that Parliament represented, empowered, and listened to a broad segment of society, meant that these entry barriers would not choke other industrialists or completely shut out newcomers, as the Serrata did in Venice, pages 155 to 156. The powerful woolen manufacturers soon made this discovery. 
In 1688 some of the most significant imports into England were textiles from India, calicos, and muslins, which comprised about one-quarter of all textile imports. Also important were silks from China. Calicos and silks were imported by the East India Company, which prior to 1688 enjoyed a government-sanctioned monopoly over the trade with Asia. But the monopoly and the political power of the East India Company was sustained through heavy bribes to James II. After 1688 the company was in a vulnerable position and soon under attack. This took the form of an intense war of petitions with traders hoping to trade in the Far East and India demanding that Parliament sanction competition for the East India Company, while the company responded with counterpetitions and offers to lend Parliament money. The company lost, and a new East India Company to compete with it was founded. But textile producers did not just want more competition in the trade to India. They wanted imports of cheap Indian textiles, calicos, taxed or even banned. These producers faced strong competition from these cheap Indian imports. At this point the most important domestic manufacturers produced woolen textiles, but the producers of cotton cloths were becoming both more important economically and more powerful politically. The wool industry mounted attempts to protect itself as early as the 1660s. It promoted the sumptuary laws, which, among other things, prohibited the wearing of lighter cloth. It also lobbied Parliament to pass legislation in 1666 and 1678 that would make it illegal for someone to be buried in anything other than a woolen shroud. Both measures protected the market for woolen goods and reduced the competition that English manufacturers faced from Asia. Nevertheless, in this period the East India Company was too strong to restrict imports of Asian textiles. The tide changed after 1688. Between 1696 and 1698, Woolen manufacturers from East Anglia and the West Country allied with silk weavers from London, Canterbury, and the Levant Company to restrict imports. The silk importers from the Levant, even if they had recently lost their monopoly, wished to exclude Asian silks to create a niche for silks from the Ottoman Empire. This coalition started to present bills to Parliament to place restrictions on the wearing of Asian cottons and silks, and also restrictions on the dyeing and printing of Asian textiles in England. In response, in 1701, Parliament finally passed an act for the more effectual employing the poor, by encouraging the manufacturers of this kingdom. From September 1701, it decreed, all wrought silks, bangles and stuffs, mixed with silk of herba, of the manufacture of Persia, China, or East India, all calicos painted, dyed, printed, or stained there, which are or shall be imported into this kingdom, shall not be worn. It was now illegal to wear Asian silks and calicos in England. But it was still possible to import them for re-export to Europe or elsewhere, in particular to the American colonies. Moreover, plain calicos could be imported and finished in England, and muslins were exempt from the ban. After a long struggle, these loopholes, as the domestic woolen textile manufacturers viewed them, were closed by the Calico Act of 1721, after December 25, 1722. It shall not be lawful for any person or persons whatsoever to use or wear in Great Britain in any garment or apparel whatsoever, any printed, painted, stained or dyed calico. Though this act removed competition from Asia for English woolens, it still left an active domestic cotton and linen industry competing against the woolens. Cotton and linen were mixed to produce a popular cloth called fustian. Having excluded Asian competition, the wool industry now turned to clamp down on linen. Linen was primarily made in Scotland and Ireland, 
which gave some scope to an English coalition to demand those countries' exclusion from English markets. However, there were limits to the power of the woolen manufacturers. Their new attempts encountered strong opposition. From fustian producers in the burgeoning industrial centres of Manchester, Lancaster, and Liverpool. The pluralistic political institutions implied that all these different groups now had access to the policy process in Parliament, via voting and, more important, petitioning. Though the petitions flew from the pens of both sides, amassing signatures for and against, the outcome of this conflict was a victory for the new interests against those of the wool industry. The Manchester Act of 1736 agreed that, Great quantities of stuffs made from linen yarn and cotton wool have for several years past been manufactured, and have been printed and painted within this kingdom of Great Britain. It then went on to assert that nothing in the said recited Act, of 1721, shall extend or be construed to prohibit the wearing or using in apparel, household stuff, furniture, or otherwise, any sort of stuff made out of linen yarn and cotton wool manufactured and printed or painted with any color or colors within the Kingdom of Great Britain. The Manchester Act was a significant victory for the nascent cotton manufacturers. But its historical and economic significance was in fact much greater. First, it demonstrated the limits of entry barriers that the pluralistic political institutions of parliamentary England would permit. Second, over the next half-century, technological innovations in the manufacture of cotton cloth would play a central role in the Industrial Revolution, and fundamentally transform society by introducing the factory system. After 1688, though domestically a level playing field emerged, internationally Parliament strove to tilt it. This was evident not only from the Calico Acts but also from the Navigation Acts, the first of which was passed in 1651, and they remained in force with alternations for the next 200 years. The aim of these acts was to facilitate England's monopolization of international trade, though crucially this was monopolization not by the state but by the private sector. The basic principle was that English trade should be carried in English ships. The acts made it illegal for foreign ships to transport goods from outside Europe to England or its colonies, and it was similarly illegal for third-party countries' ships to ship goods from a country elsewhere in Europe to England. This advantage for English traders and manufacturers naturally increased their profits and may have further encouraged innovation in these new and highly profitable activities. By 1760 the combination of all these factors, improved and new property rights, improved infrastructure, a changed fiscal regime, greater access to finance, and aggressive protection of traders and manufacturers, was beginning to have an effect. After this date, there was a jump in the number of patented inventions and the great flowering of technological change that was to be at the heart of the Industrial Revolution began to be evident. Innovations took place on many fronts, reflecting the improved institutional environment. One crucial area was power, most famously the transformations in the use of the steam engine that were a result of James Watt's ideas in the 1760s. Watt's initial breakthrough was to introduce a separate condensing chamber for the steam so that the cylinder that housed the piston could be kept continually hot, instead of having to be warmed up and cooled down. He subsequently developed many other ideas, including much more efficient methods of converting the motion of the steam engine into useful power, notably his sun and planets gear system. In all these areas technological innovations built on earlier work by others. In the context of the steam engine, this included early work by English inventor Thomas Newcomen and also by Dionysius Papin, a French physicist and inventor. 
The story of Papin's invention is another example of how, under extractive institutions, the threat of creative destruction impeded technological change. Papin developed a design for a steam digester in 1679, and in 1690 he extended this into a piston engine. In 1705 he used this rudimentary engine to build the world's first steamboat. Papin was by this time a professor of mathematics at the University of Marburg, in the German state of Kassel. He decided to steam the boat down the river Fulda to the river Weser. Any boat making this trip was forced to stop at the city of Munden. At that time, river traffic on the Fulda and Weser was the monopoly of a guild of boatmen. Papin must have sensed that there might be trouble. His friend and mentor, the famous German physicist Gottfried Leibniz, wrote to the elector of Kassel, the head of state, petitioning that Papin should be allowed to pass unmolested through Kassel. Yet Leibniz's petition was rebuffed and he received the curt answer that, the electoral councillors have found serious obstacles in the way of granting the above petition, and, without giving their reasons, have directed me to inform you of their decision, and that in consequence the request is not granted by His Electoral Highness. Undeterred, Papin decided to make the journey anyway. When his steamer arrived at Munden, the Boatmen's Guild first tried to get a local judge to impound the ship, but was unsuccessful. The boatmen then set upon Papin's boat and smashed it and the steam engine to pieces. Papin died a pauper and was buried in an unmarked grave. In Tudor or Stuart England, Papin might have received similar hostile treatment, but this all changed after 1688. Indeed, Papin was intending to sail his boat to London before it was destroyed. In metallurgy, key contributions were made in the 1780s by Henry Court, who introduced new techniques for dealing with impurities in iron, allowing for a much better quality wrought iron to be produced. This was critical for the manufacture of machine parts, nails, and tools. The production of vast quantities of wrought iron using quartz techniques was facilitated by the innovations of Abraham Darby and his sons, who pioneered the use of coal to smelt iron beginning in 1709. This process was enhanced in 1762 by the adaptation, by John Smeaton, of water power to operate blowing cylinders in making coke. After this, charcoal vanished from the production of iron, to be replaced by coal, which was much cheaper and more readily available. Even though innovation is obviously cumulative, there was a distinct acceleration in the middle of the 18th century. In no place was this more visible than in textile production. The most basic operation in the production of textiles is spinning, which involves taking plant or animal fibers, such as cotton or wool, and twisting them together to form yarn. This yarn is then woven to make up textiles. One of the great technological innovations of the medieval period was the spinning wheel, which replaced hand spinning. This invention appeared around 1280 in Europe, probably disseminating from the Middle East. The methods of spinning did not change until the 18th century. Significant innovations began in 1738, when Louis Paul patented a new method of spinning using rollers to replace human hands to draw out the fibers being spun. The machine did not work well, however and it was the innovations of Richard Arkwright and James Hargreaves that truly revolutionized spinning. In 1769 Arkwright, one of the dominant figures of the Industrial Revolution, patented his water frame, which was a huge improvement over Lewis's machine. He formed a partnership with Jedediah Strutt and Samuel Need, who were hosiery manufacturers. In 1771 they built one of the world's first factories, at Cromford. The new machines were powered by water, but Arkwright later made the crucial transition to steam power. 
By 1774 his firm employed 600 workers, and he expanded aggressively, eventually setting up factories in Manchester, Matlock, Bath, and New Lanark in Scotland. Arkwright's innovations were complemented by Hargreaves's invention in 1764 of the spinning jenny, which was further developed by Samuel Crompton in 1779 into the mule, and later by Richard Roberts into the self-acting mule. The effects of these innovations were truly revolutionary. Earlier in the century, it took 50,000 hours for hand spinners to spin 100 pounds of cotton. Arkwright's water frame could do it in 300 hours, and the self-acting mule in 135. Along with the mechanization of spinning came the mechanization of weaving. An important first step was the invention of the flying shuttle by John Kay in 1733. Though it initially simply increased the productivity of hand weavers, its most enduring impact would be in opening the way to mechanized weaving. Building on the flying shuttle, Edmund Cartwright introduced the power loom in 1785, a first step in a series of innovations that would lead to machines replacing manual skills in weaving as they were also doing in spinning. The English textile industry not only was the driving force behind the Industrial Revolution but also revolutionized the world economy. English exports, led by cotton textiles, doubled between 1780 and 1800. It was the growth in this sector that pulled ahead the whole economy. The combination of technological and organizational innovation provides the model for economic progress that transformed the economies of the world that became rich. New people with new ideas were crucial to this transformation. Consider innovation in transportation. In England there were several waves of such innovations, first canals, then roads, and finally railways. In each of these waves the innovators were new men. Canals started to develop in England after 1770, and by 1810 they had linked up many of the most important manufacturing areas. As the Industrial Revolution unfolded, Canals played an important role in reducing transportation costs for moving around the bulky new finished industrial goods, such as cotton textiles, and the inputs that went into them, particularly raw cotton and coal for the steam engines. Early innovators in building canals were men such as James Brindley, who was employed by the Duke of Bridgewater to build the Bridgewater Canal which ended up linking the key industrial city of Manchester to the port of Liverpool. Born in rural Derbyshire, Brindley was a millwright by profession. His reputation for finding creative solutions to engineering problems came to the attention of the Duke. He had no previous experience with transportation problems, which also was true of other great canal engineers such as Thomas Telford who started life as a stonemason, or John Smeaton, an instrument maker and engineer. Just as the great canal engineers had no previous connection to transportation, neither did the great road and railway engineers. John McAdam, who invented tarmac around 1816, was the second son of a minor aristocrat. The first steam train was built by Richard Trevithick in 1804. Trevithick's father was involved in mining in Cornwall, and Richard entered the same business at an early age, becoming fascinated by steam engines used for pumping out the mines. More significant were the innovations of George Stevenson, the son of illiterate parents and the inventor of the famous train, the Rocket, who began work as an engine man at a coal mine. New men also drove the critical cotton textile industry. Some of the pioneers of this new industry were people who had previously been heavily involved in the production and trade of woolen cloths. John Foster, for example, employed 700 handloom weavers in the woolen industry at the time he switched to cotton and opened Black Dyke Mills in 1835, 
but men such as Foster were a minority. Only about one-fifth of the leading industrialists at this time had previously been involved in anything like manufacturing activities. This is not surprising. For one, the cotton industry developed in new towns in the north of England. Factories were a completely new way of organizing production. The woolen industry had been organized in a very different way, by putting out materials to individuals in their homes, who spun and wove on their own. Most of those in the woolen industry were therefore ill-equipped to switch to cotton, as Foster did. Newcomers were needed to develop and use the new technologies. The rapid expansion of cotton decimated the wool industry, creative destruction in action. Creative destruction redistributes not simply income and wealth, but also political power. As William Lee learned when he found the authorities so unreceptive to his invention because they feared its political consequences. As the industrial economy expanded in Manchester and Birmingham, the new factory owners and middle-class groups that emerged around them began to protest their disenfranchisement and the government policies, opposed to their interests. Their prime candidate was the Corn Laws, which banned the import of a corn, all grains and cereals, but principally wheat. If the price got too low, thus ensuring that the profits of large landowners were kept high. This policy was very good for big landowners who produced wheat, but bad for manufacturers, because they had to pay higher wages to compensate for the high price of bread. With workers concentrated into new factories and industrial centers, it became easier to organize and riot. By the 1820s, the political exclusion of the new manufacturers and manufacturing centers was becoming untenable. On August 16, 1819, a meeting to protest the political system and the policies of the government was planned to be held in St. Peter's Fields, Manchester. The organizer was Joseph Johnson, a local brush manufacturer and one of the founders of the radical newspaper The Manchester Observer. Other organizers included John Knight, a cotton manufacturer and reformer, and John Thacker Saxton, editor of the Manchester Observer. Sixty thousand protesters gathered, many holding banners such as No Corn Laws, Universal Suffrage, and Vote by Ballot, meaning voting should take place secretly, not openly, as it did in 1819. The authorities were very nervous about the meeting and a force of 600 cavalry of the 15th Hussars had been assembled. As the speeches began, a local magistrate decided to issue a warrant for the arrest of the speakers. As police tried to enforce the warrant, they met with the opposition of the crowd, and fighting broke out. At this point the Hussars charged the crowd. Within a few chaotic minutes, 11 people were dead and probably 600 wounded. The Manchester Observer called it the Peterloo Massacre. But given the changes that had already taken place in economic and political institutions, long-run repression was not a solution in England. The Peterloo Massacre would remain an isolated incident. Following the riot, the political institutions in England gave way to the pressure, and the destabilizing threat of much wider social unrest particularly after the 1830 revolution in France against Charles X, who had tried to restore the absolutism destroyed by the French Revolution of 1789. In 1832 the government passed the first Reform Act. It enfranchised Birmingham, Leeds, Manchester, and Sheffield, and broadened the base of voting so that manufacturers could be represented in Parliament. The consequent shift in political power moved policy in the direction favored by these newly represented interests. In 1846 they managed to get the hated Corn Laws repealed, demonstrating again that creative destruction meant a redistribution not just of income, but also of political power. And naturally, 
changes in the distribution of political power in time would lead to a further redistribution of income. It was the inclusive nature of English institutions that allowed this process to take place. Those who suffered from and feared creative destruction were no longer able to stop it. Why in England? The Industrial Revolution started and made its biggest strides in England because of her uniquely inclusive economic institutions. These in turn were built on foundations laid by the inclusive political institutions brought about by the Glorious Revolution. It was the Glorious Revolution that strengthened and rationalized property rights, improved financial markets, undermined state-sanctioned monopolies in foreign trade, and removed the barriers to the expansion of industry. It was the glorious revolution that made the political system open and responsive to the economic needs and aspirations of society. These inclusive economic institutions gave men of talent and vision such as James what the opportunity and incentive to develop their skills and ideas and influence the system in ways that benefited them and the nation. Naturally these men, once they had become successful, had the same urges as any other person. They wanted to block others from entering their businesses and competing against them and feared the process of creative destruction. That might put them out of business, as they had previously bankrupted others. But after 1688 this became harder to accomplish. In 1775 Richard Arkwright took out an encompassing patent that he hoped would give him a monopoly on the rapidly expanding cotton spinning industry in the future. He could not get the courts to enforce it. Why did this unique process start in England and why in the 17th century? Why did England develop pluralistic political institutions and break away from extractive institutions? As we have seen, the political developments leading up to the Glorious Revolution were shaped by several interlinked processes. Central was the political conflict between absolutism and its opponents. The outcome of this conflict not only put a stop to the attempts to create a renewed and stronger absolutism in England, but also empowered those wishing to fundamentally change the institutions of society. The opponents of absolutism did not simply attempt to build a different type of absolutism. This was not simply the House of Lancaster defeating the House of York in the War of the Roses. Instead, the Glorious Revolution involved the emergence of a new regime based on constitutional rule and pluralism. This outcome was a consequence of the drift in English institutions and the way they interacted with critical junctures. We saw in the previous chapter how feudal institutions were created in Western Europe after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Feudalism spread throughout most of Europe, West and East. But as Chapter 4 showed, Western and Eastern Europe began to diverge radically after the Black Death. Small differences in political and economic institutions meant that in the West the balance of power led to institutional improvement, in the East, to institutional deterioration. But this was not a path that would necessarily and inexorably lead to inclusive institutions. Many more crucial turns would have to be taken on the way. Though the Magna Carta had attempted to establish some basic institutional foundations for constitutional rule, many other parts of Europe, even Eastern Europe, saw similar struggles with similar documents. Yet, after the Black Death, Western Europe significantly drifted away from the East. Documents such as the Magna Carta started to have more bite in the West. In the East, they came to mean little. In England, even before the conflicts of the 17th century, the norm was established that the king could not raise new taxes without the consent of Parliament. No less important was the slow, incremental drift of power away from elites to citizens more generally, as exemplified by the political mobilization of rural communities, 
seen in England with such moments as the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. This drift of institutions now interacted with another critical juncture caused by the massive expansion of trade into the Atlantic. As we saw in Chapter 4, one crucial way in which this influenced future institutional dynamics depended on whether or not the crown was able to monopolize this trade. In England the somewhat greater power of Parliament meant that the Tudor and Stuart monarchs could not do so. This created a new class of merchants and businessmen, who aggressively opposed the plan to create absolutism in England. By 1686 in London, for example, there were 702 merchants exporting to the Caribbean and 1,283 importing. North America had 691 exporting and 626 importing merchants. They employed warehousemen, sailors, captains, dock workers, clerks, all of whom broadly shared their interests. Other vibrant ports, such as Bristol, Liverpool, and Portsmouth, were similarly full of such merchants. These new men wanted and demanded different economic institutions, and as they got wealthier through trade, they became more powerful. The same forces were at work in France, Spain, and Portugal. But there the kings were much more able to control trade and its profits. The type of new group that was to transform England did emerge in those countries, but was considerably smaller and weaker. When the Long Parliament sat and the Civil War broke out in 1642, these merchants primarily sided with the parliamentary cause. In the 1670s they were heavily involved in the formation of the Whig Party, to oppose Stuart absolutism, and in 1688 they would be pivotal in deposing James II. So the expanding trade opportunities presented by the Americas, the mass entry of English merchants into this trade and the economic development of the colonies, and the fortunes they made in the process, tipped the balance of power in the struggle between the monarchy and those opposed to absolutism. Perhaps most critically, the emergence and empowerment of diverse interests, ranging from the gentry, a class of commercial farmers that had emerged in the Tudor period, to different types of manufacturers to Atlantic traders, meant that the coalition against Stuart absolutism was not only strong but also broad. This coalition was strengthened even more by the formation of the Whig Party in the 1670s, which provided an organization to further its interests. Its empowerment was what underpinned pluralism following the Glorious Revolution. If all those fighting against the Stuarts had the same interests and the same background, the overthrow of the Stuart monarchy would have been much more likely to be a replay of the House of Lancaster versus the House of York, pitting one group against another narrow set of interests, and ultimately replacing and recreating the same or a different form of extractive institutions. A broad coalition meant that there would be greater demands for the creation of pluralist political institutions. Without some sort of pluralism, there would be a danger that one of the diverse interests would usurp power at the expense of the rest. The fact that Parliament after 1688 represented such a broad coalition was a crucial factor in making members of Parliament listen to petitions, even when they came from people outside of Parliament and even from those without a vote. This was a crucial factor in preventing attempts by one group to create a monopoly at the expense of the rest, as will interests tried to do before the Manchester Act. The Glorious Revolution was a momentous event precisely because it was led by an emboldened broad coalition, and further empowered this coalition, which managed to forge a constitutional regime with constraints on the power of both the executive and, equally crucially, any one of its members. It was, for example, these constraints that prevented the wool manufacturers from being able to crush the potential competition from the cotton and fustian manufacturers. 
Thus this broad coalition was essential in the lead-up to a strong parliament after 1688, but it also meant that there were checks within parliament against any single group becoming too powerful and abusing its power. It was the critical factor in the emergence of pluralistic political institutions. The empowerment of such a broad coalition also played an important role in the persistence and strengthening of these inclusive economic and political institutions, as we will see in Chapter 11. Still none of this made a truly pluralistic regime inevitable, and its emergence was in part a consequence of the contingent path of history. A coalition that was not too different was able to emerge victorious from the English civil war against the Stuarts, but this only led to Oliver Cromwell's dictatorship. The strength of this coalition was also no guarantee that absolutism would be defeated. James II could have defeated William of Orange. The path of major institutional change was, as usual, no less contingent than the outcome of other political conflicts. This was so even if the specific path of institutional drift that created the broad coalition opposed to absolutism, and the critical juncture of Atlantic trading opportunities stacked the cards against the Stuarts. In this instance, therefore, contingency and a broad coalition were deciding factors underpinning the emergence of pluralism and inclusive institutions. Why Nations Fail The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson 8. Not on our Turf, Barriers to Development why the politically powerful in many nations opposed the Industrial Revolution. 8. Not on our turf, barriers to development. No printing allowed. In 1445 I am the German city of Mainz, Johannes Gutenberg unveiled an innovation with profound consequences for subsequent economic history, a printing press based on movable type. Until then, books either had to be hand-copied by scribes, a very slow and laborious process, or they were block-printed with specific pieces of wood cut for printing each page. Books were few and far between, and very expensive. After Gutenberg's invention, things began to change. Books were printed and became more readily available. Without this innovation, mass literacy and education would have been impossible. In Western Europe, the importance of the printing press was quickly recognized. In 1460 there was already a printing press across the border, in Strasbourg, France. By the late 1460s the technology had spread throughout Italy, with presses in Rome and Venice, soon followed by Florence, Milan, and Turin. By 1476 William Caxton had set up a printing press in London, and two years later there was one in Oxford. During the same period, printing spread throughout the Low Countries, into Spain, and even into Eastern Europe, with a press opening in Budapest in 1473 and in Krakow a year later. Not everyone saw printing as a desirable innovation. As early as 1485 the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid, too issued an edict that Muslims were expressly forbidden from printing in Arabic. This rule was further reinforced by Sultan Salim I in 1515. It was not until 1727 that the first printing press was allowed in the Ottoman lands. Then Sultan Ahmed III issued a decree granting Ibrahim Mutaferika permission to set up a press. Even this belated step was hedged with restraints. Though the decree noted the fortunate day. This Western technique will be unveiled like a bride and will not again be hidden. Mutaferika's printing was going to be closely monitored. The decree stated so that the printed books will be free from printing mistakes, the wise, respected and meritorious religious scholars specializing in Islamic law, the excellent Qadi of Istanbul, Mevlana Ishak, and Seleniki's Qadi, 
Mevlana Sahib, and Galadas Qadi, Mevlana Asad, may their merits be increased, and from the illustrious religious orders, the pillar of the righteous religious scholars, the Sheikh of the Qasim Pasa Mevlvihain, Mevlana Musa, may his wisdom and knowledge increase, will oversee the proofreading. Mutaferika was allowed to set up a printing press, but whatever he printed had to be vetted by a panel of three religious and legal scholars, the Qadis. Maybe the wisdom and knowledge of the Qadis, like everybody else's, would have increased much faster had the printing press been more readily available. But that was not to be, even after Mutaferika was given permission to set up his press. Not surprisingly Mutaferika printed few books in the end, only seventeen between 1729, when the press began to operate, and 1743, when he stopped working. His family tried to continue the tradition, but they managed to print only another seven books by the time they finally gave up in 1797. Outside of the core of the Ottoman Empire in Turkey, printing lagged even further behind. In Egypt, for instance, the first printing press was set up only in 1798, by Frenchmen who were part of the abortive attempt by Napoleon Bonaparte to capture the country. Until well into the second half of the 19th century, book production in the Ottoman Empire was still primarily undertaken by scribes hand-copying existing books. In the early 18th century, there were reputed to be 80,000 such scribes active in Istanbul. This opposition to the printing press had the obvious consequences for literacy, education, and economic success. In 1800 probably only 2 to 3 percent of the citizens of the Ottoman Empire were literate, compared with 60 percent of adult males and 40 percent of adult females in England. In the Netherlands and Germany, literacy rates were even higher. The Ottoman lands lagged far behind the European countries with the lowest educational attainment in this period, such as Portugal, where probably only around 20% of adults could read and write. Given the highly absolutist and extractive Ottoman institutions, the Sultan's hostility to the printing press is easy to understand. Books spread ideas and make the population much harder to control. Some of these ideas may be valuable new ways to increase economic growth, but others may be subversive and challenge the existing political and social status quo. Books also undermine the power of those who control oral knowledge, since they make that knowledge readily available to anyone who can master literacy. This threatened to undermine the existing status quo, where knowledge was controlled by elites. The Ottoman sultans and religious establishment feared the creative destruction that would result. Their solution was to forbid printing. The Industrial Revolution created a critical juncture that affected almost every country. Some nations, such as England, not only allowed, but actively encouraged, commerce, industrialization, and entrepreneurship, and grew rapidly. Many, such as the Ottoman Empire, China, and other absolutist regimes, lagged behind as they blocked or at the very least did. Nothing to encourage the spread of industry. Political and economic institutions shaped the response to technological innovation creating once again the familiar pattern of interaction between existing institutions and critical junctures leading to divergence in institutions and economic outcomes. The Ottoman Empire remained absolutist until it collapsed at the end of the First World War, and was thus able to successfully oppose or impede innovations such as the printing press and the creative destruction that would have resulted. The reason that the economic changes that took place in England did not happen in the Ottoman Empire is the natural connection between extractive, absolutist political institutions and extractive economic institutions. Absolutism is rule unconstrained by law or the wishes of others, 
though in reality absolutists rule with the support of some small group or elite. In 19th century Russia, for example, the Tsars were absolutist rulers supported by a nobility that represented about 1% of the total population. This narrow group organized political institutions to perpetuate their power. There was no parliament or political representation of other groups in Russian society until 1905, when the Tsar created the Duma, though he quickly undermined what few powers he had given to it. Unsurprisingly, economic institutions were extractive, organized to make the Tsar and nobility as wealthy as possible. The basis of this, as of many extractive economic systems, was a mass system of labor coercion and control, in the particularly pernicious form of Russian serfdom. Absolutism was not the only type of political institution preventing industrialization. Though absolutist regimes were not pluralistic and feared creative destruction, many had centralized states, or at least states that were centralized enough to impose bans on innovations such as the printing press. Even today, countries such as Afghanistan, Haiti, and Nepal have national states that lack political centralization. In sub-Saharan Africa the situation is even worse. As we argued earlier, without a centralized state to provide order and enforce rules and property rights, inclusive institutions could not emerge. We will see in this chapter that in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, for example, Somalia and southern Sudan, a major barrier to industrialization was the lack of any form of political centralization. Without these natural prerequisites, industrialization had no chance of getting off the ground. Absolutism and a lack of, or weak, political centralization are two different barriers to the spread of industry. But they are also connected. Both are kept in place by fear of creative destruction and because the process of political centralization often creates a tendency toward absolutism. Resistance to political centralization is motivated by reasons similar to resistance to inclusive political institutions, fear of losing political power, this time to the newly centralizing state and those who control it. We saw in the previous chapter how the process of political centralization under the Tudor monarchy in England increased demands for voice and representation by different local elites in national political institutions, as a way of staving off this loss of political power. A stronger parliament was created, ultimately enabling the emergence of inclusive political institutions. But in many other cases, just the opposite takes place and the process of political centralization also ushers in an era of greater absolutism. This is illustrated by the origins of Russian absolutism, which was forged by Peter the Great between 1682 and his death in 1725. Peter built a new capital at St. Petersburg, stripping away power from the old aristocracy, the boyars in order to create a modern bureaucratic state and modern army. He even abolished the Boyar Duma that had made him Tsar. Peter introduced the Table of Ranks, a completely new social hierarchy whose essence was service to the Tsar. He also took control over the Church, just as Henry VIII did when centralizing the state in England. With this process of political centralization, Peter was taking power away from others and redirecting it toward himself. His military reforms led the traditional royal guards, the Streltsy, to rebel. Their revolt was followed by others, such as the Bashkirs in Central Asia and the Bulavan Rebellion. None succeeded. Though Peter the Great's project of political centralization was a success and the opposition was overcome. The type of forces that opposed state centralization, such as the Streltsy, who saw their power being challenged, won out in many parts of the world, 
and the resulting lack of state centralization meant the persistence of a different type of extractive political institutions. In this chapter, we will see how during the critical juncture created by the Industrial Revolution, many nations missed the boat and failed to take advantage of the spread of industry. Either they had absolutist political and extractive economic institutions, as in the Ottoman Empire, or they lacked political centralization, as in Somalia. A small difference that mattered. Absolutism crumbled in England during the 17th century but got stronger in Spain. The Spanish equivalent of the English Parliament, the Cortes, existed in name only. Spain was forged in 1492 with the merger of the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon via the marriage of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. That date coincided with the end of the Reconquest, the long process of ousting the Arabs who had occupied the south of Spain, and built the great cities of Granada, Cordova, and Seville, since the 8th century. The last Arab state on the Iberian Peninsula, Granada, fell to Spain. At the same time Christopher Columbus arrived in the Americas and started claiming lands for Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, who had funded his voyage. The merger of the crowns of Castile and Aragon and subsequent dynastic marriages and inheritances created a European superstate. Isabella died in 1504, and her daughter Joanna was crowned Queen of Castile. Joanna was married to Philip of the House of Habsburg, the son of the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Maximilian I. In 1516 Charles, Joanna and Philip's son, was crowned Charles I of Castile and Aragon. When his father died, Charles inherited the Netherlands and French Comte, which he added to his territories in Iberia and the Americas. In 1519, when Maximilian I died, Charles also inherited the Habsburg territories in Germany and became Emperor Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. What had been a merger of two Spanish kingdoms in 1492 became a multi-continental empire, and Charles continued the project of strengthening the absolutist state that Isabella and Ferdinand had begun. The effort to build and consolidate absolutism in Spain was massively aided by the discovery of precious metals in the Americas. Silver had already been discovered in large quantities in Guanajuato, in Mexico, by the 1520s, and soon thereafter in Zacatecas, Mexico. The conquest of Peru after 1532 created even more wealth for the monarchy. This came in the form of a share the royal fifth, in any loot from conquest and also from mines. As we saw in Chapter 1, a mountain of silver was discovered in Potosí by the 1540s, pouring more wealth into the coffers of the Spanish king. At the time of the merger of Castile and Aragon, Spain was among the most economically successful parts of Europe. After its absolutist political system solidified, it went into relative and then, after 1600, absolute. Economic Decline Almost the first acts of Isabella and Ferdinand after the Reconquest was the expropriation of the Jews. The approximately 200,000 Jews in Spain were given four months to leave. They had to sell off all their land and assets at very low prices and were not allowed to take any gold or silver out of the country. A similar human tragedy was played out just over 100 years later. Between 1609 and 1614, Philip III expelled the Moriscos, the descendants of the citizens of the former Arab states in the south of Spain. Just as with the Jews, the Moriscos had to leave with only what they could carry and were not allowed to take with them any gold, silver, or other precious metals. Property rights were insecure in other dimensions under Habsburg rule in Spain. Philip II, who succeeded his father, Charles V, in 1556, defaulted on his debts in 1557 and again in 1560, 
ruining the Fugger and Welser banking families. The role of the German banking families was then assumed by Genoese banking families, who were in turn ruined by subsequent Spanish defaults during the reign of the Habsburgs in 1575, 1596, 1607, 1627, 1647, 1652, 1660, and 1662. Just as crucial as the instability of property rights in absolutist Spain was the impact of absolutism on the economic institutions of trade and the development of the Spanish colonial empire. As we saw in the previous chapter, the economic success of England was based on rapid mercantile expansion. Though, compared with Spain and Portugal, England was a latecomer to Atlantic trade. She allowed for relatively broad-based participation in trading and colonial opportunities. What filled the crown's coffers in Spain enriched the newly emerging merchant class in England. It was this merchant class that would form the basis of early England economic dynamism, and become the bulwark of the anti-absolutist political coalition. In Spain these processes that led to economic progress and institutional change did not take place. After the Americas had been discovered, Isabella and Ferdinand organized trade between their new colonies and Spain via a guild of merchants in Seville. These merchants controlled all trade and made sure that the monarchy got its share of the wealth of the Americas. There was no free trade with any of the colonies and each year a large flotilla of ships would return from the Americas bringing precious metals and valuable goods to Seville. The narrow, monopolized base of this trade meant that no broad class of merchants could emerge via trading opportunities with the colonies. Even trade within the Americas was heavily regulated. For example, a merchant in a colony such as New Spain, roughly modern Mexico, could not trade directly with anyone in New Granada, modern Colombia. These restrictions on trade within the Spanish Empire reduced its economic prosperity and also, indirectly, the potential benefits that Spain could have gained by trading with another, more prosperous empire. Nevertheless, they were attractive because they guaranteed that the silver and gold would keep flowing to Spain. The extractive economic institutions of Spain were a direct result of the construction of absolutism and the different path, compared with England, taken by political institutions. Both the Kingdom of Castile and the Kingdom of Aragon had their Cortes, a parliament representing the different groups, or, estates, of the kingdom. As with the English parliament, the Castilian Cortes needed to be summoned to assent to new taxes. Nevertheless, the Cortes in Castile and Aragon primarily represented the major cities, rather than both the urban and rural areas, as the English Parliament did. By the 15th century, it represented only 18 cities, each of whom sent two deputies. In consequence, the Cortes did not represent as broad a set of groups as the English Parliament did, and it never developed as a nexus of diverse interests vying to place constraints on absolutism. It could not legislate, and even the scope of its powers with respect to taxation was limited. This all made it easier for the Spanish monarchy to sideline the Cortes in the process of consolidating its own absolutism. Even with silver coming from the Americas, Charles V and Philip II required ever-increasing tax revenues to finance a series of expensive wars. In 1520 Charles V decided to present the Cortes with demands for increased taxation. Urban elites used the moment to call for much wider change in the Cortes and its powers. This opposition turned violent and quickly became known as the Comunero Rebellion. Charles was able to crush the rebellion with loyal troops. Throughout the rest of the 16th century, though, there was a continuous battle as the crown tried to wrest away from the Cortes what rights to levy new taxes and increase old ones, 
that it had. Though this battle ebbed and flowed, it was ultimately won by the monarchy. After 1664 the Cortés did not meet again until it would be reconstructed during the Napoleonic invasions, almost 150 years later. In England the defeat of absolutism in 1688 led not only to pluralistic political institutions, but also to the further development of a much more effective centralized state. In Spain the opposite happened as absolutism triumphed. Though the monarchy emasculated the Cortés and removed any potential constraints on its behavior, it became increasingly difficult to raise taxes, even when attempted by direct negotiations with individual cities. While the English state was creating a modern, efficient tax bureaucracy, the Spanish state was again moving in the opposite direction. The monarchy was not only failing to create secure property rights for entrepreneurs and monopolizing trade, but it was also selling offices, often making them hereditary, indulging in tax farming, and even selling immunity from justice. The consequences of these extractive political and economic institutions in Spain were predictable. During the 17th century, while England was moving toward commercial growth and then rapid industrialization, Spain was tailspinning toward widespread economic decline. At the start of the century, one in five people in Spain was living in urban areas. By the end, this figure had halved to one in ten, in a process that corresponded to increasing impoverishment of the Spanish population. Spanish incomes fell, while England grew rich. The persistence and the strengthening of absolutism in Spain, while it was being uprooted in England, is another example of small differences mattering during critical junctures. The small differences were in the strengths and nature of representative institutions. The critical juncture was the discovery of the Americas. The interaction of these sent Spain off on a very different institutional path from England. The relatively inclusive economic institutions that resulted in England created unprecedented economic dynamism, culminating in the Industrial Revolution, while industrialization did not stand a chance in Spain. By the time industrial technology was spreading in many parts of the world, the Spanish economy had declined so much that there was not even a need for the crown or the landowning elites in Spain to block industrialization. Fear of industry Without the changes in political institutions and political power similar to those that emerged in England, after 1688, there was little chance for absolutist countries to benefit from the innovations and new technologies of the Industrial Revolution. In Spain, for example, the lack of secure property rights and the widespread economic decline meant that people simply did not have the incentive to make the necessary investments and sacrifices. In Russia and Austria-Hungary, it wasn't simply the neglect and mismanagement of the elites and the insidious economic slide under extractive institutions that prevented industrialization, instead, the rulers actively blocked any attempt to introduce these technologies and basic investments in infrastructure such as railroads, that could have acted as their conduits. At the time of the Industrial Revolution, in the 18th and early 19th centuries, the political map of Europe was quite different from how it is today. The Holy Roman Empire, a patchwork quilt of more than 400 polities, most of which would eventually coalesce into Germany, occupied most of Central Europe. The House of Habsburg was still a major political force, and its empire, known as the Habsburg or Austro-Hungarian Empire, spread over a vast area of around 250,000 square miles, even if it no longer included Spain, after the Bourbons had taken over the Spanish throne in 1700. In terms of population, it was the third-largest state in Europe and comprised one-seventh of the population of Europe. 
In the late 18th century the Habsburg lands included, in the west, what is today Belgium, then known as the Austrian Netherlands. The largest part, however, was the contiguous block of lands based around Austria and Hungary, including the Czech Republic and Slovakia to the north, and Slovenia, Croatia, and large parts of Italy and Serbia to the south. To the east it also incorporated much of what is today Romania and Poland. Merchants in the Habsburg domains were much less important than in England, and serfdom prevailed in the lands in Eastern Europe. As we saw in Chapter 4, Hungary and Poland were at the heart of the second serfdom of Eastern Europe. The Habsburgs, unlike the Stuarts, were successful in sustaining strongly absolutist rule. Francis I, who ruled as the last emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, between 1792 and 1806, and then emperor of Austria-Hungary until his death in 1835, was a consummate absolutist. He did not recognize any limitations on his power and, above all, he wished to preserve the political status quo. His basic strategy was opposing change, any sort of change. In 1821 he made this clear in a speech, characteristic of Habsburg rulers, he gave to the teachers at a school in Leibach, asserting, I do not need savants, but good, honest citizens. Your task is to bring young men up to be this. He who serves me must teach what I order him. If anyone can't do this, or comes with new ideas, he can go, or I will remove him. The Empress Maria Theresa, who reigned between 1740 and 1780, frequently responded to suggestions about how to improve or change institutions by remarking, Leave everything as it is. Nevertheless, she and her son Joseph II, who was emperor between 1780 and 1790, were responsible for an attempt to construct a more powerful central state and more effective administrative system. Yet they did this in the context of a political system with no real constraints on their actions and with few elements of pluralism. There was no national parliament that would exert even a modicum of control on the monarch, only a system of regional estates and diets which historically had some powers with respect to taxation and military recruitment. There were even fewer controls on what the Austro-Hungarian Habsburgs could do than there were on Spanish monarchs, and political power was narrowly concentrated. As Habsburg absolutism strengthened in the 18th century, the power of all non-monarchical institutions weakened further. When a deputation of citizens from the Austrian province of the Tyrol petitioned Francis for a constitution, he responded, So, you want a constitution? Now look, I don't care for it, I will give you a constitution but you must know that the soldiers obey me, and I will not ask you twice if I need money. In any case I advise you to be careful what you are going to say. Given this response, the Tyrolese leaders replied, If thou thinkest thus, it is better to have no constitution. To which Francis answered, That is also my opinion. Francis dissolved the state council that Maria Theresa had used as a forum for consultation with her ministers. From then on there would be no consultation or public discussion of the Crown's decisions. Francis created a police state and ruthlessly censored anything that could be regarded as mildly radical. His philosophy of rule was characterized by Count Hartig, a long-standing aide, as the unabated maintenance of the sovereign's authority, and a denial of all claims on the part of the people to a participation in that authority. He was helped in all this by Prince von Metternich, appointed as his foreign minister in 1809. Metternich's power and influence actually outlasted that of Francis, and he remained foreign minister for almost 40 years. At the center of Habsburg economic institutions stood the feudal order and serfdom. As one moved east within the empire, feudalism became more intense, 
a reflection of the more general gradient in economic institutions we saw in Chapter 4, as one moved from Western to Eastern Europe. Labor mobility was highly circumscribed, and emigration was illegal. When the English philanthropist Robert Owen tried to convince the Austrian government to adopt some social reforms, in order to ameliorate the conditions of poor people, one of Metternich's assistants, Friedrich von Gentz, replied, We do not desire at all that the great masses shall become well off and independent. How could we otherwise rule over them? In addition to serfdom, which completely blocked the emergence of a labor market and removed the economic incentives or initiative from the mass of the rural population, Habsburg absolutism thrived on monopolies and other restrictions on trade. The urban economy was dominated by guilds, which restricted entry into professions. Until 1775 there were internal tariffs within Austria itself and in Hungary until 1784. There were very high tariffs on imported goods, with many explicit prohibitions on the import and export of goods. The suppression of markets and the creation of extractive economic institutions are of course quite characteristic of absolutism, but Francis went further. It was not simply that extractive economic institutions removed the incentive for individuals to innovate or adopt new technology. We saw in Chapter 2 how in the Kingdom of Congo attempts to promote the use of plows were unsuccessful because people lacked any incentive, given the extractive nature of the economic institutions. The King of Congo realized that if he could induce people to use plows, agricultural productivity would be higher, generating more wealth, which he could benefit from. This is a potential incentive for all governments, even absolutist ones. The problem in Congo was that people understood that whatever they produced could be confiscated by an absolutist monarch, and therefore they had no incentive to invest or use better technology. In the Habsburg lands, Francis did not encourage his citizens to adopt better technology, on the contrary, he actually opposed it, and blocked the dissemination of technologies that people would have been otherwise willing to adopt with the existing economic institutions. Opposition to innovation was manifested in two ways. First, Francis I was opposed to the development of industry. Industry led to factories, and factories would concentrate poor workers in cities, particularly in the capital city of Vienna. Those workers might then become supporters for opponents of absolutism. His policies were aimed at locking into place the traditional elites and the political and economic status quo. He wanted to keep society primarily agrarian. The best way to do this, Francis believed, was to stop the factories being built in the first place. This he did directly, for instance, in 1802, banning the creation of new factories in Vienna. Instead of encouraging the importation and adoption of new machinery, the basis of industrialization, he banned it until 1811. Second, he opposed the construction of railways, one of the key new technologies that came with the Industrial Revolution. When a plan to build a northern railway was put before Francis I, he replied, No, no, I will have nothing to do with it, lest the revolution might come into the country. Since the government would not grant a concession to build a steam railway, the first railway built in the empire had to use horse-drawn carriages. The line, which ran between the city of Linz, on the Danube, to the Bohemian city of Budweiss, on the Moldau River, was built with gradients and corners, which meant that it was impossible subsequently to convert it to steam engines. So it continued with horse power until the 1860s. The economic potential for railway development in the empire had been sensed early by the banker Salomon Rothschild the representative in Vienna of the great banking family. Salomon's brother Nathan, 
who was based in England, was very impressed by George Stevenson's engine of the rocket and the potential for steam locomotion. He contacted his brother to encourage him to look for opportunities to develop railways in Austria, since he believed that the family could make large profits by financing railway development. Nathan agreed, but the scheme went nowhere because Emperor Francis again simply said no. The opposition to industry and steam railways stemmed from Francis's concern about the creative destruction that accompanied the development of a modern economy. His main priorities were ensuring the stability of the extractive institutions, over which he ruled and protecting the advantages of the traditional elites who supported him. Not only was there little to gain from industrialization, which would undermine the feudal order by attracting labor from the countryside to the cities, but Francis also recognized the threat that major economic changes would pose to his political power. As a consequence, he blocked industry and economic progress, locking in economic backwardness, which manifested itself in many ways. For instance, as late as 1883, when 90% of world iron output was produced using coal. More than half of the output in the Habsburg territories still used much less efficient charcoal. Similarly, right up to the First World War, when the empire collapsed, textile weaving was never fully mechanized but still undertaken by hand. Austria-Hungary was not alone in fearing industry. Farther east, Russia had an equally absolutist set of political institutions, forged by Peter the Great, as we saw earlier in this chapter. Like Austria-Hungary, Russia's economic institutions were highly extractive, based on serfdom, keeping at least half of the population tied to the land. Serfs had to work for nothing three days a week on the lands of their lords. They could not move they lacked freedom of occupation, and they could be sold at will by their lord to another lord. The radical philosopher Peter Kropotkin, one of the founders of modern anarchism, left a vivid depiction of the way serfdom worked during the reign of Tsar Nicholas I, who ruled Russia from 1825 until 1855. He recalled from his childhood, Stories of men and women torn from their families and their villages and sold, lost in gambling, or exchanged for a couple of hunting dogs, and transported to some remote part of Russia. Of children taken from their parents and sold to cruel or dissolute masters, of flogging in the stables, which occurred every day with unheard of cruelty, of a girl who found her only salvation in drowning herself of an old man who had grown gray-haired in his master's service and at last hanged himself under his master's window, and of revolts of serfs, which were suppressed by Nicholas I's generals by flogging to death each tenth or fifth man taken out of the ranks, and by laying waste the village. As to the poverty which I saw during our journeys in certain villages, especially in those which belonged to the imperial family. No words would be adequate to describe the misery to readers who have not seen it. Exactly as in Austria-Hungary, absolutism didn't just create a set of economic institutions that impeded the prosperity of the society. There was a similar fear of creative destruction and a fear of industry and the railways. At the heart of this during the reign of Nicholas I was Count Igor Kankrin who served as finance minister between 1823 and 1844 and played a key role in opposing the changes in society necessary for promoting economic prosperity. Kankren's policies were aimed at strengthening the traditional political pillars of the regime, particularly the landed aristocracy, and keeping the society rural and agrarian. Upon becoming minister of finance, Kankren quickly opposed and reversed a proposal by the previous finance minister, Girov, to develop a government-owned commercial bank to lend to industry. Instead, Kankren reopened the state loan bank, which had been closed during the Napoleonic Wars. 
This bank was originally created to lend to large landowners at subsidized rates, a policy Cancran approved of. The loans required the applicants to put up serfs as a security, or collateral, so that only feudal landowners could get such loans. To finance the state loan bank, Cancran transferred assets from the commercial bank, killing two birds with one stone. There would now be little money left for industry. Cancran's attitudes were presciently shaped by the fear that economic change would bring political change, and so were those of Tsar Nicholas. Nicholas's assumption of power in December 1825 had been almost aborted by an attempted coup by military officers, the so called Decembrists, who had a radical program of social change. Nicholas wrote to Grand Duke Mikhail, Revolution is on Russia's doorstep but I swear that it will not penetrate the country while there is breath in my body. Nicholas feared the social changes that creating a modern economy would bring. As he put it in a speech he made to a meeting of manufacturers at an industrial exhibit in Moscow. Both the state and manufacturers must turn their attention to a subject, without which the very factories would become an evil rather than a blessing. This is the care of the workers who increase in number annually. They need energetic and paternal supervision of their morals. Without it this mass of people will gradually be corrupted and eventually turn into a class as miserable as they are dangerous, for their masters. Just as with Francis I, Nicholas feared that the creative destruction unleashed by a modern industrial economy would undermine the political status quo in Russia. Urged on by Nicholas, Cancran took specific steps to slow the potential for industry. He banned several industrial exhibitions, which had previously been held periodically to showcase new technology and facilitate technology adoption. In 1848 Europe was rocked by a series of revolutionary outbursts. In response, A. A. Izakrevsky, the military governor of Moscow, who was in charge of maintaining public order, wrote to Nicholas, for the preservation of calm and prosperity, which at present time only Russia enjoys, the government must not permit the gathering of homeless and dissolute people, who will easily join every movement, destroying social or private peace. His advice was brought before Nicholas's ministers, and in 1849 a new law was enacted that put severe limits on the number of factories that could be opened in any part of Moscow. It specifically forbade the opening of any new cotton or woolen spinning mills and iron foundries. Other industries, such as weaving and dyeing, had to petition the military governor if they wanted to open new factories. Eventually cotton spinning was explicitly banned. The law was intended to stop any further concentration of potentially rebellious workers in the city. Opposition to railways accompanied opposition to industry, exactly as in Austria-Hungary. Before 1842 there was only one railway in Russia. This was the tsarsko selo Railway, which ran 17 miles from St. Petersburg to the imperial residencies of tsarsko selo and Pavlovsk. Just as Kankran opposed industry, he saw no reason to promote railways, which he argued would bring a socially dangerous mobility, noting that railways do not always result from natural necessity, but are more an object of artificial need or luxury. They encourage unnecessary travel from place to place, which is entirely typical of our time. Kankran turned down numerous bids to build railways, and it was only in 1851 that a line was built linking Moscow and St. Petersburg. Kankran's policy was continued by Count Klein Michel, who was made head of the main administration of transport and public buildings. This institution became the main arbiter of railway construction, and Klein Michel used it as a platform to discourage their construction. After 1849, he even used his power to censor discussion in the newspapers of railway development. 
Map 13, opposite, shows the consequences of this logic. While Britain and most of Northwest Europe was crisscrossed with railways in 1870, very few penetrated the vast territory of Russia. The policy against railways was only reversed after Russia's conclusive defeat by British, French, and Ottoman forces in the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856, when the backwardness of its transportation network was understood to be a serious liability for Russian security. There was also little railway development in Austria, Hungary outside of Austria and the western parts of the empire. Though the 1848 revolutions had brought change to these territories, particularly the abolition of serfdom. No shipping allowed. Absolutism reigned not just in much of Europe but also in Asia, and similarly prevented industrialization during the critical juncture created by the Industrial Revolution. The Ming and Qing dynasties of China and the absolutism of the Ottoman Empire illustrate this pattern. Under the Song dynasty, between 960 and 1279, China led the world in many technological innovations. The Chinese invented clocks, the compass, gunpowder, paper and paper money, porcelain, and blast furnaces to make cast iron before Europe did. They independently developed spinning wheels and water power at more or less the same time that these emerged at the other end of Eurasia. In consequence, in 1500 standards of living were probably at least as high in China as they were in Europe. For centuries China also had a centralized state with a meritocratically recruited civil service. Yet China was absolutist, and the growth under the Song dynasty was under extractive institutions. There was no political representation for groups other than the monarchy in society, nothing resembling a parliament or a Cortes. Merchants always had a precarious status in China, and the great inventions of the Song were not spurred by market incentives but were brought into existence under the auspices, or even the orders, of the government. Little of this was commercialized. The grip of the state tightened during the Ming and Qing dynasties that followed the Song. At the root of all this was the usual logic of extractive institutions. As most rulers presiding over extractive institutions, the absolutist emperors of China opposed change, sought stability, and in essence feared creative destruction. This is best illustrated by the history of international trade. As we have seen, the discovery of the Americas and the way international trade was organized played a key role in the political conflicts and institutional changes of early modern Europe. In China, while private merchants were commonly involved in trade within the country, the state monopolized overseas trade. When the Ming Dynasty came to power in 1368, it was Emperor Hongwu who first ruled, for 30 years. Hongwu was concerned that overseas trade would be politically and socially destabilizing and he allowed international trade to take place only if it were organized by the government and only if it involved tribute giving, and not commercial activity. Hongwu even executed hundreds of people accused of trying to turn tribute missions into commercial ventures. Between 1377 and 1397, no ocean-going tribute missions were allowed. He banned private individuals from trading with foreigners and would not allow Chinese to sail overseas. In 1402 Emperor Yongle came to the throne and initiated one of the most famous periods of Chinese history, by restarting government-sponsored foreign trade on a big scale. Yongle sponsored Admiral Zheng He to undertake six huge missions to Southeast and South Asia, Arabia, and Africa. The Chinese knew about these places from a long history of trading relations, but nothing had ever happened on this scale before. The first fleet included 27,800 men and 62 large treasure ships, accompanied by 190 smaller ships, 
including one specifically for carrying fresh water, others for supplies, and others for troops. Yet Emperor Yongle put a temporary stop on the missions after the sixth one in 1422. This was made permanent by his successor, Hongxi, who ruled from 1424 to 1425. Hongxi's premature death brought to the throne Emperor Xuanda, who at first allowed Zheng He a final mission, in 1433. But after this, all overseas trade was banned. By 1436 the construction of seagoing ships was even made illegal. The ban on overseas trade was not lifted until 1567. These events, though only the tip of the extractive iceberg that prevented many economic activities deemed to be potentially destabilizing, were to have a fundamental impact on Chinese economic development. Just at the time when international trade and the discovery of the Americas were fundamentally transforming the institutions of England, China was cutting itself off from this critical juncture and turning inward. This inward turn did not end in 1567. The Ming dynasty was overrun in 1644 by the Jurchen people, the Manchus of Inner Asia, who created the Qing dynasty. A period of intense political instability then ensued. The Qings engaged in mass expropriation of property and assets. In the 1690s, Tang Chen, a retired Chinese scholar and failed merchant, wrote. More than 50 years have passed since the founding of the Qing, Qing, dynasty, and the empire grows poorer each day. Farmers are destitute, artisans are destitute, merchants are destitute, and officials too are destitute. Grain is cheap, yet it is hard to eat one's fill. Cloth is cheap, yet it is hard to cover one's skin. Boatloads of goods travel from one marketplace to another, but the cargoes must be sold at a loss. Officials upon leaving their posts discover they have no wherewithal to support their households. Indeed the four occupations are all impoverished. In 1661 the Emperor Kangxi ordered that all people living along the coast from Vietnam to Chekiang, essentially the entire southern coast, once the most commercially active part of China, should move 17 miles inland. The coast was patrolled by troops to enforce the measure, and until 1693 there was a ban on shipping everywhere on the coast. This ban was periodically reimposed in the 18th century, effectively stunting the emergence of Chinese overseas trade. Though some did develop, few were willing to invest when the emperor could suddenly change his mind and ban trade, making investments in ships, equipment, and trading relations worthless or even worse. The reasoning of the Ming and Qing states for opposing international trade is by now familiar, the fear of creative destruction. The leader's primary aim was political stability. International trade was potentially destabilizing as merchants were enriched and emboldened, as they were in England during the era of Atlantic expansion. This was not just what the rulers believed during the Ming and Qing dynasties, but also the attitude of the rulers of the Song dynasty even if they were willing to sponsor technological innovations and permit greater commercial freedom, provided that this was under their control. Things got worse under the Ming and Qing dynasties as the control of the state on economic activity tightened, and overseas trade was banned. There were certainly markets and trade in Ming and Qing China, and the government taxed the domestic economy quite lightly. However, it did little to support innovation, and it exchanged the development of mercantile or industrial prosperity for political stability. The consequence of all this absolutist control of the economy was predictable. The Chinese economy was stagnant throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries while other economies were industrializing. By the time Mao set up his communist regime in 1949, China had become one of the poorest countries in the world. 
The Absolutism of Prester John Absolutism as a set of political institutions and the economic consequences that flowed from it were not restricted to Europe and Asia. It was present in Africa, for example, with the Kingdom of Congo, as we saw in Chapter 2. An even more durable example of African absolutism is Ethiopia, or Abyssinia, whose roots we came across in Chapter 6, when we discussed the emergence of feudalism after the decline of Aksum. Abyssinian absolutism was even more long-lived than its European counterparts, because it was faced with very different challenges and critical junctures. After the conversion of the Aksumite king Azana to Christianity, the Ethiopians remained Christian, and by the 14th century they had become the focus of the myth of King Prester John. Prester John was a Christian king who had been cut off from Europe by the rise of Islam in the Middle East. Initially his kingdom was thought to be located in India. However, as European knowledge of India increased, people realized that this was not true. The king of Ethiopia, since he was a Christian, then became a natural target for the myth. Ethiopian kings in fact tried hard to forge alliances with European monarchs against Arab invasions, sending diplomatic missions to Europe from at least 1300 onward, even persuading the Portuguese king to send soldiers. These soldiers, along with diplomats, Jesuits, and travelers wishing to meet Prester John, left many accounts of Ethiopia. Some of the most interesting from an economic point of view are by Francisco Alvarez, a chaplain accompanying a Portuguese diplomatic mission, who was in Ethiopia from 1520 to 1527. In addition, there are accounts by Jesuit Manuel de Almeida, who lived in Ethiopia from 1624, and by John Bruce, a traveler who was in the country between 1768 and 1773. The writings of these people give a rich account of political and economic institutions at the time in Ethiopia, and leave no doubt that Ethiopia was a perfect specimen of absolutism. There were no pluralistic institutions of any kind, nor any checks and constraints on the power of the emperor, who claimed the right to rule on the basis of supposed descent from the legendary King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. The consequence of absolutism was great insecurity of property rights driven by the political strategy of the emperor. Bruce, for example, noted that all the land is the king's, he gives it to whom he pleases during pleasure, and resumes it when it is his will. As soon as he dies the whole land in the kingdom is at the disposal of the crown, and not only so, but, by death of the present owner, his possessions however long enjoyed, revert to the king, and do not fall to the eldest son. Alvarez claimed there would be much more fruit and tillage if the great men did not ill-treat the people. Alameda's account of how the society worked is very consistent. He observed. It is so usual for the emperor to exchange, alter and take away the lands each man holds every two or three years sometimes every year and even many times in the course of a year, that it causes no surprise. Often one man plows the soil, another sows it and another reaps. Hence it arises that there is no one who takes care of the land he enjoys, there is not even anyone to plant a tree because he knows that he who plants it very rarely gathers the fruit. For the king, however, it is useful that they should be so dependent upon him. These descriptions suggest major similarities between the political and economic structures of Ethiopia, and those of European absolutism, though they also make it clear that absolutism was more intense in Ethiopia, and economic institutions even more extractive. Moreover, as we emphasized in Chapter 6, Ethiopia was not subject to the same critical junctures that helped undermine the absolutist regime in England. It was cut off from many of the processes that shaped the modern world. Even if this had not been the case, 
the intensity of its absolutism would probably have led the absolutism to strengthen even more. For example, as in Spain, international trade in Ethiopia, including the lucrative slave trade, was controlled by the monarch. Ethiopia was not completely isolated, Europeans did search for Prester John, and it did have to fight wars against surrounding Islamic polities. Nevertheless, the historian Edward Gibbon noted with some accuracy that, encompassed on all sides by the enemies of their religion, the Ethiopians slept near a thousand years, forgetful of the world by whom they were forgotten. As the European colonization of Africa began in the 19th century, Ethiopia was an independent kingdom under Ras, Duke, Kassa, who was crowned Emperor Tuwadros II in 1855. Tuwadros embarked on a modernization of the state, creating a more centralized bureaucracy and judiciary, and a military capable of controlling the country and possibly fighting the Europeans. He placed military governors, responsible for collecting taxes and remitting them to him, in charge of all the provinces. His negotiations with European powers were difficult, and in exasperation he imprisoned the English consul. In 1868 the English sent an expeditionary force, which sacked his capital. Tuadros committed suicide. All the same, Tuadros's reconstructed government did manage to pull off one of the great anti-colonial triumphs of the 19th century, against the Italians. In 1889 the throne went to Menelik II who was immediately faced with the interest of Italy in establishing a colony there. In 1885 the German Chancellor Bismarck had convened a conference in Berlin where the European powers hatched the scramble for Africa, that is, they decided how to divide up Africa into different spheres of interest. At the conference, Italy secured its rights to colonies in Eritrea, along the coast of Ethiopia, and Somalia. Ethiopia, though not represented at the conference, somehow managed to survive intact. But the Italians still kept designs, and in 1896 they marched an army south from Eritrea. Menelik's response was similar to that of a European medieval king. He formed an army by getting the nobility to call up their armed men. This approach could not put an army in the field for long but it could put a huge one together for a short time. This short time was just enough to defeat the Italians, whose 15,000 men were overwhelmed by Menelik's 100,000 in the Battle of Adawa in 1896. It was the most serious military defeat a pre-colonial African country was able to inflict on a European power, and secured Ethiopia's independence for another 40 years. The last emperor of Ethiopia, Rastafari, was crowned Haile Selassie in 1930. Haile Selassie ruled until he was overthrown by a second Italian invasion, which began in 1935, but he returned from exile with the help of the English in 1941. He then ruled until he was overthrown in a 1974 coup by the Derg, the committee, a group of Marxist army officers, who then proceeded to further impoverish and ravage the country. The basic extractive economic institutions of the absolutist Ethiopian Empire, such as Galt, page 178, and the feudalism created after the decline of Aksum, lasted until they were abolished after the 1974 revolution. Today Ethiopia is one of the poorest countries in the world. The income of an average Ethiopian is about one-fortieth that of an average citizen of England. Most people live in rural areas and practice subsistence agriculture. They lack clean water, electricity, and access to proper schools or health care. Life expectancy is about 55 years and only one-third of adults are literate. A comparison between England and Ethiopia spans world inequality. 
The reason Ethiopia is where it is today is that, unlike in England, in Ethiopia absolutism persisted until the recent past. With absolutism came extractive economic institutions and poverty for the mass of Ethiopians, though of course the emperors and nobility benefited hugely. But the most enduring implication of the absolutism was that Ethiopian society failed to take advantage of industrialization opportunities during the 19th and early 20th centuries, underpinning the abject poverty of its citizens today. The Children of Somali Absolutist political institutions around the world impeded industrialization either indirectly, in the way they organized the economy, or directly, as we have seen in Austria-Hungary and Russia. But absolutism was not the only barrier to the emergence of inclusive economic institutions. At the dawn of the 19th century, many parts of the world, especially in Africa, lacked a state that could provide even a minimal degree of law and order, which is a prerequisite for having a modern economy. There was not the equivalent of Peter the Great in Russia starting the process of political centralization, and then forging Russian absolutism, let alone that of the Tudors in England centralizing the state without fully destroying, or, more appropriately, without fully being able to destroy, the parliament and other constraints on their power. Without some degree of political centralization, even if the elites of these African polities had wished to greet industrialization with open arms, there wouldn't have been much they could have done. Somalia, situated in the Horn of Africa, illustrates the devastating effects of lack of political centralization. Somalia has been dominated historically by people organized into six clan families. The four largest of these, the D.I.R., Darid, Isaac, and Hawi, all trace their ancestry back to a mythical ancestor, Somali. These clan families originated in the north of Somalia and gradually spread south and east, and are even today primarily pastoral people who migrate with their flocks of goats, sheep, and camels. In the south, the Digil and the Rahanwain, sedentary agriculturalists, make up the last two of the clan families. The territories of these clans are depicted on map 12, page 177. Somalis identify first with their clan family, but these are very large and contain many subgroups. First among these are clans that trace their descent back to one of the larger clan families. More significant are the groupings within clans called dia-paying groups, which consist of closely related kinspeople who pay and collect dia, or a blood wealth, compensation against the murder of one of their members. Somali clans and dia-paying groups were historically locked into almost continual conflict over the scarce resources at their disposal, particularly water sources and good grazing land for their animals. They also constantly raided the herds of neighboring clans and dia-paying groups. Though clans had leaders called sultans, and also elders, these people had no real power. Political power was very widely dispersed, with every Somali adult man being able to have his say on decisions that might affect the clan or group. This was achieved through an informal council made up of all adult males. There was no written law, no police, and no legal system to speak of, except that Sharia law was used as a framework within which informal laws were embedded. These informal laws for a dia-paying group would be encoded in what was called a hear, a body of explicitly formulated obligations, rights, and duties the group demanded others obey in their interactions with the group. With the advent of colonial rule, these hears began to be written down. For example, the Hassan Yuga's lineage formed a dia-paying group of about 1,500 men and was a subclan of the D.I.R. clan family, in British Somaliland. On March 8, 1950, their here was recorded by the British District Commissioner, the first three clauses of which read, 
1. When a man of the Hassan Yugas is murdered by an external group 20 camels of his blood wealth, 100, will be taken by his next of kin and the remaining 80 camels shared amongst all the Hassan Yugas. 2. If a man of the Hassan Yugas is wounded by an outsider and his injuries are valued at 33 and a third camels, 10 camels must be given to him and the remain to his Jifo group, a sub group of the Dia group. 3. Homicide amongst members of the Hassan Yugas is subject to compensation at the rate of 33 and a third camels, payable only to the deceased's next of kin. If the culprit is unable to pay all or part, he will be assisted by his lineage. The heavy focus of the here on killing and wounding reflects the almost constant state of warfare between Dia paying groups and clans. Central to this was blood wealth and blood feuding. A crime against a particular person was a crime against the whole Dia paying group, and necessitated collective compensation, blood wealth. If such blood wealth was not paid, the Dia paying group of the person who had committed the crime faced the collective retribution of the victim. When modern transportation reached Somalia, blood wealth was extended to people who were killed or injured in motor accidents. The Hassan Yugazes here didn't refer only to murder, Clause 6 was, if one man of the Hassan Yugas insults another at a Hassan Yugas council he shall pay 150 shillings, to the offended party. In early 1955, the flocks of two clans, the Haber Toljalo and the Haber Unis, were grazing close to each other in the region of Dombrili. A man from the Unis was wounded after a dispute with a member of the Tol Jalo over camel herding. The Unis clan immediately retaliated, attacking the Tol Jalo clan and killing a man. This death led, following the code of blood wealth, to the Unis clan offering compensation to the Tol Jalo clan, which was accepted. The blood wealth was to be handed over in person, as usual in the form of camels. At the handing over ceremony, one of the Tol Jalo killed a member of the Unis, mistaking him for a member of the Dia paying group of the murderer. This led to all out warfare, and within the next 48 hours, 13 Unis and 26 Tol Jalo had been killed. Warfare continued for another year before elders from both clans, brought together by the English colonial administration, managed to broker a deal, the exchange of blood wealth, that satisfied both sides and was paid over the next three years. The paying of blood wealth took place in the shadow of the threat of force and feuding, and even when it was paid, it did not necessarily stop conflict. Usually conflict died down and then flared up again. Political power was thus widely dispersed in Somali society, almost pluralistically. But without the authority of a centralized state to enforce order, let alone property rights, this led not to inclusive institutions. Nobody respected the authority of another, and nobody, including the British colonial state when it eventually arrived, was able to impose order. The lack of political centralization made it impossible for Somalia to benefit from the Industrial Revolution. In such a climate it would have been unimaginable to invest in or adopt the new technologies emanating from Britain, or indeed to create the types of organizations necessary to do so. The complex politics of Somalia had even more subtle implications for economic progress. We mentioned earlier some of the great technological puzzles of African history. Prior to the expansion of colonial rule in the late 19th century, African societies did not use wheeled transportation or plow agriculture and few had writing. Ethiopia did, as we have seen. The Somalis also had a written script, but unlike the Ethiopians, they did not use it. We have already seen instances of this in African history. African societies may not have used wheels or plows, but they certainly knew about them. 
In the case of the Kingdom of Congo, as we have seen, this was fundamentally due to the fact that the economic institutions created no incentives for people to adopt these technologies. Could the same issues arise with the adoption of writing? We can get some sense of this from the Kingdom of Takali, situated to the northwest of Somalia, in the Nuba Hills of southern Sudan. The Kingdom of Takali was formed in the late 18th century by a band of warriors led by a man called Ismail, and it stayed independent until amalgamated into the British Empire in 1884. The Takali kings and people had access to writing in Arabic, but it was not used, except by the kings, for external communication with other polities and diplomatic correspondence. At first this situation seems very puzzling. The traditional account of the origin of writing in Mesopotamia is that it was developed by states in order to record information, control people, and levy taxes. Wasn't the Takali state interested in this? These questions were investigated by the historian Janet Ewald in the late 1970s as she tried to reconstruct the history of the Takali state. Part of the story is that the citizens resisted the use of writing because they feared that it would be used to control resources, such as valuable land, by allowing the state to claim ownership. They also feared that it would lead to more systematic taxation. The dynasty that Ismail started did not gel into a powerful state. Even if it had wanted to, the state was not strong enough to impose its will over the objections of the citizens. But there were other, more subtle factors at work. Various elites also opposed political centralization, for example, preferring oral to written interaction with citizens, because this allowed them maximum discretion. Written laws or orders could not be taken back or denied and were harder to change, they set benchmarks that governing elites might want to reverse. So neither the ruled nor the rulers of Takali saw the introduction of writing to be to their advantage. The ruled feared how the rulers would use it, and the rulers themselves saw the absence of writing as aiding their quite precarious grip on power. It was the politics of Takali that kept writing from being introduced. Though the Somalis had even less of a well-defined elite compared with the Takali kingdom, it is quite plausible that the same forces inhibited their use of writing and their adoption of other basic technologies. The Somali case shows the consequences of the lack of political centralization for economic growth. The historical literature does not record instances of attempts to create such centralization in Somalia. However, it is clear why this would have been very difficult. To politically centralize would have meant that some clans would have been subject to the control of others. But they rejected any such dominance and the surrender of their power that this would have entailed. The balance of military power in the society would also have made it difficult to create such centralized institutions. In fact, it is likely that any group or clan attempting to centralize power would not only have faced stiff resistance, but would have lost its existing power and privileges. As a consequence of this lack of political centralization, and the implied absence of even the most basic security of property rights, Somali society never generated incentives to invest in productivity-enhancing technologies. As the process of industrialization was underway in other parts of the world in the 19th and early 20th centuries, Somalis were feuding and fending for their lives, and their economic backwardness became more ingrained. Enduring backwardness. The Industrial Revolution created a transformative critical juncture for the whole world during the 19th century and beyond. Those societies that allowed and incentivized their citizens to invest in new technologies could grow rapidly. But many around the world failed to do so, or explicitly chose not to do so. 
nations under the grip of extractive political and economic institutions did not generate such incentives. Spain and Ethiopia provide examples where the absolutist control of political institutions and the implied extractive economic institutions choked economic incentives long before the dawn of the 19th century. The outcome was similar in other absolutist regimes, for example, in Austria-Hungary, Russia, the Ottoman Empire, and China, though in these cases the rulers, because of fear of creative destruction, not only neglected to encourage economic progress but also took explicit steps to block the spread of industry and the introduction of new technologies that would bring industrialization. Absolutism is not the only form of extractive political institutions and was not the only factor preventing industrialization. Inclusive political and economic institutions necessitate some degree of political centralization so that the state can enforce law and order, uphold property rights, and encourage economic activity when necessary by investing in public services. Yet even today, many nations, such as Afghanistan, Haiti, Nepal, and Somalia, have states that are unable to maintain the most rudimentary order and economic incentives are all but destroyed. The case of Somalia illustrates how the process of industrialization also passed by such societies. Political centralization is resisted for the same reason that absolutist regimes resist change, the often well-placed fear that change will reallocate political power from those that dominate today to new individuals and groups. Thus, as absolutism blocks moves toward pluralism and economic change, so do the traditional elites and clans dominating the scene in societies without state centralization. As a consequence, societies that still lacked such centralization in the 18th and 19th centuries were particularly disadvantaged in the age of industry. While the variety of extractive institutions ranging from absolutism to states with little centralization failed to take advantage of the spread of industry, the critical juncture of the Industrial Revolution had very different effects in other parts of the world. As we will see in Chapter 10, societies that had already taken steps toward inclusive political and economic institutions, such as the United States and Australia, and those where absolutism was more seriously challenged, such as France and Japan, took advantage of these new economic opportunities and started a process of rapid economic growth. As such, the usual pattern of interaction between a critical juncture and existing institutional differences leading to further institutional and economic divergence played out again in the 19th century and this time with an even bigger bang and more fundamental effects on the prosperity and poverty of nations. Why Nations Fail The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson 9. Reversing Development How European Colonialism Impoverished Large Parts of the World 9. Reversing Development Spice and Genocide The Moluccan archipelago in modern Indonesia is made up of three groups of islands. In the early 17th century, the northern Moluccas housed the independent kingdoms of Tidor, Ternate, and Bacan. The middle Moluccas were home to the island kingdom of Ambon. In the south were the Banda Islands, a small archipelago that was not yet politically unified. Though they seem remote to us today, the Moluccas were then central to world trade as the only producers of the valuable spices cloves, mace, and nutmeg. Of these, nutmeg and mace grew only in the Banda Islands. Inhabitants of these islands produced and exported these rare spices in exchange for food and manufactured goods coming from the island of Java, from the entrepot of Malacca on the Malaysian Peninsula, and from India, China, and Arabia. 
The first contact the inhabitants had with Europeans was in the 16th century, with Portuguese mariners who came to buy spices. Before then spices had to be shipped through the Middle East, via trade routes controlled by the Ottoman Empire. Europeans searched for a passage around Africa or across the Atlantic to gain direct access to the Spice Islands and the spice trade. The Cape of Good Hope was rounded by the Portuguese mariner Bartolomeu Dias in 1488, and India was reached via the same route by Vasco da Gama in 1498. For the first time the Europeans now had their own independent route to the Spice Islands. The Portuguese immediately set about the task of trying to control the trade in spices. They captured Malacca in 1511. Strategically situated on the western side of the Malaysian Peninsula, merchants from all over Southeast Asia came there to sell their spices to other merchants, Indian, Chinese, and Arabs, who then shipped them to the west. As the Portuguese traveler Tomé Pires put it in 1515, the trade and commerce between the different nations for a thousand leagues on every hand must come to Malacca. Whoever is lord of Malacca has his hands at the throat of Venice. With Malacca in their hands, the Portuguese systematically tried to gain a monopoly of the valuable spice trade. They failed. The opponents they faced were not negligible. Between the 14th and 16th centuries, there was a great deal of economic development in Southeast Asia based on trade in spices. City-states such as Assay, Banten, Malacca, Makassar, Pegu, and Brunei expanded rapidly, producing and exporting spices along with other products such as hardwoods. These states had absolutist forms of government similar to those in Europe in the same period. The development of political institutions was spurred by similar processes, including technological change in methods of warfare and international trade. State institutions became more centralized, with a king at the center claiming absolute power. Like absolutist rulers in Europe, Southeast Asian kings relied heavily on revenues from trade, both engaging in it themselves and granting monopolies to local and foreign elites. As in absolutist Europe, this generated some economic growth but was a far from ideal set of economic institutions for economic prosperity, with significant entry barriers and insecure property rights for most. But the process of commercialization was underway even as the Portuguese were trying to establish their dominance in the Indian Ocean. The presence of Europeans swelled and had a much greater impact with the arrival of the Dutch. The Dutch quickly realized that monopolizing the supply of the valuable spices of the Moluccas would be much more profitable than competing against local or other European traders. In 1600 they persuaded the ruler of Ambon to sign an exclusive agreement that gave them the monopoly on the clove trade in Ambon. With the founding of the Dutch East India Company in 1602, the Dutch attempts to capture the entire spice trade and eliminate their competitors, by hook or by crook, took a turn for the better for the Dutch and for the worse for Southeast Asia. The Dutch East India Company was the second European joint stock company, following the English East India Company, major landmarks in the development of the modern corporation, which would subsequently play a major role in European industrial growth. It was also the second company that had its own army and the power to wage war and colonize foreign lands. With the military power of the company now brought to bear, the Dutch proceeded to eliminate all potential interlopers to enforce their treaty with the ruler of Ambon. They captured a key fort held by the Portuguese in 1605 and forcibly removed all other traders. They then expanded to the northern Moluccas, forcing the rulers of Tidor, Ternate, and Bacan to agree that no cloves could be grown or traded in their territories. 
The treaty they imposed on Ternate even allowed the Dutch to come and destroy any clove trees they found there. Ambon was ruled in a manner similar to much of Europe and the Americas during that time. The citizens of Ambon owed tribute to the ruler and were subject to forced labor. The Dutch took over and intensified these systems to extract more labor and more cloves from the island. Prior to the arrival of the Dutch, extended families paid tribute in cloves to the Ambonese elite. The Dutch now stipulated that each household was tied to the soil and should cultivate a certain number of clove trees. Households were also obligated to deliver forced labor to the Dutch. The Dutch also took control of the Banda Islands, intending this time to monopolize mace and nutmeg. But the Banda Islands were organized very differently from Ambon. They were made up of many small autonomous city-states, and there was no hierarchical social or political structure. These small states, in reality no more than small towns, were run by village meetings of citizens. There was no central authority whom the Dutch could coerce into signing a monopoly treaty and no system of tribute that they could take over to capture the entire supply of nutmeg and mace. At first this meant that the Dutch had to compete with English, Portuguese, Indian, and Chinese merchants, losing the spices to their competitors when they did not pay high prices. Their initial plans of setting up a monopoly of mace and nutmeg dashed, the Dutch governor of Batavia, Jan Pietersoon Koon, came up with an alternative plan. Koon founded Batavia, on the island of Java, as the Dutch East India Company's new capital in 1618. In 1621 he sailed to Banda with a fleet and proceeded to massacre almost the entire population of the islands, probably about 15,000 people. All their leaders were executed along with the rest, and only a few were left alive enough to preserve the know-how necessary for mace and nutmeg production. After this genocide was complete, Cohn then proceeded to create the political and economic structure necessary for his plan, a plantation society. The islands were divided into 68 parcels, which were given to 68 Dutchmen, mostly former and current employees of the Dutch East India Company. These new plantation owners were taught how to produce the spices by the few surviving Bandanese and could buy slaves from the East India Company to populate the now empty islands and to produce spices, which would have to be sold at fixed prices back to the company. The extractive institutions created by the Dutch in the Spice Islands had the desired effects, though. In Banda this was at the cost of 15,000 innocent lives and the establishment of a set of economic and political institutions that would condemn the islands to underdevelopment. By the end of the 17th century, the Dutch had reduced the world supply of these spices by about 60% and the price of nutmeg had doubled. The Dutch spread the strategy they perfected in the Moluccas to the entire region with profound implications for the economic and political institutions of the rest of Southeast Asia. The long commercial expansion of several states in the area that had started in the 14th century went into reverse. Even the polities which were not directly colonized and crushed by the Dutch East India Company turned inward and abandoned trade. The nascent economic and political change in Southeast Asia was halted in its tracks. To avoid the threat of the Dutch East India Company, several states abandoned producing crops for export and ceased commercial activity. Autarky was safer than facing the Dutch. In 1620 the state of Banten, on the island of Java, cut down its pepper trees in the hope that this would induce the Dutch to leave it in peace. When a Dutch merchant visited Maguindanao, in the southern Philippines, in 1686, he was told, Nutmeg and cloves can be grown here, just as in Malaku. They are not there now because the old Raja had all of them ruined before his death. 
He was afraid the Dutch company would come to fight with them about it. What a trader heard about the ruler of Maguindanao in 1699 was similar. He had forbidden the continued planting of pepper so that he could not thereby get involved in war whether with the Dutch company or with other potentates. There was deurbanization and even population decline. In 1635 the Burmese moved their capital from Pegu, on the coast, to Ava, far inland up the Irrawaddy River. We do not know what the path of economic and political development of Southeast Asian states would have been without Dutch aggression. They may have developed their own brand of absolutism. They may have remained in the same state they were in at the end of the 16th century, or they may have continued their commercialization by gradually adopting more and more inclusive institutions. But as in the Moluccas, Dutch colonialism fundamentally changed their economic and political development. The people in Southeast Asia stopped trading, turned inward, and became more absolutist. In the next two centuries, they would be in no position to take advantage of the innovations that would spring up in the Industrial Revolution. And ultimately their retreat from trade would not save them from Europeans. By the end of the 18th century, nearly all were part of European colonial empires. We saw in Chapter 7 how European expansion into the Atlantic fueled the rise of inclusive institutions in Britain. But as illustrated by the experience of the Moluccas under the Dutch, this expansion sowed the seeds of underdevelopment in many diverse corners of the world by imposing, or further strengthening existing, extractive institutions. These either directly or indirectly destroyed nascent commercial and industrial activity throughout the globe or they perpetuated institutions that stopped industrialization. As a result, as industrialization was spreading in some parts of the world, places that were part of European colonial empires stood no chance of benefiting from these new technologies. The All-Too-Usual Institution In Southeast Asia the spread of European naval and commercial power in the early modern period curtailed a promising period of economic expansion and institutional change. In the same period as the Dutch East India Company was expanding, a very different sort of trade was intensifying in Africa, the slave trade. In the United States, Southern slavery was often referred to as the peculiar institution. But historically, as the great classical scholar Moses Finley pointed out, slavery was anything but peculiar. It was present in almost every society. It was, as we saw earlier, endemic in ancient Rome and in Africa, long a source of slaves for Europe, though not the only one. In the Roman period slaves came from Slavic peoples around the Black Sea, from the Middle East, and also from Northern Europe. But by 1400, Europeans had stopped enslaving each other. Africa, however, as we saw in Chapter 6, did not undergo the transition from slavery to serfdom as did medieval Europe. Before the early modern period, there was a vibrant slave trade in East Africa and large numbers of slaves were transported across the Sahara to the Arabian Peninsula. Moreover, the large medieval West African states of Mali, Ghana, and Songhai made heavy use of slaves in the government, the army, and agriculture, adopting organizational models from the Muslim North African states with whom they traded. It was the development of the sugar plantation colonies of the Caribbean beginning in the early 17th century that led to a dramatic escalation of the international slave trade and to an unprecedented increase in the importance of slavery within Africa itself. In the 16th century, probably about 300,000 slaves were traded in the Atlantic. They came mostly from Central Africa with heavy involvement of Congo and the Portuguese based farther south in Luanda, now the capital of Angola. During this time, 
the Trans-Saharan slave trade was still larger, with probably about 550,000 Africans moving north as slaves. In the 17th century, the situation reversed. About 1,350,000 Africans were sold as slaves in the Atlantic trade, the majority now being shipped to the Americas. The numbers involved in the Saharan trade were relatively unchanged. The 18th century saw another dramatic increase, with about 6 million slaves being shipped across the Atlantic and maybe 700,000 across the Sahara. Adding the figures up over periods and parts of Africa, well over 10 million Africans were shipped out of the continent as slaves. Map 15, page 252, gives some sense of the scale of the slave trade. Using modern country boundaries, it depicts estimates of the cumulative extent of slavery between 1400 and 1900 as a percent of population. In 1400, Darker colors show more intense slavery. For example, in Angola, Benin, Ghana, and Togo, total cumulative slave exports amounted to more than the entire population of the country in 1400. The sudden appearance of Europeans all around the coast of Western and Central Africa eager to buy slaves could not but have a transformative impact on African societies. Most slaves who were shipped to the Americas were war captives subsequently transported to the coast. The increase in warfare was fueled by huge imports of guns and ammunition, which the Europeans exchanged for slaves. By 1730 about 180,000 guns were being imported every year just along the West African coast, and between 1750 and the early 19th century, the British alone sold between 283,000 and 394,000 guns a year. Between 1750 and 1807, the British sold an extraordinary 22,000 tons of gunpowder, making an average of about 384,000 kilograms annually, along with 91,000 kilograms of lead per year. Farther to the south, the trade was just as vigorous. On the Longo coast, north of the Kingdom of Congo, Europeans sold about 50,000 guns a year. All this warfare and conflict not only caused major loss of life and human suffering but also put in motion a particular path of institutional development in Africa. Before the early modern era, African societies were less centralized politically than those of Eurasia. Most polities were small-scale, with tribal chiefs and perhaps kings controlling land and resources. Many, as we showed with Somalia, had no structure of hierarchical political authority at all. The slave trade initiated two adverse political processes. First, many polities initially became more absolutist, organized around a single objective to enslave and sell others to European slavers. Second, as a consequence but, paradoxically, in opposition to the first process, warring and slaving ultimately destroyed whatever order and legitimate state authority existed in sub-Saharan Africa. Apart from warfare, slaves were also kidnapped and captured by small-scale raiding. The law also became a tool of enslavement. No matter what crime you committed, the penalty was slavery. The English merchant Francis Moore observed the consequences of this along the Senegambia coast of West Africa, in the 1730s. Since this slave trade has been us, all punishments are changed into slavery, there being an advantage on such condemnations, they strain for crimes very hard, in order to get the benefit of selling the criminal. Not only murder, theft, and adultery, are punished by selling the criminal for slave, but every trifling case is punished in the same manner. Institutions, even religious ones, became perverted by the desire to capture and sell slaves. One example is the famous oracle at Arachukwa, in eastern Nigeria. 
The oracle was widely believed to speak for a prominent deity in the region respected by the major local ethnic groups, the Ija, the Ibibio, and the Igbo. The oracle was approached to settle disputes and adjudicate on disagreements. Plaintiffs who traveled to Arachukwa to face the oracle had to descend from the town into a gorge of the Cross River, where the oracle was housed in a tall cave, the front of which was lined with human skulls. The priests of the oracle, in league with the arrow slavers and merchants, would dispense the decision of the oracle. Often this involved people being swallowed by the oracle, which actually meant that once they had passed through the cave, they were led away down the cross river and to the waiting ships of the Europeans. This process in which all laws and customs were distorted and broken to capture slaves and more slaves had devastating effects on political centralization, though in some places it did lead to the rise of powerful states whose main raison d'etre was raiding and slaving. The Kingdom of Congo itself was probably the first African state to experience a metamorphosis into a slaving state, until it was destroyed by civil war. Other slaving states arose most prominently in West Africa and included Oyo in Nigeria, Dahomey in Benin, and subsequently Asante in Ghana. The expansion of the state of Oyo in the middle of the 17th century, for example, is directly related to the increase of slave exports on the coast. The state's power was the result of a military revolution that involved the import of horses from the north, and the formation of a powerful cavalry that could decimate opposing armies. As Oyo expanded south toward the coast, it crushed the intervening polities and sold many of their inhabitants for slaves. In the period between 1690 and 1740, Oyo established its monopoly in the interior of what came to be known as the Slave Coast. It is estimated that 80 to 90 percent of the slaves sold on the coast were the result of these conquests. A similar dramatic connection between warfare and slave supply came farther west in the 18th century, on the Gold Coast, the area that is now Ghana. After 1700 the state of Asante expanded from the interior, in much the same way as Oyo had previously. During the first half of the 18th century, this expansion triggered the so-called Aachen Wars, as Asante defeated one independent state after another. The last, Jayaman, was conquered in 1747. The preponderance of the 375,000 slaves exported from the Gold Coast, between 1700 and 1750 were captives taken in these wars. Probably the most obvious impact of this massive extraction of human beings was demographic. It is difficult to know with any certitude what the population of Africa was before the modern period, but scholars have made various plausible estimates of the impact of the slave trade on the population. The historian Patrick Manning estimates that the population of those areas of West and West Central Africa that provided slaves for export was around 22 to 25 million in the early 18th century. On the conservative assumption that during the 18th and early 19th centuries these areas would have experienced a rate of population growth of about half a percent a year, without the slave trade, Manning estimated that the population of this region in 1850 ought to have been at least 46 to 53 million. In fact, it was about one half of this. This massive difference was not only due to about 8 million people being exported as slaves from this region, between 1700 and 1850, but the millions likely killed by continual internal warfare aimed at capturing slaves. Slavery and the slave trade in Africa further disrupted family and marriage structures and may also have reduced fertility. Beginning in the late 18th century, a strong movement to abolish the slave trade began to gain momentum in Britain, led by the charismatic figure of William Wilberforce. After repeated failures, 
In 1807 the abolitionists persuaded the British Parliament to pass a bill making the slave trade illegal. The United States followed with a similar measure the next year. The British government went further, though. It actively sought to implement this measure by stationing naval squadrons in the Atlantic to try to stamp out the slave trade. Though it took some time for these measures to be truly effective, and it was not until 1834 that slavery itself was abolished in the British Empire, the days of the Atlantic slave trade, by far the largest part of the trade, were numbered. Though the end of the slave trade after 1807 did reduce the external demand for slaves from Africa, this did not mean that slavery's impact on African societies and institutions would magically melt away. Many African states had become organized around slaving, and the British putting an end to the trade did not change this reality. Moreover, slavery had become much more prevalent within Africa itself. These factors would ultimately shape the path of development in Africa not only before but also after 1807. In the place of slavery came legitimate commerce, a phrase coined for the export from Africa of new commodities not tied to the slave trade. These goods included palm oil and kernels, peanuts, ivory, rubber, and gum arabic. As European and North American incomes expanded with the spread of the Industrial Revolution, demand for many of these tropical products rose sharply. Just as African societies took aggressive advantage of the economic opportunities presented by the slave trade, they did the same with legitimate commerce. But they did so in a peculiar context one in which slavery was a way of life but the external demand for slaves had suddenly dried up. What were all these slaves to do now that they could not be sold to Europeans? The answer was simple, they could be profitably put. To work, under coercion, in Africa, producing the new items of legitimate commerce. One of the best documented examples was in Asante, in modern Ghana. Prior to 1807, the Asante Empire had been heavily involved in the capturing and export of slaves, bringing them down to the coast to be sold at the great slaving castles of Cape Coast and Elmina. After 1807, with this option closed off, the Asante political elite reorganized their economy. However, slaving and slavery did not end. Rather, Slaves were settled on large plantations, initially around the capital city of Cumes, but later spread throughout the empire, corresponding to most of the interior of Ghana. They were employed in the production of gold and cola nuts for export, but also grew large quantities of food and were intensively used as porters, since Asante did not use wheeled transportation. Farther east, similar adaptations took place. In Dahomey, for example, the king had large palm oil plantations near the coastal ports of Wida and Porto Novo, all based on slave labor. So the abolition of the slave trade, rather than making slavery in Africa wither away, simply led to a redeployment of the slaves, who were now used within Africa rather than in the Americas. Moreover, Many of the political institutions the slave trade had wrought in the previous two centuries were unaltered and patterns of behavior persisted. For example, in Nigeria in the 1820s and 30s the once great Oyo kingdom collapsed. It was undermined by civil wars and the rise of the Yoruba city-states, such as Iloran and Ibadan, that were directly involved in the slave trade, to its south. In the 1830s, the capital of Oyo was sacked, and after that the Yoruba cities contested power with Dahomey for regional dominance. They fought an almost continuous series of wars in the first half of the century, which generated a massive supply of slaves. Along with this went the normal rounds of kidnapping and condemnation by oracles and smaller-scale raiding. 
Kidnapping was such a problem in some parts of Nigeria that parents would not let their children play outside for fear they would be taken and sold into slavery. As a result slavery, rather than contracting, appears to have expanded in Africa throughout the 19th century. Though accurate figures are hard to come by, a number of existing accounts written by travelers and merchants during this time suggest that in the West African kingdoms of Asante and Dahomey and in the Yoruba city-states well over half of the population were slaves. More accurate data exist from early French colonial records for the Western Sudan, a large swath of Western Africa, stretching from Senegal, via Mali and Burkina Faso, to Niger and Chad. In this region 30% of the population was enslaved in 1900. Just as with the emergence of legitimate commerce, the advent of formal colonization after the scramble for Africa failed to destroy slavery in Africa. Though much of European penetration into Africa was justified on the grounds that slavery had to be combated and abolished, the reality was different. In most parts of colonial Africa, slavery continued well into the 20th century. In Sierra Leone, for example, it was only in 1928 that slavery was finally abolished, even though the capital city of Freetown was originally established in the late 18th century as a haven for slaves repatriated from the Americas. It then became an important base for the British anti-slavery squadron and a new home for freed slaves rescued from slave ships, captured by the British Navy. Even with this symbolism slavery lingered in Sierra Leone for 130 years. Liberia, just south of Sierra Leone, was likewise founded for freed American slaves in the 1840s. Yet there, too, slavery lingered into the 20th century, as late as the 1960s, it was estimated that one quarter of the labor force were coerced, living and working in conditions close to slavery. Given the extractive economic and political institutions based on the slave trade, industrialization did not spread to sub-Saharan Africa which stagnated or even experienced economic retardation as other parts of the world were transforming their economies. Making a Dual Economy The dual economy paradigm, originally proposed in 1955 by Sir Arthur Lewis, still shapes the way that most social scientists think about the economic problems of less developed countries. According to Lewis, Many less developed or underdeveloped economies have a dual structure and are divided into a modern sector and a traditional sector. The modern sector, which corresponds to the more developed part of the economy, is associated with urban life, modern industry, and the use of advanced technologies. The traditional sector is associated with rural life, agriculture, and a backward institutions and technologies. Backward agricultural institutions include the communal ownership of land, which implies the absence of private property rights on land. Labor was used so inefficiently in the traditional sector, according to Lewis, that it could be reallocated to the modern sector without reducing the amount the rural sector could produce. For generations of development economists building on Lewis's insights, the a problem of development has come to mean moving people and resources out of the traditional sector, agriculture and the countryside, and into the modern sector, industry and cities. In 1979 Lewis received the Nobel Prize for his work on economic development. Lewis and development economists building on his work were certainly right in identifying dual economies. South Africa was one of the clearest examples, split into a traditional sector that was backward and poor and a modern one that was vibrant and prosperous. Even today the dual economy Lewis identified is everywhere in South Africa. One of the most dramatic ways to see this is by driving across the border between the state of KwaZulu-Natal, 
formerly natal, and the state of the Trans K. The border follows the Great K River. To the east of the river in Natal, along the coast, are wealthy beachfront properties on wide expanses of glorious sandy beaches. The interior is covered with lush green sugarcane plantations. The roads are beautiful, the whole area reeks of prosperity. Across the river, it is as if it were a different time and a different country. The area is largely devastated. The land is not green, but brown and heavily deforested. Instead of affluent modern houses with running water, toilets, and all the modern conveniences, people live in makeshift huts and cook on open fires. Life is certainly traditional, far from the modern existence to the east of the river. By now you will not be surprised that these differences are linked with major differences in economic institutions between the two sides of the river. To the east, in Natal, we have private property rights, functioning legal systems, markets, commercial agriculture, and industry. To the west, the Transke had communal property in land and all powerful traditional chiefs until recently. Looked at through the lens of Lewis's theory of dual economy. The contrast between the Trans-K and Natal illustrates the problems of African development. In fact, we can go further, and note that, historically, all of Africa was like the Trans-K, poor with pre-modern economic institutions, backward technology, and rule by chiefs. According to this perspective, then, Economic development should simply be about ensuring that the Trans-K eventually turns into natal. This perspective has much truth to it but misses the entire logic of how the dual economy came into existence and its relationship to the modern economy. The backwardness of the Trans-K is not just a historic remnant of the natural backwardness of Africa. The dual economy between the Trans-K and Natal is in fact quite recent, and is anything but natural. It was created by the South African white elites in order to produce a reservoir of cheap labor for their businesses, and reduce competition from black Africans. The dual economy is another example of underdevelopment created, not of underdevelopment as it naturally emerged and persisted over centuries. South Africa and Botswana, as we will see later, did avoid most of the adverse effects of the slave trade and the wars it wrought. South Africans' first major interaction with Europeans came when the Dutch East India Company founded a base in Table Bay, now the harbor of Cape Town, in 1652. At this time the western part of South Africa was sparsely settled, mostly by hunter-gatherers called the Khoikhoi people. Farther east, in what is now the Siske and Trans-K, there were densely populated African societies specializing in agriculture. They did not initially interact heavily with the new colony of the Dutch, nor did they become involved in slaving. The South African coast was far removed from slave markets, and the inhabitants of the Siske and Trans-K, known as the Kosa, were just far enough inland not to attract anyone's attention. As a consequence, these societies did not feel the brunt of many of the adverse currents that hit West and Central Africa. The isolation of these places changed in the 19th century. For the Europeans there was something very attractive about the climate and the disease environment of South Africa. Unlike West Africa, for example, South Africa had a temperate climate that was free of the tropical diseases such as malaria and yellow fever, that had turned much of Africa into the white man's graveyard, and prevented Europeans from settling or even setting up permanent outposts. South Africa was a much better prospect for European settlement. European expansion into the interior began soon after the British took over Cape Town from the Dutch during the Napoleonic Wars. This precipitated a long series of Kosa Wars as the settlement frontier expanded further inland. 
The penetration into the South African interior was intensified in 1835, when the remaining Europeans of Dutch descent, who would become known as Afrikaners or Boers, started their famous mass migration known as the Great Trek away from the British control of the coast and the Cape Town area. The Afrikaners subsequently founded two independent states in the interior of Africa, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. The next stage in the development of South Africa came with the discovery of vast diamond reserves in Kimberley, in 1867 and of rich gold mines in Johannesburg in 1886. This huge mineral wealth in the interior immediately convinced the British to extend their control over all of South Africa. The resistance of the Orange Free State and the Transvaal led to the famous Boer Wars in 1880-1881 and 1899-1902. After initial unexpected defeat, the British managed to merge the Afrikaner states with the Cape Province and Natal to found the Union of South Africa in 1910. Beyond the fighting between Afrikaners and the British, the development of the mining economy and the expansion of European settlement had other implications for the development of the area. Most notably, they generated demand for food and other agricultural products and created new economic opportunities for native Africans both in agriculture and trade. The COSA, in the Siske and Transke, reacted quickly to these economic opportunities, as the historian Colin Bundy documented. As early as 1832, even before the mining boom, a Moravian missionary in the Transke observed the new economic dynamism in these areas and noted the demand from the Africans for the new consumer goods that the spread of Europeans had begun to reveal to them. He wrote, to obtain these objects, they look to get money by the labor of their hands, and purchase clothes, spades, plows, wagons and other useful articles. The civil commissioner John Heming's description of his visit to Fingoland in the Siske in 1876 is equally revealing. He wrote that he was struck with the very great advancement made by the Fingos in a few years. Wherever I went I found substantial huts and brick or stone tenements. In many cases, substantial brick houses had been erected, and fruit trees had been planted. Wherever a stream of water could be made available it had been led out and the soil cultivated as far as it could be irrigated. The slopes of the hills and even the summits of the mountains were cultivated wherever a plough could be introduced. The extent of the land turned over surprised me. I have not seen such a large area of cultivated land for years. As in other parts of sub-Saharan Africa, the use of the plough was new in agriculture, but when given the opportunity, African farmers seemed to have been quite ready to adopt the technology. They were also prepared to invest in wagons and irrigation works. As the agricultural economy developed, the rigid tribal institutions started to give way. There is a great deal of evidence that changes in property rights to land took place. In 1879 the magistrate in Umzimkalu of Griqualand East, in the Transke, noted, the growing desire of the part of natives to become proprietors of land, they have purchased 38,000 acres. Three years later he recorded that around 8,000 African farmers in the district had bought and started to work on 90,000 acres of land. Africa was certainly not on the verge of an industrial revolution, but real change was underway. Private property in land had weakened the chiefs and enabled new men to buy land and make their wealth something that was unthinkable just decades earlier. This also illustrates how quickly the weakening of extractive institutions and absolutist control systems can lead to newfound economic dynamism. One of the success stories was Stephen Sonjika in the Siske, a self-made farmer from a poor background. In an address in 1911, 
Sanjika noted how when he first expressed to his father his desire to buy land, his father had responded, buy land? How can you want to buy land? Don't you know that all land is God's, and he gave it to the chiefs only? Sanjika's father's reaction was understandable. But Sanjika was not deterred. He got a job in King William's town and noted. I cunningly opened a private bank account into which I diverted a portion of my savings. This went only until I had saved 80 pounds. I bought a span of oxen with yokes, gear, plow and the rest of agricultural paraphernalia. I now purchased a small farm. I cannot too strongly recommend farming as a profession to my fellow man. They should however adopt modern methods of profit-making. An extraordinary piece of evidence supporting the economic dynamism and prosperity of African farmers in this period, is revealed in a letter sent in 1869 by a Methodist missionary, W. J. Davis. Writing to England, he recorded with pleasure that he had collected 46 pounds in cash, for the Lancashire Cotton Relief Fund. In this period the prosperous African farmers were donating money for relief of the poor English textile workers. This new economic dynamism, not surprisingly, did not please the traditional chiefs, who, in a pattern that is by now familiar to us, saw this as eroding their wealth and power. In 1879 Matthew Blythe, the chief magistrate of the trans -K, observed that there was opposition to surveying the land so that it could be divided into private property. He recorded that, some of the chiefs objected, but most of the people were pleased. The chiefs see that the granting of individual titles will destroy their influence among the headmen. Chiefs also resisted improvements made on the lands, such as the digging of irrigation ditches or the building of fences. They recognized that these improvements were just a prelude to individual property rights to the land, the beginning of the end for them. European observers even noted that chiefs and other traditional authorities, such as witch doctors, attempted to prohibit all European ways, which included new crops, tools such as plows, and items of trade but the integration of the Cisque and the Transque into the British colonial state weakened the power of the traditional chiefs and authorities, and their resistance would not be enough to stop the new economic dynamism in South Africa. In Fingoland in 1884, a European observer noted that the people had transferred their allegiance to us. Their chiefs have been changed to a sort of titled landowner without political power. No longer afraid of the jealousy of the chief or of the deadly weapon, the witch doctor, which strikes down the wealthy cattle owner, the able counselor, the introduction of novel customs, the skillful agriculturalist, reducing them all to the uniform level of mediocrity, no longer apprehensive of this, the Fingo clansman, is a progressive man. Still remaining a peasant farmer, he owns wagons and plows, he opens water furrows for irrigation, he is the owner of a flock of sheep. Even a modicum of inclusive institutions and the erosion of the powers of the chiefs and their restrictions were sufficient to start a vigorous African economic boom. Alas, it would be short-lived. Between 1890 and 1913 it would come to an abrupt end and go into reverse. During this period two forces worked to destroy the rural prosperity and dynamism that Africans had created in the previous 50 years. The first was antagonism by European farmers who were competing with Africans. Successful African farmers drove down the price of crops that Europeans also produced. The response of Europeans was to drive the Africans out of business. The second force was even more sinister. The Europeans wanted a cheap labor force to employ in the burgeoning mining economy, and they could ensure this cheap supply only by impoverishing the Africans. 
This they went about methodically over the next several decades. The 1897 testimony of George Albu, the chairman of the Association of Mines, given to a commission of inquiry pithily describes the logic of impoverishing Africans so as to obtain cheap labor. He explained how he proposed to cheapen labor by simply telling the boys that their wages are reduced. His testimony goes as follows. Commission, suppose the Kaffirs, black Africans, retire back to their crawl, cattle pen? Would you be in favor of asking the government to enforce labor? Albu, certainly. I would make it compulsory. Why should a nigger be allowed to do nothing? I think a Kaffir should be compelled to work in order to earn his living. Commission, if a man can live without work, how can you? Force him to work? Albu, tax him, then. Commission, then you would not allow the Kaffir to hold land in the country, but he must work for the white man to enrich him? Albu, he must do his part of the work of helping his neighbors. Both of the goals of removing competition with white farmers and developing a large low-wage labor force were simultaneously accomplished by the Natives' Land Act of 1913. The act, anticipating Lewis's notion of dual economy, divided South Africa into two parts, a modern prosperous part and a traditional poor part. Except that the prosperity and poverty were actually being created by the act itself. It stated that 87% of the land was to be given to the Europeans, who represented about 20% of the population. The remaining 13% was to go to the Africans. The Land Act had many predecessors, of course, because gradually Europeans had been confining Africans onto smaller and smaller reserves. But it was the Act of 1913 that definitively institutionalized the situation and set the stage for the formation of the South African apartheid regime, with the white minority having both the political and economic rights and the black majority being excluded from both. The Act specified that several land reserves, including the Transk and the Siske, were to become the African homelands. Later these would become known as the Bantustans, another part of the rhetoric of the apartheid regime in South Africa, since it claimed that the African peoples of Southern Africa were not natives of the area but were descended from the Bantu people who had migrated out of eastern Nigeria about a thousand years before. They thus had no more, and of course, in practice, less, entitlement to the land than the European settlers. Map 16, page 266, shows the derisory amount of land allocated to Africans by the 1913 Land Act and its successor in 1936. It also records information from 1970 on the extent of a similar land allocation that took place during the construction of another dual economy in Zimbabwe, which we discuss in Chapter 13. The 1913 legislation also included provisions intended to stop black sharecroppers and squatters from farming on white-owned land in any capacity other than as labor tenants. As the Secretary for Native Affairs explained, the effect of the act was to put a stop, for the future, to all transactions involving anything in the nature of partnership between Europeans and natives in respect of land, or the fruits of land. All new contracts with natives must be contracts of service. Provided there is a bona fide contract of this nature there is nothing to prevent an employer from paying a native in kind, or by the privilege of cultivating a defined piece of ground. But the native cannot pay the master anything for his right to occupy the land. To the development economists who visited South Africa in the 1950s and 60s, when the academic discipline was taking shape and the ideas of Arthur Lewis were spreading, the contrast between these homelands and the prosperous modern white European economy seemed to be exactly what the dual economy theory was about. 
The European part of the economy was urban and educated, and used modern technology. The homelands were poor, rural, and backward, labor there was very unproductive, people, uneducated. It seemed to be the essence of timeless, backward Africa. Except that the dual economy was not natural or inevitable. It had been created by European colonialism. Yes, the homelands were poor and technologically backward, and the people were uneducated. But all this was an outcome of government policy, which had forcibly stamped out African economic growth and created the reservoir of cheap, uneducated African labor to be employed in European-controlled mines and lands. After 1913 vast numbers of Africans were evicted from their lands, which were taken over by whites, and crowded into the homelands, which were too small for them to earn an independent living from. As intended, therefore, they would be forced to look for a living in the white economy, supplying their labor cheaply. As their economic incentives collapsed, the advances that had taken place in the preceding fifty years were all reversed. People gave up their plows and reverted to farming with hoes, that is, if they farmed at all. More often they were just available as cheap labor, which the homelands had been structured to ensure. It was not only the economic incentives that were destroyed. The political changes that had started to take place also went into reverse. The power of chiefs and traditional rulers, which had previously been in decline, was strengthened, because part of the project of creating a cheap labor force was to remove private property in land. So the chief's control over land was reaffirmed. These measures reached their apogee in 1951 when the government passed the Bantu Authorities Act. As early as 1940, G. Findlay put his finger right on the issue. Tribal tenure is a guarantee that the land will never properly be worked and will never really belong to the natives. Cheap labor must have a cheap breeding place, and so it is furnished to the Africans at their own expense. The dispossession of the African farmers led to their mass impoverishment. It created not only the institutional foundations of a backward economy, but the poor people to stock it. The available evidence demonstrates the reversal in living standards in the homelands after the Natives Land Act of 1913. The Transke and the Siske went into a prolonged economic decline. The employment records from the gold mining companies collected by the historian Francis Wilson show that this decline was widespread in the South African economy as a whole. Following the Natives Land Act and other legislation, miners' wages fell by 30% between 1911 and 1921. In 1961, despite relatively steady growth in the South African economy, these wages were still 12% lower than they had been in 1911. No wonder that over this period South Africa became the most unequal country in the world. But even in these circumstances, couldn't black Africans have made their way in the European, modern economy, started a business, or have become educated and begun a career? The government made sure these things could not happen. No African was allowed to own property or start a business in the European part of the economy, the 87% of the land. The apartheid regime also realized that educated Africans competed with whites rather than supplying cheap labor to the mines, and to white-owned agriculture. As early as 1904 a system of job reservation for Europeans was introduced in the mining economy. No African was allowed to be an amalgamator, an assayer, a banksman, a blacksmith, a boilermaker, a brass finisher, a brass molder, a bricklayer, and the list went on and on, all the way to woodworking machinist. At a stroke, Africans were banned from occupying any skilled job in the mining sector. This was the first incarnation of the famous color bar, 
one of the several racist inventions of South Africa's regime. The color bar was extended to the entire economy in 1926 and lasted until the 1980s. It is not surprising that black Africans were uneducated. The South African state not only removed the possibility of Africans benefiting economically from an education, but also refused to invest in black schools and discouraged black education. This policy reached its peak in the 1950s, when, under the leadership of Hendrik Vervoort, one of the architects of the apartheid regime that would last until 1994, the government passed the Bantu Education Act. The philosophy behind this act was bluntly spelled out by Fervert himself in a speech in 1954. The Bantu must be guided to serve his own community in all respects. There is no place for him in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. For that reason it is to no avail to him to receive a training which has as its aim absorption in the European community while he cannot, and will not be absorbed there. Naturally, the type of dual economy articulated in Fervert's speech is rather different from Lewis's dual economy theory. In South Africa the dual economy was not an inevitable outcome of the process of development. It was created by the state. In South Africa there was to be no seamless movement of poor people from the backward to the modern sector as the economy developed. On the contrary, the success of the modern sector relied on the existence of the backward sector, which enabled white employers to make huge profits by paying very low wages to black unskilled workers. In South Africa there would not be a process of the unskilled workers from the traditional sector gradually becoming educated, and skilled, as Lewis's approach envisaged. In fact, the black workers were purposefully kept unskilled and were barred from high-skill occupations so that skilled white workers would not face competition, and could enjoy high wages. In South Africa black Africans were indeed trapped, in the traditional economy, in the homelands. But this was not the problem of development that growth would make good. The homelands were what enabled the development of the white economy. It should also be no surprise that the type of economic development that white South Africa was achieving was ultimately limited being based on extractive institutions the whites had built to exploit the blacks. South African whites had property rights, they invested in education, and they were able to extract gold and diamonds and sell them profitably in the world market. But over 80% of the South African population was marginalized and excluded from the great majority of desirable economic activities. Blacks could not use their talents, they could not become skilled workers, businessmen, entrepreneurs, engineers, or scientists. Economic institutions were extractive, whites became rich by extracting from blacks. Indeed, white South Africans shared the living standards of people of Western European countries, while black South Africans were scarcely richer than those in the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. This economic growth without creative destruction, from which only the whites benefited, continued as long as revenues from gold and diamonds increased. By the 1970s, however, the economy had stopped growing. And it will again be no surprise that this set of extractive economic institutions was built on foundations, laid by a set of highly extractive political institutions. Before its overthrow in 1994, the South African political system vested all power in whites, who were the only ones allowed to vote and run for office. Whites dominated the police force, the military, and all political institutions. These institutions were structured under the military domination of white settlers. At the time of the foundation of the Union of South Africa in 1910, the Afrikaner polities of the Orange Free State and the Transvaal had explicit racial franchises, 
barring blacks completely from political participation. Natal and the Cape Colony allowed blacks to vote if they had sufficient property, which typically they did not. The status quo of Natal and the Cape Colony was kept in 1910, but by the 1930s, blacks had been explicitly disenfranchised everywhere in South Africa. The dual economy of South Africa did come to an end in 1994. But not because of the reasons that Sir Arthur Lewis theorized about. It was not the natural course of economic development that ended the color bar and the homelands. Black South Africans protested and rose up against the regime that did not recognize their basic rights, and did not share the gains of economic growth with them. After the Soweto Uprising of 1976, the protests became more organized and stronger, ultimately bringing down the apartheid state. It was the empowerment of blacks who managed to organize and rise up that ultimately ended South Africa's dual economy, in the same way that South African whites' political force had created it in the first place. Development reversed. World inequality today exists because during the 19th and 20th centuries some nations were able to take advantage of the industrial revolution and the technologies and methods of organization that it brought while others were unable to do so. Technological change is only one of the engines of prosperity, but it is perhaps the most critical one. The countries that did not take advantage of new technologies did not benefit from the other engines of prosperity, either. As we have shown in this and the previous chapter, this failure was due to their extractive institutions, either a consequence of the persistence of their absolutist regimes or because they lacked centralized states. But this chapter has also shown that in several instances the extractive institutions that underpinned the poverty of these nations were imposed, or at the very least further strengthened, by the very same process that fueled European growth, European commercial and colonial expansion. In fact, the profitability of European colonial empires was often built on the destruction of independent polities and indigenous economies around the world, or on the creation of extractive institutions essentially from the ground up, as in the Caribbean islands, where, following the almost total collapse of the native populations, Europeans imported African slaves and set up plantation systems. We will never know what the trajectories of independent city-states such as those in the Banda Islands, in Assay, or in Burma, Myanmar, would have been without the European intervention. They may have had their own indigenous glorious revolution or slowly moved toward more inclusive political and economic institutions, based on growing trade in spices and other valuable commodities. But this possibility was removed by the expansion of the Dutch East India Company. The company stamped out any hope of indigenous development in the Banda Islands by carrying out its genocide. Its threat also made the city-states in many other parts of Southeast Asia pull back from commerce. The story of one of the oldest civilizations in Asia, India, is similar though the reversing of development was done not by the Dutch but by the British. India was the largest producer and exporter of textiles in the world in the 18th century. Indian calicos and muslins flooded the European markets and were traded throughout Asia and even Eastern Africa. The main agent that carried them to the British Isles was the English East India Company. Founded in 1600, Two years before its Dutch version, the English East India Company spent the 17th century trying to establish a monopoly on the valuable exports from India. It had to compete with the Portuguese, who had bases in Goa, Chittagong, and Bombay, and the French with bases at Pondicherry, Chandranagor, Yanam, and Karaikal. Worse still for the East India Company was the Glorious Revolution, as we saw in Chapter 7. The monopoly of the East India Company had been 
granted by the Stuart kings and was immediately challenged after 1688, and even abolished for over a decade. The loss of power was significant, as we saw earlier, pages 199 to 200, because British textile producers were able to induce Parliament to ban the import of calicoes, the East India Company's most profitable item of trade. In the 18th century, under the leadership of Robert Clive, the East India Company switched strategies and began to develop a continental empire. At the time, India was split into many competing polities, though many were still nominally under the control of the Mughal Emperor in Delhi. The East India Company first expanded in Bengal in the east, vanquishing the local powers at the battles of Plassey in 1757 and Buxar in 1764. The East India Company looted local wealth and took over, and perhaps even intensified, the extractive taxation institutions of the Mughal rulers of India. This expansion coincided with the massive contraction of the Indian textile industry, since, after all, there was no longer a market for these goods in Britain. The contraction went along with deurbanization and increased poverty. It initiated a long period of reverse development in India. Soon, instead of producing textiles, Indians were buying them from Britain and growing opium for the East India Company to sell in China. The Atlantic slave trade repeated the same pattern in Africa, even if starting from less developed conditions than in Southeast Asia and India. Many African states were turned into war machines intent on capturing and selling slaves to Europeans. As conflict between different polities and states grew into continuous warfare, state institutions, which in many cases had not yet achieved much political centralization in any case, crumbled in large parts of Africa, paving the way for persistent extractive institutions and the failed states of today that we will study later. In a few parts of Africa that escaped the slave trade, such as South Africa, Europeans imposed a different set of institutions, this time designed to create a reservoir of cheap labor for their mines and farms. The South African state created a dual economy, preventing 80% of the population from taking part in skilled occupations, commercial farming, and entrepreneurship. All this not only explains why industrialization passed by large parts of the world but also encapsulates how economic development may sometimes feed on, and even create, the underdevelopment in some other part of the domestic or the world economy. Why Nations Fail The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty By Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson 1. The Diffusion of Prosperity How some parts of the world took different paths to prosperity from that of Britain. 1. The Diffusion of Prosperity Honor Among Thieves E-I-G-H-T-E-E-N-T-H, -E -E Century England, or more appropriately, Great Britain after the 1707 Union of England, Wales, and Scotland had a simple solution for dealing with criminals, out of sight, out of mind, or at least out of trouble. They transported many to penal colonies in the empire. Before the War of Independence, the convicted criminals, convicts, were primarily sent to the American colonies. After 1783 the independent United States of America was no longer so welcoming to British convicts and the authorities in Britain had to find another home for them. They first thought about West Africa. But the climate, with endemic diseases such as malaria and yellow fever, against which Europeans had no immunity, was so deadly that the authorities decided it was unacceptable to send even convicts to the white man's graveyard. Their next option was Australia. Its eastern seaboard had been explored by the great seafarer Captain James Cook. 
On April 29, 1770, Cook landed in a wonderful inlet, which he called Botany Bay in honor of the rich species found there by the naturalists traveling with him. This seemed like an ideal location to British government officials. The climate was temperate, and the place was as far out of sight and mind as could be imagined. A fleet of eleven ships packed with convicts was on its way to Botany Bay in January 1788, under the command of Captain Arthur Phillip. On January 26, now celebrated as Australia Day, they set up camp in Sydney Cove the heart of the modern city of Sydney. They called the colony New South Wales. On board one of the ships, the Alexander, captained by Duncan Sinclair, were a married couple of convicts, Henry and Susanna Cable. Susanna had been found guilty of stealing and was initially sentenced to death. This sentence was later commuted to 14 years and transportation to the American colonies. That plan fell through with the independence of the United States. In the meantime, in Norwich Castle Jail, Susanna met and fell in love with Henry, a fellow convict. In 1787 she was picked to be transported to the new convict colony in Australia with the first fleet heading there but Henry was not. By this time Susanna and Henry had a young son, also called Henry. This decision meant the family was to be separated. Susanna was moved to a prison boat moored on the Thames, but the word got out about this wrenching event and reached the ears of a philanthropist, Lady Cadogan. Lady Cadogan organized a successful campaign to reunite the cables. Now they were both to be transported with young Henry to Australia. Lady Cadogan also raised twenty pounds to purchase goods for them, which they would receive in Australia. They sailed on the Alexander, but when they arrived in Botany Bay, the parcel of goods had vanished, or at least that is what Captain Sinclair claimed. What could the cables do? Not much, according to English or British law. Even though in 1787, Britain had inclusive political and economic institutions, this inclusiveness did not extend to convicts, who had practically no rights. They could not own property. They could certainly not sue anyone in court. In fact, they could not even give evidence in court. Sinclair knew this and probably stole the parcel. Though he would never admit it, he did boast that he could not be sued by the cables. He was right according to British law. And in Britain the whole affair would have ended there. But not in Australia. A writ was issued to David Collins, the judge advocate there, as follows. Whereas Henry Cable and his wife, new settlers of this place, had before they left England a certain parcel shipped on board the Alexander Transport Duncan Sinclair Master, consisting of clothes and several other articles suitable for their present situation, which were collected and bought at the expense of many charitable disposed persons for the use of the said Henry Cable, his wife and child. Several applications has been made for the express purpose of obtaining the said parcel from the master of the Alexander now lying at this port, and that without effect, save and except, a small part of the said parcel containing a few books, the residue and remainder, which is of a more considerable value still remains on board the said ship Alexander, the master of which, seems to be very neglectful in not causing the same to be delivered, to its respective owners as aforesaid. Henry and Susanna, since they were both illiterate, could not sign the writ and just put their crosses at the bottom. The words, new settlers of this place, were later crossed out, but were highly significant. Someone anticipated that if Henry Cable and his wife were described as convicts, the case would have no hope of proceeding. Someone had come up instead with the idea of calling them new settlers. This was probably a bit too much for Judge Collins to take, and most likely he was the one who had these words struck out. 
but the writ worked. Collins did not throw out the case, and convened the court, with a jury entirely made up of soldiers. Sinclair was called before the court. Though Collins was less than enthusiastic about the case, and the jury was composed of the people sent to Australia to guard convicts such as the Cables, the Cables won. Sinclair contested the whole affair on the grounds that the Cables were criminals. But the verdict stood, and he had to pay fifteen pounds. To reach this verdict Judge Collins didn't apply British law, he ignored it. This was the first civil case adjudicated in Australia. The first criminal case would have appeared equally bizarre to those in Britain. A convict was found guilty of stealing another convict's bread, which was worth two pence. At the time, such a case would not have come to court, since convicts were not allowed to own anything. Australia was not Britain, and its law would not be just British. And Australia would soon diverge from Britain in criminal and civil law as well as in a host of economic and political institutions. The penal colony of New South Wales initially consisted of the convicts and their guards, mostly soldiers. There were few free settlers in Australia until the 1820s, and the transportation of convicts, though it stopped in New South Wales in 1840, continued until 1868 in Western Australia. Convicts had to perform compulsory work, essentially just another name for forced labor, and the guards intended to make money out of it. Initially the convicts had no pay. They were given only food in return for the labor they performed. The guards kept what they produced. But this system, like the ones with which the Virginia Company experimented in Jamestown, did not work very well, because convicts did not have the incentives to work hard or do good work. They were lashed or banished to Norfolk Island, just 13 square miles of territory situated more than 1,000 miles east of Australia in the Pacific Ocean. But since neither banishing nor lashing worked, the alternative was to give them incentives. This was not a natural idea to the soldiers and guards. Convicts were convicts, and they were not supposed to sell their labor or own property. But in Australia there was nobody else to do the work. There were of course aboriginals, possibly as many as one million at the time of the founding of New South Wales. But they were spread out over a vast continent, and their density in New South Wales was insufficient for the creation of an economy based on their exploitation. There was no Latin American option in Australia. The guards thus embarked on a path that would ultimately lead to institutions that were even more inclusive than those back in Britain. Convicts were given a set of tasks to do, and if they had extra time, they could work for themselves and sell what they produced. The guards also benefited from the convicts' new economic freedoms. Production increased, and the guards set up monopolies to sell goods to the convicts. The most lucrative of these was for rum. New South Wales at this time, just like other British colonies, was run by a governor, appointed by the British government. In 1806 Britain appointed William Bly, the man who seventeen years previously, in 1789, had been captain of the HMS Bounty, during the famous Mutiny on the Bounty. Bly was a strict disciplinarian, a trait that was probably largely responsible for the mutiny. His ways had not changed, and he immediately challenged the rum monopolists. This would lead to another mutiny, this time by the monopolists, led by a former soldier, John MacArthur. The events, which came to be known as the Rum Rebellion, again led to Bly's being overpowered by rebels, this time on land rather than aboard the bounty. MacArthur had Bly locked up. The British authorities subsequently sent more soldiers to deal with the rebellion. MacArthur was arrested and shipped back to Britain. But he was soon released, 
and he returned to Australia to play a major role in both the politics and economics of the colony. The roots of the Rum Rebellion were economic. The strategy of giving the convicts incentives was making a lot of money for men such as MacArthur, who arrived in Australia as a soldier in the second group of ships that landed in 1790. In 1796 he resigned from the army to concentrate on business. By that time he already had his first sheep, and realized that there was a lot of money to be made in sheep farming and wool export. Inland from Sydney were the Blue Mountains, which were finally crossed in 1813, revealing vast expanses of open grassland on the other side. It was sheep heaven. MacArthur was soon the richest man in Australia, and he and his fellow sheep magnates became known as the squatters, since the land on which they grazed their sheep was not theirs. It was owned by the British government. But at first this was a small detail. The squatters were the elite of Australia, or, more appropriately, the squatocracy. Even with a squatocracy, New South Wales did not look anything like the absolutist regimes of Eastern Europe or of the South American colonies. There were no serfs as in Austria-Hungary and Russia, and no large indigenous populations to exploit as in Mexico and Peru. Instead, New South Wales was like Jamestown, Virginia, in many ways, the elite ultimately found it in their interest to create economic institutions that were significantly more inclusive than those in Austria-Hungary, Russia, Mexico, and Peru. Convicts were the only labor force, and the only way to incentivize them was to pay them wages for the work they were doing. Convicts were soon allowed to become entrepreneurs and hire other convicts. More notably, they were even given land after completing their sentences, and they had all their rights restored. Some of them started to get rich, even the illiterate Henry Cable. By 1798 he owned a hotel called the Ramping Horse, and he also had a shop. He bought a ship and went into the trade of sealskins. By 1809 he owned at least nine farms of about 470 acres and also a number of shops and houses in Sydney. The next conflict in New South Wales would be between the elite and the rest of the society, made up of convicts, ex-convicts, and their families. The elite, led by former guards and soldiers such as MacArthur, included some of the free settlers who had been attracted to the colony because of the boom in the wool economy. Most of the property was still in the hands of the elite, and the ex-convicts and their descendants wanted an end to transportation, the opportunity of trial by a jury of their peers, and access to free land. The elite wanted none of these. Their main concern was to establish legal title to the lands they squatted on. The situation was again similar to the events that had transpired in North America more than two centuries earlier. As we saw in Chapter 1, the victories of the indentured servants against the Virginia Company were followed by the struggles in Maryland and the Carolinas. In New South Wales, the roles of Lord Baltimore and Sir Anthony Ashley Cooper were played by MacArthur and the squatters. The British government was again on the side of the elite, though they also feared that one day MacArthur and the squatters might be tempted to declare independence. The British government dispatched John Biggie to the colony in 1819 to head a commission of inquiry into the developments there. Biggie was shocked by the rights that the convicts enjoyed and surprised by the fundamentally inclusive nature of the economic institutions of this penal colony. He recommended a radical overhaul, convicts could not own land, nobody should be allowed to pay convicts wages anymore, pardons were to be restricted, ex-convicts were not to be given land, and punishment was to be made much more draconian. Biggie saw the squatters as the natural aristocracy of Australia and envisioned an autocratic society dominated by them. This wasn't to be. 
While Biggie was trying to turn back the clock, ex-convicts and their sons and daughters were demanding greater rights. Most important, they realized, again just as in the United States, that to consolidate their economic and political rights fully they needed political institutions that would include them in the process of decision-making. They demanded elections in which they could participate as equals and representative institutions and assemblies, in which they could hold office. The ex-convicts and their sons and daughters were led by the colorful writer, explorer, and journalist William Wentworth. Wentworth was one of the leaders of the first expedition that crossed the Blue Mountains, which opened the vast grasslands to the squatters, a town on these mountains is still named after him. His sympathies were with the convicts, perhaps because of his father, who was accused of highway robbery and had to accept transportation to Australia to avoid trial and possible conviction. At this time, Wentworth was a strong advocate of more inclusive political institutions, an elected assembly, trial by jury for ex-convicts and their families, and an end to transportation to New South Wales. He started a newspaper, The Australian, which would from then on lead the attack on the existing political institutions. MacArthur didn't like Wentworth and certainly not what he was asking for. He went through a list of Wentworth's supporters, characterizing them as follows. Sentenced to be hung since he came here repeatedly flogged at the cart's tail. A London Jew. Jew publican lately deprived of his license auctioneer transported for trading in slaves often flogged here. Son of two convicts. A swindler, deeply in debt an American adventurer. An attorney with a worthless character. A stranger lately failed here in a music shop. Married to the daughter to two convicts. Married to a convict who was formerly a tambourine girl. MacArthur and the squatter's vigorous opposition could not stop the tide in Australia, however. The demand for representative institutions was strong and could not be suppressed. Until 1823 the governor had ruled New South Wales more or less on his own. In that year his powers were limited by the creation of a council appointed by the British government. Initially the appointees were from the squatters and non-convict elite, MacArthur among them, but this couldn't last. In 1831 the governor Richard Burke bowed to pressure and for the first time allowed ex-convicts to sit on juries. Ex-convicts and in fact many new free settlers also wanted transportation of convicts from Britain to stop, because it created competition in the labor market and drove down wages. The squatters liked low wages, but they lost. In 1840 transportation to New South Wales was stopped, and in 1842 a legislative council was created with two-thirds of its members being elected, the rest appointed. Ex-convicts could stand for office and vote if they held enough property, and many did. By the 1850s, Australia had introduced adult white male suffrage. The demands of the citizens, ex-convicts and their families, were now far ahead of what William Wentworth had first imagined. In fact, by this time he was on the side of conservatives insisting on an unelected legislative council. But just like MacArthur before, Wentworth would not be able to halt the tide toward more inclusive political institutions. In 1856 the state of Victoria, which had been carved out of New South Wales in 1851, and the state of Tasmania would become the first places in the world to introduce an effective secret ballot in elections, which stopped vote-buying and coercion. Today we still call the standard method of achieving secrecy in voting in elections the Australian ballot. The initial circumstances in Sydney, New South Wales, were very similar to those in Jamestown, Virginia, 181 years earlier, though the settlers at Jamestown were mostly indentured laborers, rather than convicts. 
In both cases the initial circumstances did not allow for the creation of extractive colonial institutions. Neither colony had dense populations of indigenous peoples to exploit, ready access to precious metals such as gold or silver, or soil and crops that would make slave plantations economically viable. The slave trade was still vibrant in the 1780s, and New South Wales could have been filled up with slaves had it been profitable. It wasn't. Both the Virginia Company and the soldiers and free settlers who ran New South Wales bowed to the pressures, gradually creating inclusive economic institutions that developed in tandem with inclusive political institutions. This happened with even less of a struggle in New South Wales than it had in Virginia, and subsequent attempts to put this trend into reverse failed. Australia, like the United States, experienced a different path to inclusive institutions than the one taken by England. The same revolutions that shook England during the Civil War and then the Glorious Revolution were not needed in the United States or Australia because of the very different circumstances in which those countries were founded, though this of course does not mean that inclusive institutions were established without any conflict, and, in the process, the United States had to throw off British colonialism. In England there was a long history of absolutist rule that was deeply entrenched and required a revolution to remove it. In the United States and Australia, there was no such thing. Though Lord Baltimore in Maryland and John MacArthur in New South Wales might have aspired to such a role, they could not establish a strong enough grip on society for their plans to bear fruit. The inclusive institutions established in the United States and Australia meant that the industrial revolution spread quickly to these lands and they began to get rich. The path these countries took was followed by colonies such as Canada and New Zealand. There were still other paths to inclusive institutions. Large parts of Western Europe took yet a third path to inclusive institutions under the impetus of the French Revolution, which overthrew absolutism in France and then generated a series of interstate conflicts that spread institutional reform across much of Western Europe. The economic consequence of these reforms was the emergence of inclusive economic institutions in most of Western Europe, the Industrial Revolution, and economic growth. Breaking the Barriers, the French Revolution For the three centuries prior to 1789, France was ruled by an absolutist monarchy. French society was divided into three segments, the so-called estates. The aristocrats, the nobility, made up the first estate, the clergy the second estate, and everybody else the third estate. Different estates were subject to different laws, and the first two estates had rights that the rest of the population did not. The nobility and the clergy did not pay taxes, while the citizens had to pay several different taxes as we would expect from a regime that was largely extractive. In fact, not only was the church exempt from taxes, but it also owned large swaths of land and could impose its own taxes on peasants. The monarch, the nobility, and the clergy enjoyed a luxurious lifestyle, while much of the third estate lived in dire poverty. Different laws not only guaranteed a greatly advantageous economic position to the nobility and the clergy, but it also gave them political power. Life in French cities of the 18th century was harsh and unhealthy. Manufacturing was regulated by powerful guilds, which generated good incomes for their members but prevented others from entering these occupations or starting new businesses. The so-called Ancien Regime prided itself on its continuity and stability. Entry by entrepreneurs and talented individuals into new occupations would create instability and was not tolerated. If life in the cities was harsh, life in the villages was probably worse. As we have seen, by this time the most extreme form of serfdom, 
which tied people to the land and forced them to work for and pay dues to the feudal lords, was long in decline in France. Nevertheless, there were restrictions on mobility and a plethora of feudal dues that the French peasants were required to pay to the monarch, the nobility, and the church. Against this background, the French Revolution was a radical affair. On August 4, 1789, the National Constituent Assembly entirely changed French laws by proposing a new constitution. The first article stated, The National Assembly hereby completely abolishes the feudal system. It decrees that, among the existing rights and dues, both feudal and sensual, all those originating in or representing real or personal serfdom shall be abolished without indemnification. Its ninth article then continued. Pecuniary privileges, personal or real, in the payment of taxes are abolished forever. Taxes shall be collected from all the citizens, and from all property, in the same manner and in the same form. Plans shall be considered by which the taxes shall be paid proportionally by all, even for the last six months of the current year. Thus, in one swoop, the French Revolution abolished the feudal system and all the obligations and dues that it entailed, and it entirely removed the tax exemptions of the nobility and the clergy. But perhaps what was most radical, even unthinkable at the time, was the eleventh article which stated, All citizens, without distinction of birth, are eligible to any office or dignity, whether ecclesiastical, civil, or military, and no profession shall imply any derogation. So there was now equality before the law for all, not only in daily life and business, but also in politics. The reforms of the revolution continued after August 4th. It subsequently abolished the church's authority to levy special taxes and turned the clergy into employees of the state. Together with the removal of the rigid political and social roles, critical barriers against economic activities were stamped out. The guilds and all occupational restrictions were abolished, creating a more level playing field in the cities. These reforms were a first step toward ending the reign of the absolutist French monarchs. Several decades of instability and war followed the declarations of August 4. But an irreversible step was taken away from absolutism and extractive institutions and toward inclusive political and economic institutions. These changes would be followed by other reforms in the economy and in politics ultimately culminating in the Third Republic in 1870, which would bring to France the type of parliamentary system that the Glorious Revolution put in motion in England. The French Revolution created much violence, suffering, instability, and war. Nevertheless, thanks to it, the French did not get trapped with extractive institutions blocking economic growth and prosperity as did absolutist regimes of Eastern Europe such as Austria-Hungary and Russia. How did the absolutist French monarchy come to the brink of the 1789 revolution? After all, we have seen that many absolutist regimes were able to survive for long periods of time, even in the midst of economic stagnation and social upheaval. As with most instances of revolutions and radical changes, it was a confluence of factors that opened the way to the French Revolution, and these were intimately related to the fact that Britain was industrializing rapidly. And of course the path was, as usual, contingent, as many attempts to stabilize the regime by the monarchy failed and the revolution turned out to be more successful in changing institutions, in France and elsewhere in Europe than many could have imagined in 1789. Many laws and privileges in France were remnants of medieval times. They not only favored the first and second estates relative to the majority of the population but also gave them privileges vis a vis, the crown. Louis XIV, the Sun King, ruled France for 54 years, 
between 1661 to his death in 1715, though he actually came to the throne in 1643, at the age of five. He consolidated the power of the monarchy, furthering the process toward greater absolutism that had started centuries earlier. Many monarchs often consulted the so-called Assembly of Notables, consisting of key aristocrats hand-picked by the crown. Though largely consultative, the assembly still acted as a mild constraint on the monarch's power. For this reason, Louis XIV ruled without convening the assembly. Under his reign, France achieved some economic growth, for example, via participation in Atlantic and colonial trade. Louis's able minister of finance, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, also oversaw the development of government-sponsored and government-controlled industry, a type of extractive growth. This limited amount of growth benefited almost exclusively the first and second estates. Louis XIV also wanted to rationalize the French tax system, because the state often had problems financing its frequent wars, its large standing army, and the king's own luxurious retinue, consumption, and palaces. Its inability to tax even the minor nobility put severe limits on its revenues. Though there had been little economic growth, by the time Louis XVI came to power in 1774, there had nevertheless been large changes in society. Moreover, the earlier fiscal problems had turned into a fiscal crisis, and the Seven Years' War with the British between 1756 and 1763, in which France lost Canada, had been particularly costly. A number of significant figures attempted to balance the royal budget by restructuring the debt and increasing taxes, among them were Anne-Robert Jacques Turgot, one of the most famous economists of the time, Jacques Necker, who would also play an important role after the Revolution, and Charles Alexander de Calonne. But none succeeded. Calonne, as part of his strategy, persuaded Louis XVI to summon the Assembly of Notables. The king and his advisers expected the Assembly to endorse his reforms much in the same way as Charles I expected the English Parliament to simply agree to pay for an army to fight the Scottish, when he called it in 1640. The Assembly took an unexpected step and decreed that only a representative body, the Estates General, could endorse such reforms. The Estates General was a very different body from the Assembly of Notables. While the latter consisted of the nobility and was largely handpicked by the crown from among major aristocrats, the former included representatives from all three estates. It had last been convened in 1614. When the Estates General gathered in 1789 in Versailles, it became immediately clear that no agreement could be reached. There were irreconcilable differences as the third estate saw this as its chance to increase its political power and wanted to have more votes in the estates general, which the nobility and the clergy steadfastly opposed. The meeting ended on May 5, 1789, without any resolution, except the decision to convene a more powerful body, the National Assembly, deepening the political crisis. The third estate, particularly the merchants, businessmen, professionals, and artisans, who all had demands for greater power, saw these developments as evidence of their increasing clout. In the National Assembly, they therefore demanded even more say in the proceedings and greater rights in general. Their support in the streets all over the country by citizens emboldened by these developments led to the reconstitution of the Assembly as the National Constituent Assembly on July 9. Meanwhile, the mood in the country, and especially in Paris, was becoming more radical. In reaction, the conservative circles around Louis XVI persuaded him to sack Necker, the reformist finance minister. This led to further radicalization in the streets. 
The outcome was the famous storming of the Bastille on July 14, 1789. From this point onward, the revolution started in earnest. Necker was reinstated, and the revolutionary Marquis de Lafayette was put in charge of the National Guard of Paris. Even more remarkable than the storming of the Bastille were the dynamics of the National Constituent Assembly, which on August 4, 1789, with its newfound confidence, passed the new constitution, abolishing feudalism and the special privileges of the first and second estates. But this radicalization led to fractionalization within the assembly, since there were many conflicting views about the shape that society should take. The first step was the formation of local clubs, most notably the Radical Jacobin Club which would later take control of the revolution. At the same time, the nobles were fleeing the country in great numbers, the so-called émigrés. Many were also encouraging the king to break with the assembly and take action, either by himself or with the help of foreign powers, such as Austria, the native country of Queen Marie Antoinette and where most of the émigrés had fled. As many in the streets started to see an imminent Threat against the achievements of the revolution over the past two years, radicalization gathered pace. The National Constituent Assembly passed the final version of the Constitution on September 29, 1791, turning France into a constitutional monarchy, with equality of rights for all men, no feudal obligations or dues, and an end to all trading restrictions imposed by guilds. France was still a monarchy, but the king now had little role and, in fact, not even his freedom. But the dynamics of the revolution were then irreversibly altered by the war that broke out in 1792 between France and the First Coalition, led by Austria. The war increased the resolve and radicalism of the revolutionaries and of the masses, the so-called sans-culottes which translates as, without knee breeches, because they could not afford to wear the style of trousers then fashionable. The outcome of this process was the period known as the Terror, under the command of the Jacobin faction led by Robespierre and Saint Just, unleashed after the executions of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. It led to the executions of not only scores of aristocrats and counter-revolutionaries, but also several major figures of the revolution, including the former popular leaders Brissett, Danton, and de Moulin. But the terror soon spun out of control and ultimately came to an end in July 1794, with the execution of its own leaders, including Robespierre and Saint Just. There followed a phase of relative stability, first under the somewhat ineffective directory, between 1795 and 1799, and then with more concentrated power in the form of a three-person consulate, consisting of Ducasse, Size, and Napoleon Bonaparte. Already during the Directory, the young General Napoleon Bonaparte had become famous for his military successes, and his influence was only to grow after 1799. The consulate soon became Napoleon's personal rule. The years between 1799 and the end of Napoleon's reign, 1815, witnessed a series of great military victories for France, including those at Austerlitz, Genauerstadt, and Wagram, bringing continental Europe to its knees. They also allowed Napoleon to impose his will, his reforms, and his legal code across a wide swath of territory. The fall of Napoleon after his final defeat in 1815 would also bring a period of retrenchment, more restricted political rights, and the restoration of the French monarchy under Louis XVII. But all these were simply slowing the ultimate emergence of inclusive political institutions. The forces unleashed by the Revolution of 1789 ended French absolutism and would inevitably, even if slowly, lead to the emergence of inclusive institutions. France, 
and those parts of Europe where the revolutionary reforms had been exported, would thus take part in the industrialization process already underway in the 19th century. Exporting the Revolution On the eve of the French Revolution in 1789, there were severe restrictions placed on Jews throughout Europe. In the German city of Frankfurt, for example, their lives were regulated by orders set out in a statute dating from the Middle Ages. There could be no more than 500 Jewish families in Frankfurt, and they all had to live in a small, walled part of town, the Judengasse, the Jewish ghetto. They could not leave the ghetto at night, on Sundays, or during any Christian festival. The Judengasse was incredibly cramped. It was a quarter of a mile long but no more than 12 feet wide and in some places less than 10 feet wide. Jews lived under constant repression and regulation. Each year, at most two new families could be admitted to the ghetto, and at most 12 Jewish couples could get married, and only if they were both above the age of 25. Jews could not farm, they could also not trade in weapons, spices, wine, or grain. Until 1726 they had to wear specific markers, two concentric yellow rings for men and a striped veil for women. All Jews had to pay a special poll tax. As the French Revolution erupted, a successful young businessman, Mayor Amschkel Rothschild, lived in the Frankfurt Judengasse. By the early 1780s, Rothschild had established himself as the leading dealer in coins, metals, and antiques in Frankfurt. But like all Jews in the city, he could not open a business outside the ghetto or even live outside it. This was all to change soon. In 1791 the French National Assembly emancipated French Jewry. The French armies were now also occupying the Rhineland and emancipating the Jews of western Germany. In Frankfurt their effect would be more abrupt and perhaps somewhat unintentional. In 1796 the French bombarded Frankfurt, demolishing half of the Judengasse in the process. Around 2,000 Jews were left homeless and had to move outside the ghetto. The Rothschilds were among them. Once outside the ghetto, and now freed from the myriad regulations barring them from entrepreneurship, they could seize new business opportunities. This included a contract to supply grain to the Austrian army, something they would previously not have been allowed to do. By the end of the decade, Rothschild was one of the richest Jews in Frankfurt and already a well-established businessman. Full emancipation had to wait until 1811, it was finally implemented by Karl von Dahlberg, who had been made Grand Duke of Frankfurt in Napoleon's 1806 reorganization of Germany. Mayor Amschkel told his son, Why, oh you are now a citizen. Such events did not end the struggle for Jewish emancipation, since there were subsequent reverses particularly at the Congress of Vienna of 1815, which formed the post-Napoleonic political settlement. But there was no going back to the ghetto for the Rothschilds. Mayor Amschkel and his sons would soon have the largest bank in 19th-century Europe, with branches in Frankfurt, London, Paris, Naples, and Vienna. This was not an isolated event. First the French Revolutionary Armies and then Napoleon invaded large parts of continental Europe, and in almost all the areas they invaded, the existing institutions were remnants of medieval times, empowering kings, princes, and nobility and restricting trade both in cities and the countryside. Serfdom and feudalism were much more important in many of these areas than in France itself. In Eastern Europe, including Prussia and the Hungarian part of Austria-Hungary, serfs were tied to the land. In the West this strict form of serfdom had already vanished, but peasants owed to feudal lords various seigneurial fees, taxes, and labor obligations. For example, in the polity of Nassau-Usingen, 
peasants were subject to 230 different payments, dues, and services. Dues included one that had to be paid after an animal had been slaughtered, called the blood tithe. There was also a bee tithe and a wax tithe. If a piece of property was bought or sold, the lord was owed fees. The guilds regulating all kinds of economic activity in the cities were also typically stronger in these places than in France. In the western German cities of Cologne and Aachen, the adoption of spinning and weaving textile machines was blocked by guilds. Many cities, from Bern in Switzerland to Florence in Italy, were controlled by a few families. The leaders of the French Revolution and, subsequently, Napoleon exported the revolution to these lands, destroying absolutism, ending feudal land relations, abolishing guilds, and imposing equality before the law, the all-important notion of rule of law, which we will discuss in greater detail in the next chapter. The French Revolution thus prepared not only France but much of the rest of Europe for inclusive institutions, and the economic growth that these would spur. As we have seen, alarmed by the developments in France, several European powers organized around Austria in 1792 to attack France, ostensibly to free King Louis XVI, but in reality to crush the French Revolution. The expectation was that the makeshift armies fielded by the revolution would soon crumble. But after some early defeats, the armies of the new French Republic were victorious in an initially defensive war. There were serious organizational problems to overcome. But the French were ahead of other countries in a major innovation, mass conscription. Introduced in August 1793, Mass conscription allowed the French to field large armies and develop a military advantage verging on supremacy, even before Napoleon's famous military skills came on the scene. Initial military success encouraged the Republic's leadership to expand France's borders, with an eye toward creating an effective buffer between the new Republic and the hostile monarchs of Prussia and Austria. The French quickly seized the Austrian Netherlands and the United Provinces, essentially today's Belgium and the Netherlands. The French also took over much of modern-day Switzerland. In all three places, the French had strong control through the 1790s. Germany was initially hotly contested. But by 1795, the French had firm control over the Rhineland the western part of Germany lying on the left bank of the Rhine River. The Prussians were forced to recognize this fact under the Treaty of Basel. Between 1795 and 1802, the French held the Rhineland, but not any other part of Germany. In 1802 the Rhineland was officially incorporated into France. Italy remained the main seat of war in the second half the 1790s, with the Austrians as the opponents. Savoy was annexed by France in 1792, and a stalemate was reached until Napoleon's invasion in April 1796. In his first major continental campaign, by early 1797, Napoleon had conquered almost all northern Italy, except for Venice, which was taken by the Austrians. The Treaty of Campo Formio, signed with the Austrians in October 1797, ended the War of the First Coalition and recognized a number of French-controlled republics in northern Italy. However, the French continued to expand their control over Italy even after this treaty, invading the Papal States and establishing the Roman Republic in March 1798. In January 1799, Naples was conquered and the Parthenopian Republic created. With the exception of Venice, which remained Austrian, the French now controlled the entire Italian peninsula either directly, as in the case of Savoy, or through satellite states, such as the Cisalpine, Ligurian, Roman, and Parthenopian republics. There was further back and forth in the War of the Second Coalition, between 1798 and 1801, but this ended with the French essentially remaining in control. 
the French revolutionary armies quickly started carrying out a radical process of reform in the lands they'd conquered, abolishing the remaining vestiges of serfdom and feudal land relations and imposing equality before the law. The clergy were stripped of their special status and power, and the guilds in urban areas were stamped out or at the very least much weakened. This happened in the Austrian Netherlands immediately after the French invasion in 1795 and in the United Provinces, where the French founded the Batavian Republic, with political institutions very similar to those in France. In Switzerland the situation was similar, and the guilds as well as feudal landlords and the church were defeated, feudal privileges removed, and the guilds abolished and expropriated. What was started by the French revolutionary armies was continued, in one form or another, by Napoleon. Napoleon was first and foremost interested in establishing firm control over the territories he conquered. This sometimes involved cutting deals with local elites or putting his family and associates in charge, as during his brief control of Spain and Poland. But Napoleon also had a genuine desire to continue and deepen the reforms of the revolution. Most important, he codified the Roman law and the ideas of equality before the law into a legal system that became known as the Code Napoleon. Napoleon saw this code as his greatest legacy and wished to impose it in every territory he controlled. Of course, the reforms imposed by the French Revolution and Napoleon were not irreversible. In some places, such as in Hanover, Germany, the old elites were reinstated shortly after Napoleon's fall and much of what the French achieved was lost for good. But in many other places, feudalism, the guilds, and the nobility were permanently destroyed or weakened. For instance, even after the French left, in many cases the Code Napoleon remained in effect. All in all, French armies wrought much suffering in Europe, but they also radically changed the lay of the land. In much of Europe, gone were feudal relations, the power of the guilds, the absolutist control of monarchs and princes, the grip of the clergy on economic, social, and political power, and the foundation of Ancien Regime, which treated different people unequally based on their birth status. These changes created the type of inclusive economic institutions that would then allow industrialization to take root in these places. By the middle of the 19th century, industrialization was rapidly underway in almost all the places that the French controlled, whereas places such as Austria, Hungary, and Russia, which the French did not conquer, or Poland and Spain, where French hold was temporary and limited, were still largely stagnant. Seeking Modernity In the autumn of 1867, Okubo Tashimichi, a leading courtier of the feudal Japanese Satsuma domain, traveled from the capital of Edo, now Tokyo, to the regional city of Yamaguchi. On October 14 he met with leaders of the Chasha domain. He had a simple proposal, they would join forces, march their armies to Edo, and overthrow the shogun, the ruler of Japan. By this time Okubo Tashimichi already had the leaders of the Tosa and Aki domains on board. Once the leaders of the powerful Chashu agreed, a secret Satcho alliance was formed. In 1868 Japan was an economically underdeveloped country that had been controlled since 1600, by the Tokugawa family, whose ruler had taken the title shogun, commander, in 1603. The Japanese emperor was sidelined and assumed a purely ceremonial role. The Tokugawa shoguns were the dominant members of a class of feudal lords who ruled and taxed their own domains, among them those of Satsuma, ruled by the Shimizu family. These lords, along with their military retainers, the famous samurai, ran a society that was similar to that of medieval Europe, with strict occupational categories, restrictions on trade and high rates of taxation on farmers. The shogun ruled from Edo, where he monopolized and controlled foreign trade and banned foreigners from the country. Political and economic institutions were extractive, and Japan was poor. But the domination of the shogun was not complete. 
Even as the Tokugawa family took over the country in 1600, they could not control everyone. In the south of the country, the Satsuma domain remained quite autonomous and was even allowed to trade independently with the outside world through the Ryukyu Islands. It was in the Satsuma capital of Kagoshima where Okubo Tashimichi was born in 1830. As the son of a samurai, he, too, became a samurai. His talent was spotted early on by Shimizunari Akira, the lord of Satsuma, who quickly promoted him in the bureaucracy. At the time, Shimizunari Akira had already formulated a plan to use Satsuma troops to overthrow the shogun. He wanted to expand trade with Asia and Europe, abolish the old feudal economic institutions, and construct a modern state in Japan. His nascent plan was cut short by his death in 1858. His successor, Shimizu Hisamitsu, was more circumspect, at least initially. Okubo Tashimichi had by now become more and more convinced that Japan needed to overthrow the feudal shogunate, and he eventually convinced Shimizu Hisamitsu to rally support for their cause, they wrapped it in outrage over the sidelining of the emperor. The treaty Okubo Tashimichi had already signed with the Tosa domain asserted that, a country does not have two monarchs, a home does not have two masters, government devolves to one ruler. But the real intention was not simply to restore the emperor to power but to change the political and economic institutions completely. On the Tosa side, one of the treaty's signers was Sakamoto Ryuma. As Satsuma and Chashu mobilized their armies, Sakamoto Ryuma presented the shogun with an eight-point plan, urging him to resign to avoid civil war. The plan was radical, and though Clause 1 stated that the political power of the country should be returned to the imperial court, and all decrees issued by the court, it included far more than just the restoration of the emperor. Clauses 2, 3, 4, and 5 stated. 2, two legislative bodies, an upper and lower house, should be established, and all government measures should be decided on the basis of general opinion. 3. Men of ability among the lords, nobles and people at large should be employed as counselors, and traditional offices of the past which have lost their purpose should be abolished. 4. Foreign affairs should be carried on according to appropriate regulations worked out on the basis of general opinion. 5. Legislation and regulations of earlier times should be set aside and a new and adequate code should be selected. Shogun Yoshinobu agreed to resign, and on January 3, 1868, the Meiji Restoration was declared. Emperor Komiai and, one month later after Komiai died, his son Meiji were restored to power. Though Satsuma and Chashu forces now occupied Edo and the imperial capital Kyoto, they feared that the Tokugawas would attempt to regain power and recreate the shogunate. Okubo Tashimichi wanted the Tokugawas crushed forever. He persuaded the emperor to abolish the Tokugawa domain and confiscate their lands. On January 27 the former shogun Yoshinobu attacked Satsuma and Chashu forces, and civil war broke out. It raged until the summer, when finally the Tokugawas were vanquished. Following the Meiji Restoration there was a process of transformative institutional reforms in Japan. In 1869 feudalism was abolished, and the 300 fiefs were surrendered to the government and turned into prefectures, under the control of an appointed governor. Taxation was centralized, and a modern bureaucratic state replaced the old feudal one. In 1869 the equality of all social classes before the law was introduced, and restrictions on internal migration and trade were abolished. The samurai class was abolished, though not without having to put down some rebellions. Individual property rights on land were introduced, and people were allowed freedom to enter and practice any trade. The state became heavily involved in the construction of infrastructure. In contrast to the attitudes of absolutist regimes to railways, in 1869 the Japanese regime formed a steamship line between Tokyo and Osaka and built the first railway between Tokyo and Yokohama. 
It also began to develop a manufacturing industry, and Okubo Tashimichi, as Minister of Finance, oversaw the beginning of a concerted effort of industrialization. The Lord of Satsuma Domain had been a leader in this, building factories for pottery, cannon, and cotton yarn and importing English textile machinery to create the first modern cotton spinning mill in Japan in 1861. He also built two modern shipyards. By 1890 Japan was the first Asian country to adopt a written constitution, and it created a constitutional monarchy with an elected parliament, the Diet, and an independent judiciary. These changes were decisive factors in enabling Japan to be the primary beneficiary from the Industrial Revolution in Asia. In the MID, 19th century both China and Japan were poor nations, languishing under absolutist regimes. The absolutist regime in China had been suspicious of change for centuries. Though there were many similarities between China and Japan, the Tokugawa shogunate had also banned overseas trade in the 17th century, as Chinese emperors had done earlier, and were opposed to economic and political change, there were also notable political differences. China was a centralized bureaucratic empire ruled by an absolute emperor. The emperor certainly faced constraints on his power, the most important of which was the threat of rebellion. During the period 1850-1864, the whole of southern China was ravaged by the Taiping Rebellion, in which millions died either in conflict or through mass starvation. But opposition to the emperor was not institutionalized. The structure of Japanese political institutions was different. The shogunate had sidelined the emperor, but as we have seen, the Tokugawa power was not absolute, and domains such as that of the Satsumas maintained independence, even the ability to conduct foreign trade on their own behalf. As with France, an important consequence of the British Industrial Revolution for China and Japan was military vulnerability. China was humbled by British sea power during the First Opium War, between 1839 and 1842, and the same threat became all too real for the Japanese as U.S. warships, led by Commodore Matthew Perry, pulled into Edo Bay in 1853. The reality that economic backwardness created military backwardness was part of the impetus behind Shimizu Nariakira's plan to overthrow the shogunate and put in motion the changes that eventually led to the Meiji Restoration. The leaders of the Satsuma domain realized that economic growth, perhaps even Japanese survival, could be achieved only by institutional reforms. But the shogun opposed this because his power was tied to the existing set of institutions. To exact reforms, the shogun had to be overthrown, and he was. The situation was similar in China, but the different initial political institutions made it much harder to overthrow the emperor, something that happened only in 1911. Instead of reforming institutions, the Chinese tried to match the British militarily by importing modern weapons. The Japanese built their own armaments industry. As a consequence of these initial differences, each country responded differently to the challenges of the 19th century, and Japan and China diverged dramatically in the face of the critical juncture created by the Industrial Revolution. While Japanese institutions were being transformed and the economy was embarking on a path of rapid growth, in China forces pushing for institutional change were not strong enough, and extractive institutions persisted largely unabated until they would take a turn for the worse with Mao's communist revolution in 1949. Roots of World Inequality this and the previous three chapters have told the story of how inclusive economic and political institutions emerged in England to make the Industrial Revolution possible, and why certain countries benefited from the Industrial Revolution and embarked on the path to growth, while others did not or, in fact, steadfastly refused to allow even the beginning of industrialization. Whether a country did embark on industrialization was largely a function of its institutions. The United States, 
which underwent a transformation similar to the English Glorious Revolution, had already developed its own brand of inclusive political and economic institutions by the end of the 18th century. It would thus become the first nation to exploit the new technologies coming from the British Isles, and would soon surpass Britain and become the forerunner of industrialization and technological change. Australia followed a similar path to inclusive institutions, even if somewhat later and somewhat less noticed. Its citizens, just like those in England and the United States, had to fight to obtain inclusive institutions. Once these were in place, Australia would launch its own process of economic growth. Australia and the United States could industrialize and grow rapidly because their relatively inclusive institutions would not block new technologies, innovation, or creative destruction. Not so in most of the other European colonies. Their dynamics would be quite the opposite of those in Australia and the United States. Lack of a native population or resources to be extracted made colonialism in Australia and the United States a very different sort of affair, even if their citizens had to fight hard for their political rights and for inclusive institutions. In the Moluccas as in the many other places Europeans colonized in Asia, in the Caribbean, and in South America, citizens had little chance of winning such a fight. In these places, European colonists imposed a new brand of extractive institutions, or took over whatever extractive institutions they found, in order to be able to extract valuable resources, ranging from spices and sugar to silver and gold. In many of these places, they put in motion a set of institutional changes that would make the emergence of inclusive institutions very unlikely. In some of them they explicitly stamped out whatever burgeoning industry or inclusive economic institutions existed. Most of these places would be in no situation to benefit from industrialization in the 19th century or even in the 20th. The dynamics in the rest of Europe were also quite different from those in Australia and the United States. As the Industrial Revolution in Britain was gathering speed at the end of the 18th century, most European countries were ruled by absolutist regimes, controlled by monarchs and by aristocracies whose major source of income was from their landholdings or from trading privileges. They enjoyed thanks to prohibitive entry barriers. The creative destruction that would be wrought by the process of industrialization would erode the leaders' trading profits and take resources and labor away from their lands. The aristocracies would be economic losers from industrialization. More important, they would also be political losers, as the process of industrialization would undoubtedly create instability and political challenges to their monopoly of political power. But the institutional transitions in Britain and the Industrial Revolution created new opportunities and challenges for European states. Though there was absolutism in Western Europe, the region had also shared much of the institutional drift that had impacted Britain in the previous millennium. But the situation was very different in Eastern Europe, the Ottoman Empire, and China. These differences mattered for the dissemination of industrialization. Just like the Black Death or the rise of Atlantic trade, the critical juncture created by industrialization intensified the ever-present conflict over institutions in many European nations. A major factor was the French Revolution of 1789. The end of absolutism in France opened the way for inclusive institutions and the French ultimately embarked on industrialization and rapid economic growth. The French Revolution in fact did more than that. It exported its institutions by invading and forcibly reforming the extractive institutions of several neighboring countries. It thus opened the way to industrialization not only in France, but in Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and parts of Germany and Italy. Farther east the reaction was similar to that after the Black Death, when, instead of crumbling, feudalism intensified. Austria-Hungary, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire fell even further behind economically, 
but their absolutist monarchies managed to stay in place until the First World War. Elsewhere in the world, absolutism was as resilient as in Eastern Europe. This was particularly true in China, where the Mingqing transition led to a state committed to building a stable agrarian society and hostile to international trade. But there were also institutional differences that mattered in Asia. If China reacted to the Industrial Revolution as Eastern Europe did, Japan reacted in the same way as Western Europe. Just as in France, it took a revolution to change the system, this time one led by the renegade lords of the Satsuma, Chashu, Tosa, and Aki domains. These lords overthrew the shogun, created the Meiji Restoration, and moved Japan onto the path of institutional reforms and economic growth. We also saw that absolutism was resilient in isolated Ethiopia. Elsewhere on the continent the very same force of international trade, that helped to transform English institutions in the 17th century locked large parts of Western and Central Africa, into highly extractive institutions via the slave trade. This destroyed societies in some places and led to the creation of extractive slaving states in others. The institutional dynamics we have described ultimately determined which countries took advantage of the major opportunities present in the 19th century onward and which ones failed to do so. The roots of the world inequality we observe today can be found in this divergence. With a few exceptions, the rich countries of today are those that embarked on the process of industrialization and technological change, starting in the 19th century and the poor ones are those that did not.